Chapter One of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer. Prefatory Notice: The strange deeds of Antony Ferrara, as herein related, are intended to illustrate certain phases of sorcery as it was formerly practiced, according to numerous records, not only in Egypt but also in Europe during the Middle Ages in no case do the powers attributed to him exceed those which are claimed for a fully equipped adept sax romer chapter one antony ferrara robert cairn looked out across the quadrangle the moon had just arisen and it softened the beauty of the old college buildings mellowed the harshness of time casting shadow pools beneath the cloisteresque arches to the west and setting out the ivy in stronger relief upon the ancient walls the barred window on the lichened stones beyond the elm was cast by the hidden gate and straight ahead where between a quaint chimney-stack and a partisan a triangular patch of blue showed like spangled velvet lay the thames it was from there the cooling breeze came but cairn's gaze was set upon a window almost directly ahead and west below the chimneys within the room to which it belonged a lambent light played cairn turned to his companion a ruddy and athletic-looking man somewhat bovine in type who at the moment was busily tracing out sections on a human skull and checking his calculations from ross's diseases of the nervous system sime he said what does ferrara always have a fire in his rooms for at this time of the year sime glanced up irritably at the speaker cairn was a tall thin scotsman cleanly shaven square-jawed and with the crisp light hair and grey eyes which often bespeak unusual virility aren't you going to do any work he inquired pathetically i thought you'd come down to give me a hand with my basal ganglia i shall go down on that and there you've been staring out of the window wilson in the end house has got a most unusual brain said cairn with apparent irrelevance has he snapped sime yes in a bottle this governor is at bart's he sent it up yesterday you ought to see it nobody will ever want to put your brain in a bottle predicted the scowling sime and resumed his activities cairn relighted his pipe staring across the quadrangle again then you've never been in ferrara's rooms have you he inquired followed a muffled curse crash and the skull went rolling across the floor look here cairn cried sime i've only got a week or so now and my nervous system is frantically rocky i shall go all to pieces on my nervous system if you want to talk go ahead when you're finished i can begin to work right o said cairn calmly and tossed his pouch across i want to talk to you about ferrara go ahead then what is the matter with ferrara well replied cairn he's queer that's no news said sime filling his pipe we all know he's a queer chap but he's popular with women he'd make a fortune as a nerve specialist he doesn't have to he inherits a fortune when sir michael dies there's a pretty cousin too isn't there inquired sime slyly there is replied cain of course he continued my governor and sir michael are bosom friends and although i've never seen much of young ferrara at the same time i've got nothing against him but he hesitated spit it out urged sime watching him oddly well it's silly i suppose but what does he want with a fire on a blazing night like this sime stared perhaps he's a throwback he suggested lightly the ferraras although they're counted scotch aren't they must have been italian originally spanish corrected cairn they've dated from the son of andrea ferrara the sword-maker who was a spaniard caesar ferrara came with the armada in eighteen fifty eight as an armourer his ship was wrecked up in the bay of tobermory and he got ashore and stopped married a scotch lassie exactly but the genealogy of the family doesn't account for antony's habits what habits well look cairn waved in the direction of the open window what does he do in the dark all night with a fire going influenza 
nonsense you've never been in his rooms have you no very few men have but as i said before he's popular with the women what do you mean i mean there have been complaints any other man would have been sent down you think he has influence influence of some sort undoubtedly well i can see you have serious doubts about the man as i have myself so i can unburden my mind you recall that sudden thunderstorm on thursday rather quite upset me for work i was out in it i was lying in a punt in the backwater you know our backwater lazy dog to tell you the truth i was trying to make up my mind whether i should abandon bones and take the post on the planet which has been offered me pills for the pen harley for fleet did you decide not then something happened which quite changed my line of reflection the room was becoming cloudy with tobacco smoke it was delightfully still cairn resumed a water rat rose within a foot of me and a kingfisher was busy on a twig almost at my elbow twilight was just creeping along and i could hear nothing but faint creakings of skulls from the river and sometimes the drip of a punt pole i thought the river seemed to become suddenly deserted it grew quite abnormally quiet and abnormally dark but i was so deep in reflection that it never occurred to me to move then the flotilla of swans came round the bend with apollo you know apollo the king swan at their head by this time it had grown tremendously dark but it never occurred to me to ask myself why the swans gliding along so noiselessly might have been phantoms a hush a perfect hush settled down sign that hush was the prelude to a strange thing an unholy thing cairn rose excitedly and strode across to the table kicking the skull out of his way it was the storm gathering snapped sign it was something else gathering listen it got yet darker but for some inexplicable reason although i must have heard the thunder muttering i couldn't take my eyes off the swans then it happened the thing i came here to tell you about i must tell somebody the thing that i am not going to forget in a hurry he began to knock out the ash from his pipe go on directed sime tersely the big swan apollo was within ten feet of me he swam in open water clear of the others no living thing touched him suddenly a ring a cry that chilled my very blood a cry that i never heard from a swan in my life he rose in the air his huge wings extended like a tortured phantom sime i can never forget it six feet clear of the water the uncanny wail became a stifled hiss and sending up a perfect fountain of water i was deluged the poor old king swan fell beat the surface with his wings and was still well the other swans glided off like ghosts several heavy raindrops pattered on the leaves above i admit i was scared apollo lay with one wing right in the punt i was standing up i had jumped to my feet when the thing occurred i stooped and touched the wing the bird was quite dead sime i pulled the swan's head out of the water and his neck was broken no fewer than three vertebrae fractured a cloud of tobacco smoke was wafted towards the open window it isn't one in a million who could wring the neck of a bird like apollo sime but it was done before my eyes without the visible agency of god or man as i dropped him and took to the pole the storm burst a clap of thunder spoke with the voice of a thousand cannon and i pulled for bare life from that haunted backwater i was drenched to the skin when i got in and i ran up all the way from the stage well rapped the other again as cairn paused to refill his pipe it was seeing the firelight flickering at ferrara's window that led me to do it i don't often call on him but i thought that a rub down before the fire and a glass of toddy would put me right the storm had abated as i got to the foot of his stair only a distant rolling of thunder then out of the shadows it was quite dark into the flickering light of the lamp came somebody all muffled up 
I started horribly. It was a girl, quite a pretty girl, too, with very pale and with over-bright eyes. She gave one quick glance into my face, muttered something, an apology, I think, and drew back again into her hiding-place. "'He's been warned,' growled Syme. "'It will be noticed to quit next time.' "'I ran upstairs and banged on Ferrara's door. "'He didn't open at first, but shouted out to know who was knocking. "'When I told him, he let me in and closed the door very quickly. "'As I went in, a pungent cloud met me. "'Incense.' "'Incense?' "'His room smelt like a joss-house. "'I told him so. "'He said he was experimenting with kiffy, the ancient Egyptian stuff used in the temples. It was all dark and hot. Phew! Like a furnace. Ferrara's rooms always were odd, but since the long vacation I hadn't been in. Good Lord! They're disgusting! How? Ferrara spent vacation in Egypt. I suppose he's brought things back? Things? Yes! Unholy things! But that brings me to something, too. I ought to know more about the chap than anybody. Sir Michael Ferrara and the governor have been friends for thirty years, but my father is oddly reticent, quite singularly reticent, regarding Antony. Anyway, have you heard about him in Egypt? I've heard he got into trouble. For his age, he has a devil of a queer reputation. There's no disguising it. What sort of trouble? I've no idea. Nobody seems to know. "'but I heard from young Ashby that Ferrara was asked to leave. "'There's some tale about Kitchener.' "'By Kitchener,' Ashby says. "'But I don't believe it.' "'Well, Ferrara lighted a lamp, an elaborate silver thing, "'and I found myself in a kind of nightmare museum. "'There was an unwrapped mummy there, the mummy of a woman. "'I can't possibly describe it. "'He had pictures, too, photographs.' I shan't try to tell you what they represented. I'm not thin-skinned, but there are some subjects that no man anxious to avoid bedlam would willingly investigate. On the table by the lamp stood a number of objects such as I had never seen in my life before, evidently of great age. He swept them into a cupboard before I had time to look along. Then he went off to get a bath towel, slippers, and so forth. As he passed the fire, he threw something in. A hissing tongue of flame leapt up and died down again. What did he throw in? I am not absolutely certain, so I won't say what I think it was at the moment. Then he began to help me shed my saturated flannels, and he set a kettle on the fire, and so forth. You know the personal charm of the man? But there was an unpleasant sense of something, what shall I say, sinister. Ferrara's ivory face was more pale than usual, and he conveyed the idea that he was chewed up, exhausted. Beads of perspiration were on his forehead. Hate of his rooms? No, said Cairn shortly. It wasn't that. I had a rub down and borrowed some slacks. Ferrara brewed grog and pretended to make me welcome. Now I come to something which I can't forget. It may be a mere coincidence, but... He has a number of photographs in his rooms, good ones, which he has taken himself. I'm not speaking now of the monstrosities, the outrages. I mean views, and girls, particularly girls. Well, standing on a queer little easel right under the lamp was a fine picture of Apollo, the swan, lord of the backwater. Syme stared dully through the smoke haze. It gave me a sort of shock, continued Cairn. It made me think harder than ever of the thing he had thrown into the fire. Then, in his photographic Zenana, was a picture of a girl whom I am almost sure was the one I had met at the bottom of the stair. Another was of Myra Duquesne. His cousin? Yes, I felt like tearing it from the wall. In fact, the moment I saw it, I stood up to go. I wanted to run to my rooms and strip the man's clothes off my back. It was a struggle to be civil any longer. Syme, if you had seen that swan die... Syme walked over to the window. I have a glimmering of your monstrous suspicions, he said slowly. 
the last man to be kicked out of an english varsity for this sort of thing so far as i know was dr d of st john's cambridge and that's going back to the sixteenth century i know it's utterly preposterous of course but i had to confide in somebody i'll shift off now syme syme nodded staring from the open window as cairn was about to close the outer door cairn cried syme since you are now a man of letters and leisure you might drop in and borrow wilson's brains for me all right shouted cairn down in the quadrangle he stood for a moment reflecting then acting upon a sudden resolution he strode over towards the gate and ascended ferrara's stair for some time he knocked at the door in vain but he persisted in his clamouring arousing the ancient echoes finally the door was opened antony ferrara faced him he wore a silver-gray dressing-gown trimmed in white swan's down above which his ivory throat rose statuesque the almond-shaped eyes black as night gleamed strangely beneath the low smooth brow the lank black hair appeared lustreless by comparison his lips were very red in his whole appearance there was something repellently effeminate can i come in demanded cairn abruptly is it something important ferrara's voice was husky but not unmusical why are you busy well uh ferrara smiled oddly oh a visitor snapped cairn not at all accounts for your delay in opening said cairn and turned on his heel mistook me for the proctor in person i suppose good night ferrara made no reply but although he never once glanced back cairn knew that ferrara leaning over the rail above was looking after him it was as though elemental heat were beating down upon his head End of chapter one chapter two of brood of the witch queen by sax romer the phantom hands a week later robert cairn quitted oxford to take up the newspaper appointment offered to him in london it may have been due to some mysterious design of a hidden providence that Syme phoned him early in the week about an unusual case in one of the hospitals. "'Walton is a junior house surgeon there,' he said, "'and he can arrange for you to see the case. She, the patient, undoubtedly died from some rare nervous affection. I have a theory,' etc. The conversation became technical." cairn went to the hospital and by courtesy of walton whom he had known at oxford was permitted to view the body the symptoms which syme has got to hear about explained the surgeon raising the sheet from the dead woman's face are he broke off cairn had suddenly exhibited a ghastly pallor he clutched at walton for support my god cairn still holding on to the others stooped over the discoloured face it had been a pretty face when warm life had tinted its curves but now it was congested awful two heavy discolorations showed one on either side of the region of the larynx what on earth is wrong with you demanded walton i thought gasped cairn for a moment that i knew really i wish you did we can't find out anything about her have a good look no said cairn mastering himself with an effort a chance resemblance that's all he wiped the beads of perspiration from his forehead you look jolly shaky commented walton is she like someone you know very well no not at all now that i come to consider the features but it was a shock at first what on earth caused the death asphyxia answered walton shortly can't you see someone strangled her and she was brought here too late not at all my dear chap nobody strangled her she was brought here in a critical state four or five days ago by one of the slum priests who keep us so busy we diagnosed it as exhaustion from lack of food with other complications but the case was doing quite well up to last night she was recovering strength then at about one o'clock she sprang up in bed and fell back choking by the time the nurse got to her it was all over but the marks on her throat walton shrugged his shoulders there they are our men are keenly interested it's absolutely unique 
young shaw who has a mania for the nervous system sent a long account up to syme who suffers from a similar form of aberration yes syme phoned me it's nothing to do with the nerves said walton contemptuously don't ask me to explain it but it's certainly no nerve case one of the other patients my dear chap the other patients were all fast asleep the nurse was at her table in the corner and in full view of the bed the whole time i tell you no one touched her how long elapsed before the nurse got to her possibly half a minute but there is no means of learning when the paroxysm commenced the leaping up in bed probably marked the end and not the beginning of the attack cairn experienced the longing for fresh air it was as though some evil cloud hovered around and about the poor unknown strange ideas horrible ideas conjectures based upon imaginings all but insane flooded his mind darkly leaving the hospital which harboured a grim secret he stood at the gate for a moment undecided what to do his father dr cairn was out of london or he would certainly have sought him in this hour of sore perplexity what in heaven's name is behind it all he asked himself for he knew beyond doubt that the girl who lay in the hospital was the same that he had seen one night in oxford was the girl whose photograph he had found in antony ferrara's rooms he formed a sudden resolution a taxicab was passing at that moment and he hailed it giving sir michael ferrara's address he could scarcely trust himself to think but frightful possibilities presented themselves to him repel them how he might london seemed to grow dark overshadowed as once he had seen a thames backwater grow he shuddered as though from a physical chill the house of the famous egyptian scholar dull white beyond its rampart of trees presented no unusual appearances to his anxious scrutiny what he feared he scarcely knew what he suspected he could not have defined sir michael said the servant was unwell and could see no one that did not surprise cairn sir michael had not enjoyed good health since malaria had laid him low in syria but miss duquesne was at home cairn was shown into the long low ceiling room which contained so many priceless relics of a past civilization upon the bookcase stood the stately ranks of volumes which had carried the fame of europe's foremost egyptologist to every corner of the civilized world this queerly furnished room held many memories for robert cairn who had known it from childhood but latterly it had always appeared to him in his daydreams as the setting for a dainty figure it was here that he had first met myra duquesne sir michael's niece when fresh from a norman convent she had come to shed light and gladness upon the somewhat sombre household of the scholar he often thought of that day he could recall every detail of the meeting myra duquesne came in pulling aside the heavy curtains that hung in the arched entrance with a granite osiris flanking her slim figure on one side and a gilded sarcophagus on the other she burst upon the visitor a radiant vision in white the light gleamed through her soft brown hair forming a halo for a face that robert cairn knew for the sweetest in the world why mr cairn she said and blushed entrancingly we thought you had forgotten us that's not a bit likely he replied taking her proffered hand and there was that in his voice and in his look which made her lower her frank grey eyes i have been in london a few days and i find that press work is more exacting than i had anticipated did you want to see my uncle very particularly asked myra in a way yes i suppose he could not manage to see me myra shook her head now that the flush of excitement had left her face cairn was concerned to see how pale she was and what dark shadows lurked beneath her eyes sir michael is not seriously ill he asked quickly only one of the visual attacks yes at least it began with one she hesitated and cairn saw to his consternation that her eyes became filled with tears the real loneliness of her position now that her guardian was ill the absence of a friend in whom she could confide her fears suddenly grew apparent to the man who sat watching her you are tired out he said gently you have been nursing him she nodded and tried to smile 
who is attending sir elwyn groves but shall i wire for my father we wired him yesterday what to paris yes at my uncle's wish cairn started then he thinks he is seriously ill himself i cannot say answered the girl wearily his behaviour is queer he will allow no one in his room and barely consents to see sir elwyn then twice recently he has awakened in the night and made a singular request what is that he has asked me to send for his solicitor in the morning speaking harshly and almost as though he hated me i don't understand have you complied yes and on each occasion he has refused to see the solicitor when he has arrived i gather that you have been acting as a night attendant i remain in an adjoining room he is always worse at night perhaps it is telling on my nerves but last night again she hesitated as though doubting the wisdom of further speech but a brief scrutiny of cairn's face with deep anxiety to be read in his eyes determined her to proceed i had been asleep and i must have been dreaming for i thought that a voice was chanting quite near me chanting yes it was horrible in some way then a sensation of intense coldness came it was as though some icily cold creature fanned me with its wings i cannot describe it but it was numbing i think i must have felt as those poor travellers do who succumb to the temptation to sleep in the snow cairn surveyed her anxiously for in its essentials this might be a symptom of a dreadful ailment i aroused myself however she continued but experienced an unaccountable dread of entering my uncle's room i could hear him muttering strangely and i forced myself to enter i saw oh how can i tell you you will think me mad she raised her hands to her face she was trembling robert cairn took them in his own forcing her to look up tell me he said quietly the curtains were drawn back i distinctly remembered having closed them but they were drawn back and the moonlight was shining onto the bed bad he was dreaming but was i dreaming mr cairn two hands were stretched out over my uncle two hands that swayed slowly up and down in the moonlight cairn leapt to his feet passing his hand over his forehead go on he said i-i cried out but not loudly i think i was very near to swooning the hands were withdrawn into the shadow and my uncle awoke and sat up he asked in a low voice if i were there and i ran to him yes he ordered me very coldly to phone for his solicitor at nine o'clock this morning and then fell back and was asleep again almost immediately the solicitor came and was with him for nearly an hour he sent for one of his clerks and they both went away at half past ten uncle has been in a sort of dazed condition ever since in fact he has only once aroused himself to ask for dr cairn i had a telegram sent immediately the governor will be here to-night said cairn confidently tell me the hands which you thought you saw was there anything peculiar about them in the moonlight they seemed to be of a dull white colour there was a ring on one finger a green ring oh she shuddered i can see it now you would know it again anywhere actually there was no one in the room of course no one it was some awful illusion but i can never forget it end of chapter two chapter three of brood of the witch queen by sax romer the ring of toth half moon street was very still midnight had sounded nearly half an hour but still robert cairn paced up and down his father's library he was very pale and many times he glanced at a book which lay open upon the table finally he paused before it and read once again certain passages in the year fifteen seventy one it recorded the notorious trois echelle was executed in the pla de greve he confessed before the king charles the ninth that he performed marvels admiral de coligny who also was present recollected the death of two gentlemen he added that they were found black and swollen 
he turned over the page with a hand none too steady the famous marechal d'ancre concini concini he read was killed by a pistol shot on the drawbridge of the louvre by vitry captain of the bodyguard on the twenty fourth of april sixteen seventeen it was proved that the marechal and his wife made use of wax images which they kept in coffins cairn shut the book hastily and began to pace the room again oh it is utterly fantastically incredible he groaned yet with my own eyes i saw he stepped to a bookshelf and began to look for a book which so far as his slight knowledge of the subject bore him would possibly throw light upon the darkness but he failed to find it despite the heat of the weather the library seemed to have grown chilly he pressed the bell marston he said to the man who presently came you must be very tired but dr cairn will be here within an hour tell him that i have gone to sir michael ferrara's but it's after twelve o'clock sir i know it is nevertheless i am going very good sir you will wait there for the doctor exactly marston good night good night sir robert cairn went out into half moon street the night was perfect and the cloudless sky lavishly gemmed with stars he walked on heedlessly scarce noting in which direction an awful conviction was with him growing stronger each moment that some mysterious menace some danger unclassifiable threatened myra duquesne what did he suspect he could give it no name how should he act he had no idea sir elwyn groves whom he had seen that evening had hinted broadly at mental trouble as the solution of sir michael ferrara's particular symptoms although sir michael had had certain transactions with his solicitor during the early morning he had apparently forgotten all about the matter according to the celebrated physician between ourselves cairn sir elwyn had confided i believe he altered his will the inquiry of a taxi-driver interrupted cairn's meditations he entered the vehicle giving sir michael ferrara's address his thoughts persistently turned to myra duquesne who at that moment would be lying listening for the slightest sound from the sick-room who would be fighting down fear that she might do her duty to her guardian fear of the waving phantom hands the cab sped through the almost empty streets and at last rounding a corner rolled up the tree-lined avenue passed three or four houses lighted only by the glitter of the moon and came to a stop before that of sir michael ferrara lights shone from the many windows the front door was open and light streamed out into the porch my god cried cairn leaping from the cab my god what has happened a thousand fears a thousand reproaches flooded his brain with frenzy he went racing up to the steps and almost threw himself upon the man who stood half dressed in the doorway felton felton he whispered hoarsely what has happened who sir michael sir answered the man i thought his voice broke you were the doctor sir miss myra she fainted away sir miss hume is with her in the library now cairn thrust past the servant and ran into the library the housekeeper and a trembling maid were bending over myra duquesne who lay fully dressed white and still upon a chesterfield cairn unceremoniously grasped her wrist dropped upon his knees and placed his ear to her still breast thank god he said it is only a swoon look after her mrs hume the housekeeper with set face lowered her head but did not trust herself to speak cairn went out into the hall and tapped felton on the shoulder the man turned with a great start what happened he demanded is sir michael felton nodded five minutes before you came sir his voice was hoarse with emotion miss myra came out of her room she thought someone called her she rapped on mrs hume's door and mrs hume who was just retiring opened it she also thought she had heard someone calling miss myra out in the stairhead well there was no one there sir everyone was in bed i was just undressing myself but there was a sort of faint perfume something like a church only disgusting sir how 
disgusting did you smell it never sir never mrs hume and miss myra have noticed it in the house on other nights and one of the maids too it was very strong i'm told last night well sir as they stood by the door they heard a horrid kind of choking scream they both rushed to sir michael's room and yes yes he was lying half out of bed sir dead seemed like he'd been strangled they told me and who is with him now the man grew even paler no one mr cairn sir miss myra screamed out that there were two hands just unfastening from his throat as she and mrs hume got to the door and there was no living soul in the room sir i might as well out with it we're all afraid to go in cairn turned and ran up the stairs the upper landing was in darkness and the door of the room which he knew to be sir michael's stood wide open as he entered a faint scent came to his nostrils it brought him up short at the threshold with a chill of supernatural dread the bed was placed between the windows and one curtain had been pulled aside admitting a flood of moonlight cairn remembered that myra had mentioned this circumstance in connection with the disturbance of the previous night who in god's name open that curtain he muttered fully in the cold white lay sir michael ferrara his silver hair gleaming and his strong angular face upturned to the intruding rays his glazed eyes were starting from their sockets his face was nearly black and his fingers were clutching the sheets in a death grip cairn had need of all his courage to touch him he was quite dead someone was running up the stairs cairn turned half dazed anticipating the entrance of a local medical man into the room ran his father switching on the light as he did so a grayish tinge showed through his ruddy complexion he scarcely noticed his son ferrara he cried coming up to the bed ferrara he dropped on his knees beside the dead man ferrara old fellow his cry ended in something like a sob robert cairn turned choking and went downstairs in the hall stood felton and other servants miss duquesne she has recovered sir mrs hume has taken her to another bedroom cairn hesitated then walked into the deserted library where a light was burning he began to pace up and down clenching and unclenching his fists presently felton knocked and entered clearly the man was glad of the chance to talk to someone mr anthony has been found at oxford sir i thought you might like to know he is motoring down sir and will be here at four o'clock thank you said cairn shortly ten minutes later his father joined him he was a slim well-preserved man alert-eyed and active yet he had aged five years in his son's eyes his face was unusually pale but he exhibited no other signs of emotion well rob he said tersely i can see you have something to tell me i am listening robert cairn leaped back against a bookshelf i have something to tell you sir and something to ask you tell your story first then ask your question my story begins in the thames backwater dr cairn stared squaring his jaw but his son proceeded to relate with some detail the circumstances attendant upon the death of the king swan he went on to recount what took place in anthony ferrara's rooms and at the point where something had been taken from the table and thrown into the fire stop said dr cairn what did he throw into the fire the doctor's nostrils quivered and his eyes were ablaze with some hardly repressed emotion i cannot swear to it sir never mind what do you think he threw in the fire a little image of wax or something similar an image of a swan at that despite his self-control dr cairn became so pale that his son leaped forward all right rob his father waved him away and turning walked slowly down the room go on he said rather huskily robert cairn continued his story up to the time that he visited the hospital where the dead girl lay you can swear that she was the original of the photograph in anthony's rooms and the same who was waiting at the foot of the stair i can sir go on again the younger man resumed his story relating what he had learnt from myra duquesne what she had told him about the phantom hands 
what felton had told him about the strange perfumes perceptible in the house the ring interrupted dr cairn she would recognize it again she says so anything else only that if some of your books are to be believed sir trois echelles d'ancre and others have gone to the stake for such things in a less enlightened age less enlightened boy dr cairn turned his blazing eyes upon him more enlightened where the powers of hell were concerned and you think think have i spent half my life in such studies in vain did i labour with poor michael ferrara in egypt and learn nothing just god what an end to his labour what a reward for mine he buried his face in quivering hands i cannot tell exactly what you mean by that sir said robert cairn but it brings me to my question dr cairn did not speak did not move who is antony ferrara the doctor looked up at that and it was a haggard face he raised from his hands you have tried to ask me that before i ask now sir with better prospect of receiving an answer yet i can give you none rob why sir are you bound to secrecy in a degree yes but the real reason is this i don't know you don't know i have said so good god sir you amaze me i have always felt certain that he was really no ferrara but an adopted son yet it had never entered my mind that you were ignorant of his origin you have not studied the subjects which i have studied nor do i wish that you should therefore it is impossible at any rate now to pursue that matter further but i may perhaps supplement your researches into the history of trois echelles and concini concini i believe you told me that you were looking in my library for some work which you failed to find i was looking for m chavas translation of the papyrus harris what do you know of it i once saw a copy in antony ferrara's rooms dr cairn started slightly indeed it happens that my copy is here i lent it quite recently to sir michael it is probably somewhere on the shelves he turned on more lights and began to scan the rows of books presently here it is he said and took down and opened the book on the table this passage may interest you he laid his finger upon it his son bent over the book and read the following hi the evil man was a shepherd he had said oh that i might have a book of spells that would give me resistless power he obtained a book of the formulas by the divine powers of these he enchanted men he obtained a deep vault furnished with implements he made waxen images of men and love charms and then he perpetrated all the horrors that this heart conceived flinders petrie said dr cairn mentions the book of toth as another magical work conferring similar powers but surely sir after all it's the twentieth century this is mere superstition i thought so once replied dr cairn but i have lived to know that egyptian magic was a real and a potent force a great part of it was no more than a kind of hypnotism but there were other branches our most learned modern works are as children's nursery rhymes besides such writing as the egyptian ritual of the dead god forgive me what have i done you cannot reproach yourself in any way sir can i not said dr cairn hoarsely ah rob you don't know there came a rap on the door and a local practitioner entered this is a singular case dr cairn he began diffidently an autopsy nonsense cried dr cairn sir elwin groves had foreseen it so had i but there are distinct marks of pressure on either side of the windpipe certainly these marks are not uncommon in such cases sir michael had resided in the east and had contracted a form of plague virtually he died from it the thing is highly contagious and it is almost impossible to rid the system of it a girl died in one of the hospitals this week having identical marks on the throat he turned to his son you saw her rob 
robert cairn nodded and finally the local man withdrew highly mystified but unable to contradict so celebrated a physician as dr bruce cairn the latter seated himself in an armchair and rested his chin in the palm of his left hand robert cairn paced restlessly about the library both were waiting expectantly at half past two felton brought in a tray of refreshments but neither of the men attempted to avail themselves of the hospitality miss duquesne asked the younger she has just gone to sleep sir good muttered dr cairn blessed is youth silence fell again upon the man's departure to be broken but rarely despite the tumultuous thoughts of those two minds until at about quarter to three the faint sound of a throbbing motor brought dr cairn sharply to his feet he looked towards the window dawn was breaking the car came roaring along the avenue and stopped outside the house dr cairn and his son glanced at one another a brief tumult and hurried exchange of words sounded in the hall footsteps were heard ascending the stairs then came silence the two stood side by side in front of the empty hearth a haggard pair fitly set in that desolate room with the yellowing rays of the lamps shrinking before the first spears of dawn then without warning the door opened slowly and deliberately and antony ferrara came in his voice was expressionless ivory his red lips were firm and he drooped his head but the long black eyes glinted and gleamed as if they reflected the glow from a furnace he wore a motor-coat lined with leopard skin and he was pulling off his heavy gloves it is good of you to have called doctor he said in his huskily musical voice you too cairn he advanced a few steps into the room cairn was conscious of a kind of fear but uppermost came the desire to pick up some heavy implement and crush this evilly effeminate thing with the serpent eyes then he found himself speaking the words seemed to be forced from his throat antony ferrara he said have you read the harris papyrus ferrara dropped his glove stooped and recovered it and smiled faintly no he said have you his eyes were nearly closed mere luminous slits but surely he continued this is no time cairn to discuss books as my poor father's heir and therefore your host i beg of you to partake a faint sound made him turn just within the door where the light from the reddening library windows touched her as if with sanctity stood myra duquesne in her night robe her hair unbound and her little bare feet gleaming whitely upon the red carpet her eyes were wide open vacant of expression but set upon antony ferrara's ungloved left hand ferrara turned slowly to face her until his back was towards the two men in the library she began to speak in a toneless unemotional voice raising her finger and pointing at a ring which ferrara wore i know you now she said i know you son of an evil woman for you wear her ring the sacred ring of toth you have stained that ring with blood as she stained it with the blood of those who loved and trusted you i could name you but my lips are sealed i could name you brood of a witch murderer for i know you now dispassionately mechanically she delivered her strange indictment over her shoulder appeared the anxious face of mrs hume finger to lip my god muttered cairn my god what Shh! his father grasped his arm she is asleep myra duquesne turned and quitted the room mrs hume hovering anxiously about her antony ferrara faced around his mouth was oddly twisted she is troubled with strange dreams he said very huskily clairvoyant dreams dr cairn addressed him for the first time do not glare at me in that way for it may be that i know you too come rob but myra dr cairn laid his hand upon his son's shoulder fixing his eyes upon him steadily nothing in this house can injure myra he replied quietly for good is higher than evil for the present we can only go antony ferrara stood aside as the two walked out of the library end of chapter three chapter four of brood of a witch queen by sax romer at ferrara's chambers 
dr bruce cairn swung around in his chair lifting his heavy eyebrows interrogatively as his son robert entered the consulting room half moon street was bathed in almost tropical sunlight but already the celebrated physician had sent those out from his house to whom the sky was overcast whom the sun would gladden no more and a group of anxious-eyed sufferers yet awaited his scrutiny in an adjoining room hello rob do you wish to see me professionally robert cairn seated himself upon a corner of the big table shaking his head slowly no thanks sir i'm fit enough but i thought you might like to know about the will i do know since i was largely interested german attended on my behalf an urgent case detained me he rang up earlier this morning oh i see then perhaps i'm wasting your time but it was a surprise quite a pleasant one to find that sir michael had provided for myra miss duquesne dr cairn stared hard what led you to suppose that he had not provided for his niece she is an orphan and he was her guardian of course he should have done so but i was not alone in my belief that during the peculiar state of mind which preceded his death he had altered his will in favour of his adopted son antony yes i know you were afraid of it sir but as it turns out they inherit equal shares and the house goes to myra mr antony ferrara he accentuated the name quite failed to conceal his chagrin indeed rather he was there in person wearing one of the, his beastly fur coats a fur coat with a thermometer at africa lined with civet cat of all abominations dr cairn turned to his table tapping at the blotting pad with the tip of a stethoscope i regret your attitude toward young ferrara rob his son started regret it i don't understand why you yourself brought about an open rupture on the night of sir michael's death nevertheless i am sorry you know since you are present that sir michael has left his niece to my care thank god for that i am glad too although there are many difficulties but furthermore he enjoined me to keep an eye on anthony yes yes but heavens he didn't know him for what he is dr cairn turned to him again he did not by a divine mercy he never knew but we know but his clear eyes were raised to his son's the charge is none the less sacred boy the younger man stared perplexedly but he is nothing less than a his father's upraised hand checked the word on his tongue i know what he is rob even better than you do but cannot you see how this ties my hands seals my lips robert cairn was silent stupefied give me time to see my way clearly rob at the moment i cannot reconcile my duty and my conscience i confess it but give me time if only as a move as a matter of policy keep in touch with ferrara you loathe him i know but we must watch him there are other interests myra robert cairn flushed hotly yes i see i understand by heavens it's a hard part to play but be advised by me rob meet stealth with stealth my boy we have seen strange ends come to those who stood in the path of some one if you had studied the subjects that i have studied you would know that retribution though slow is inevitable but be on your guard i am taking precautions we have an enemy i do not pretend to deny it and he fights with strange weapons perhaps i know something of those weapons too and i am adopting certain measures but one defence and the one for you is guile stealth robert cairn spoke abruptly he is installed in palatial chambers in piccadilly have you been there no call upon him take the first opportunity to do so had it not been for your knowledge of certain things which had happened in a top set at oxford we might be groping in the dark now you never liked anthony ferrara no men do but you used to call upon him in college continue to call upon him in town robert cairn stood up and lighted a cigarette right you are sir i'm glad i'm not alone in this thing by the way about myra for the present she remains at the house 
there is mrs hume and all the old servants we shall see what is to be done later you might run over and give her a look up though i will sir good-bye good-bye said dr cairn and pressed the bell which summoned marston to usher out the caller and usher in the next patient in half moon street robert cairn stood irresolute for he was one of those whose mental moods are physically reflected he might call upon myra duquesne in which event he would almost certainly be asked to stay for lunch or he might call upon antony ferrara he determined upon the latter though less pleasant course turning his steps in the direction of piccadilly he reflected that this grim and uncanny secret which he shared with his father was like to prove prejudicial to his success in journalism it was eternally uprising demoniac between himself and his work the feeling of fierce resentment towards antony ferrara which he cherished grew stronger at every step he was the spider governing the web the web that clamily touched dr cairn himself robert cairn and myra duquesne others there had been who had felt its touch who had been drawn to the heart of the unclean labyrinth and devoured in the mind of cairn the figure of antony ferrara assumed the shape of a monster a ghoul an elemental spirit of evil and now he was ascending the marble steps before the gates of the lift he stood and pressed the bell ferrara's proved to be a first-floor suite and the doors were opened by an eastern servant dressed in white his beastly theatrical affectation again muttered cairn the man should have been a musical illusionist the visitor was salaamed into a small reception room of this apartment the walls and ceiling were entirely covered by a fretwork in sandalwood evidently oriental in workmanship in niches or doorless cupboards stood curious-looking vases and pots heavy curtains of rich fabric draped the doors the floor was of mosaic and a small fountain played in the centre a cushioned divan occupied one side of the place from which natural light was entirely excluded and which was illuminated only by an ornate lantern swung from the ceiling this lantern had panes of blue glass producing a singular effect a silver mibkara or incense burner stood near to one corner of the divan and emitted a subtle perfume as the servant withdrew good heavens muttered cairn disgustedly poor sir michael's fortune won't last long at this rate he glanced at the smoking mibkara phew effeminate beast ambergris no more singular anomaly could well be pictured than that afforded by the lean neatly groomed scotsman with his fresh clean shaven face and typically british air in this setting of eastern voluptuousness the dusky servitor drew back a curtain and waved him to enter bowing low as the visitor passed cairn found himself in antony ferrara's study a huge fire was blazing in the grate rendering the heat of the study almost insufferable it was he perceived an elaborated copy of ferrara's room at oxford infinitely more spacious of course and by reason of the rugs cushions and carpets with which its floor was strewn suggestive of great opulence but the littered table was there with its nameless instruments and its extraordinary silver lamp the mummies were there the antique volumes rolls of papyrus preserved snakes and cats and ibises statuettes of isis osiris and other nile deities were there the many photographs of women too cairn had dubbed it at oxford the zenana above all there was antony ferrara he wore the silver-gray dressing-gown trimmed with white swan's down in which cairn had seen him before his statuesque ivory face was set in a smile which yet was no smile of welcome the over-red lips smiled alone the long glittering dark eyes were joyless almost beneath the straightly penciled brows sinister save for the short lustreless hair it was the face of a handsome evil woman my dear cairn what a welcome interruption how good of you there was strange music in his husky tones he spoke unemotionally falsely but cairn could not deny the charm of that unique voice it was possible to understand how women some women would be as clay in the hands of the man who had such a voice as that 
His visitor nodded shortly. Cairn was a poor actor. Already his role was oppressing him. Whilst Ferrara was speaking, one found a sort of fascination in listening. But when he was silent, he repelled. Ferrara may have been conscious of this, for he spoke much and well. "'You have made yourself jolly comfortable,' said Cairn. "'Why not, my dear Cairn? Every man has within him something of the Sybarite. Why crush a propensity so delightful? The Spartan philosophy is palpably absurd. It is that of one who finds himself in a garden filled with roses, and who holds his nostrils, who perceives there shady bowers, but chooses to burn in the sun, who, ignoring the choice of fruits which tempt his hand and court his palate, stoops to pluck bitter herbs from the wayside i see snapped cairn aren't you thinking of doing any more work then work anthony ferrara smiled and sank upon a heap of cushions forgive me cairn but i leave it gladly and confidently to more robust characters such as your own he proffered a silver box of cigarettes but cairn shook his head balancing himself on a corner of the table no thanks i have smoked too much already my tongue is parched my dear fellow ferrara rose i have a wine which i declare you will never have tasted but which you will pronounce to be nectar it is made in cyprus cairn raised his hand in a way that might have reminded a nice observer of his father thank you nevertheless some other time ferrara i am no wine man a whisky and soda or a burly british b and s even a sporty scotch and polly there was a suggestion of laughter in the husky voice now of a sort of contemptuous banter but cairn stolidly shook his head and forced a smile many thanks but it's too early he stood up and began to walk about the room inspecting the numberless oddities which it contained the photographs he examined with supercilious curiosity then passing to a huge cabinet he began to peer in at the rows of amulets statuettes and other unclassifiable objects with which it was laden ferrara's voice came that head of a priestess on the left cairn is of great interest the brain had not been removed and quite a colony of domestic beetles had propagated in the cavity those creatures never saw the light cairn yet i assure you that they had eyes i have nearly forty of them in the small glass case on the table there you might like to examine them cairn shuddered but he felt impelled to turn and look at these gruesome relics in a square glass case he saw the creatures they lay in rows on a bed of moss one might almost have supposed that unclean life yet survived in the little black insects they were an unfamiliar species to cairn being covered with unusually long black hair except upon the root of the wing-cases where they were of brilliant orange the perfect pupae of this insect are extremely rare added ferrara informatively indeed replied cairn he had found something physically revolting in that group of beetles whose history had begun and ended in the skull of a mummy filthy things he said why do you keep them ferrara shrugged his shoulders who knows he answered enigmatically they might prove useful some day a bell rang and from ferrara's attitude it occurred to cairn that he was expecting a visitor i must be off he said accordingly and indeed he was conscious of craving for the cool and comparatively clean air of piccadilly he knew something of the great evil which dwelt within this man whom he was compelled by singular circumstances to tolerate but the duty began to irk if you must was the reply of course your press work no doubt is very exacting the note of badinage was discernible again but cairn passed out into the mandara without replying where he found the fountain plashed coolly and the silver mibkara sent up its pencils of vapour the outer door was opened by the oriental servant and ferrara stood and bowed to his departing visitor he did not proffer his hand until our next meeting cairn es salam aleikum peace be with you he murmured as the moslems say but indeed i shall be with you in spirit dear cairn there was something in the tone wherein he spoke those last words that brought cairn up short he turned but the doors closed silently a faint breath of ambergris was borne to his nostrils 
End of chapter four. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California. Chapter five of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer. The Rustling Shadows. Cairn stepped out of the lift, crossed the hall, and was about to walk out on to Piccadilly, when he stopped, staring hard at a taxicab, which had slowed down upon the opposite side whilst the driver awaited a suitable opportunity to pull across. The occupant of the cab was invisible now, but a moment before Cairn had had a glimpse of her as she glanced out, apparently towards the very doorway in which he stood. Perhaps his imagination was playing him tricks. He stood and waited, until at last the cab drew within a few yards of him. Myra Duquesne got out. Having paid the cabman, she crossed the pavement and entered the hallway. Cairn stepped forward so that she almost ran into his arms. "'Mr. Cairn!' she cried. "'Why, have you been to see Antony?' "'I have,' he replied, and paused at a loss for words. It had suddenly occurred to him that Antony Ferrara and Myra Duquesne had known one another from childhood, that the girl probably regarded Ferrara in the light of a brother. "'There are so many things I want to talk to him about,' she said. "'He seems to know everything, and I am afraid I know very little.' Cairn noted with dismay the shadows under her eyes, the grey eyes that he would have wished to see ever full of light and laughter she was pale too or seemed unusually so in her black dress but the tragic death of her guardian sir michael ferrara had been a dreadful blow to this convent-bred girl who had no other kin in the world a longing swept into cairn's heart and set it ablaze a longing to take all her sorrows all her cares upon his own broad shoulders to take her and hold her shielded from whatever of trouble or menace the future might bring have you seen his rooms here he asked trying to speak casually but his soul was up in arms against the bare idea of this girl's entering that perfumed place where abominable and vile things were and none of them so vile as the man she trusted whom she counted a brother not yet she answered with a sort of childish glee momentarily lighting her eyes are they very splendid very he answered her grimly can't you come in with me for a while only just a little while then you can come home to lunch you and anthony her eyes sparkled now oh do say yes knowing what he did of the man upstairs he longed to accompany her yet contradictorily knowing what he did could not face him again and could not submit himself to the test of being civil to anthony ferrara in the presence of myra duquesne please don't tempt me he begged and forced a smile i shall find myself enrolled amongst the seekers of soup tickets if i completely ignore the claims of my employer upon my time oh what a shame she cried their eyes met and something something unspoken but cogent passed between them so that for the first time a pretty colour tinted the girl's cheeks she suddenly grew embarrassed good-bye then she said holding out her hand will you lunch with us to-morrow thanks awfully replied cairn rather if it's humanly possible i'll ring you up he released her hand and stood watching her as she entered the lift when it ascended he turned and went out to swell the human tide of piccadilly he wondered what his father would think of the girls visiting ferrara would he approve decidedly the situation was a delicate one the wrong kind of interference the tactless kind might merely render it worse it would be awfully difficult if not impossible to explain to myra if an open rupture were to be avoided and he had profound faith in his father's acumen then myra must remain in ignorance but was she to be allowed to continue these visits should he have permitted her to enter ferrara's rooms he reflected that he had no right to question her movements but at least he might have accompanied her oh heavens he muttered what a horrible tangle it will drive me mad there could be no peace for him until he knew her to be safely home again and his work suffered accordingly until at about midday he rang up myra duquesne on the pretence of accepting her invitation to lunch on the morrow and heard with inexpressible relief her voice replying to him in the afternoon he was suddenly called upon to do a big royal matinee 
and this necessitated a run to his chambers in order to change from harris tweed into vicuna and cashmere the usual stream of lawyers clerks and others poured under the archway leading to the court but in the far corner shaded by the tall plane tree where the ascending steps and worn iron railing the small panes of glass in the solicitor's window on the ground floor and the general air of dickens-like aloofness prevailed one entered a sort of backwater in the narrow hallway quiet rang a quiet profound as though motor-buses were not cairn ran up the stairs to the second landing and began to fumble for his key although he knew it to be impossible he was aware of a queer impression that someone was waiting for him inside his chambers the sufficiently palpable fact that such a thing was impossible did not really strike him until he had opened the door and entered up to that time in a sort of subconscious way he had anticipated finding a visitor there what an ass i am he muttered then phew there's a disgusting smell he threw open all the windows and entering his bedroom also opening both the windows there the current of air thus established began to disperse the odour a fusty one as of something decaying and by the time he had changed it was scarcely perceptible he had little time to waste in speculation but when as he ran out to the door glancing at his watch the nauseous odour suddenly rose again to his nostrils he stopped with his hand on the latch what the deuce is it he said loudly quite mechanically he turned and looked back as one might have anticipated there was nothing visible to account for the odour the emotion of fear is a strange and complex one in this breath of decay rising to his nostril cairn found something fearsome he opened the door stepped out on to the landing and closed the door behind him at an hour close upon midnight dr bruce cairn who was about to retire received a wholly unexpected visit from his son robert cairn followed his father into the library and sat down in the big red leathern easy chair the doctor tilted the lampshade directing the light upon robert's face it proved to be slightly pale and in the clear eyes was an odd expression almost a hunted look what's the trouble rob have a whisky and soda robert cairn helped himself quietly now take a cigar and tell me what has frightened you frightened me he started and paused in the act of reaching for a match yes you're right sir i am frightened not at the moment you have been right again he lighted his cigar i want to begin by saying that well how can i put it when i took up newspaper work we thought it would be better if i lived in chambers certainly well at that time he examined the lighted end of his cigar there was no reason why i should not live alone but now well now i feel sir that i have need of more or less constant companionship especially i feel that it would be desirable to have a friendly hand at er at night time dr cairn leant forward in his chair his face was very stern hold out your fingers he said extended left hand his son obeyed smiling slightly the open hand showed in the lamplight steady as a carven hand nerves quite in order sir dr cairn inhaled a deep breath tell me he said it's a queer tale his son began and if i told it to craig fenton or matterly round in harley street i know what they would say but you will understand it started this afternoon when the sun was pouring in through the windows i had to go to my chambers to change and the rooms were filled with a most disgusting smell his father started what kind of smell he asked not incense no replied robert looking hard at him i thought you would ask that it was a smell of something putrid something rotten rotten with the rottenness of ages did you trace where it came from i opened all the windows and that seemed to disperse it for a time then just as i was going out it returned it seemed to envelop me like a filthy miasma you know sir it's hard to explain just the way i felt about it but it all amounts to this i was glad to get outside dr cairn stood up and began to pace about the room his hands locked behind him to-night he rapped suddenly what occurred to-night 
to-night continued his son i got in about half-past nine i had had such a rush in one way and another that the incident had quite lost its hold on my imagination i hadn't forgotten it of course but i was not thinking of it when i unlocked the door in fact i didn't begin to think of it again until in slippers and dressing-gown i had settled down for a comfortable read there was nothing absolutely nothing to influence my imagination in that way the book was an old favourite mark twain's up the mississippi and i sat in the armchair with a large bottle of lager beer at my elbow and my pipe going strong becoming restless in turn the speaker stood up and walking to the fireplace flicked off the long cone of grey ash from his cigar <sighs> he leant one elbow upon the mantelpiece resuming his story st paul's had just chimed the half hour half past ten when my pipe went out before i had time to relight it came the damnable smell again at the moment nothing was farther from my mind and i jumped up with an exclamation of disgust it seemed to be growing stronger and stronger i got my pipe alight quickly still i could smell it the aroma of the tobacco did not lessen its beastly pungency in the smallest degree i tilted the shade of my reading lamp and looked all about there was nothing unusual to be seen both windows were open and i went to one and thrust my head out in order to learn if the odour had come from outside it did not the air inside the room was fresh and clean then i remembered that when i had left my chambers in the afternoon the smell had been stronger near the door than anywhere i ran out to the door in the passage i could smell nothing but he paused glancing at his father before i had stood there thirty seconds it was rising all about me like the fumes from a crater by god sir i realized then that it was something following me dr cairn stood watching him from the shadows beyond the big table as he came forward and finished his whisky at a gulp that seemed to work a change in me he continued rapidly i recognized there was something behind this disgusting manifestation something directing it and i recognized too that the next move was up to me i went back to my room the odour was not so pronounced but as i stood there by the table waiting it increased and increased until it almost choked me my nerves were playing tricks but i kept a fast hold on myself i set to work very methodically and fumigated the place within myself i knew that it could do no good but i felt that i had to put up some kind of opposition you understand sir quite replied dr cairn quietly it was an organized attempt to expel the invader and though of itself it was useless the mental attitude dictating it was good go on the clocks had chimed eleven when i gave up and i felt physically sick the air by this time was poisonous literally poisonous i dropped into the easy chair and began to wonder what the end of it would be then in the shadowy parts of the room outside the circle of light cast by the lamp i detected darker patches for a while i tried to believe that they were imaginary but when i saw one move along the bookcase glide down its side and come across the carpet towards me i knew that they were not before heaven sir his voice shook either i am mad or to-night my room was filled with things that crawled they were everywhere on the floor on the walls even on the ceiling above me where the light was i couldn't detect them but the shadows were alive alive with things the size of my two hands and in the growing stillness his voice had become husky dr cairn stood still as a man of stone watching him in the stillness very faintly they rustled silence fell a car passed outside in half moon street its throb died away the clock was chiming the half hour after midnight dr cairn spoke anything else one other thing sir i was gripping the chair arms i felt that i had to grip something to prevent myself from slipping into madness my left hand he glanced at it with a sort of repugnance something hairy and indescribably loathsome touched it just brushed against it but it was too much i'm ashamed to tell you sir i screamed screamed like any hysterical girl 
and for the second time ran i ran from my own rooms grabbed a hat and coat and left my dressing-gown on the floor he turned leaning both elbows on the mantelpiece and buried his face in his hands have another drink said dr cairn you called on anthony ferrara to-day didn't you how did he receive you that brings me to something else i wanted to tell you continued robert squirting soda water into his glass myra goes there where to his chambers yes dr cairn began to pace the room again i am not surprised he admitted she has always been taught to regard him in the light of a brother but nevertheless we must put a stop to it how did you learn this robert cairn gave him an account of the morning's incidents describing ferrara's chambers with a minute exactness which revealed how deep how indelible an impression their strangeness had made upon his mind there is one thing he concluded against which i am always coming up i puzzled over it at oxford and others did too i came against it to-day who is anthony ferrara where did sir michael find him what kind of woman bore such a son stop boy cried dr cairn robert started looking at his father across the table you are already in danger rob i won't disguise that fact from you myra duquesne is no relation of ferrara's therefore since she inherits half of sir michael's fortune a certain course must have suggested itself to antony you patently are an obstacle that's bad enough boy let us deal with it before we look for further trouble he took up a blackened briar from the table and began to load it regarding your next move he continued slowly there can be no question you must return to your chambers what there can be no question rob a kind of attack has been made upon you which only you can repel if you desert your chambers it will be repeated here at present it is evidently localized there are laws governing these things laws as immutable as any other laws in nature one of them is this the powers of darkness to employ a conventional and significant phrase cannot triumph over the powers of will below the godhead will is the supreme force of the universe resist you must resist or you are lost what do you mean sir i mean that destruction of mind and of something more than mind threatens you if you retreat you are lost go back to your rooms seek your foe strive to haul him into the light and crush him the phenomena at your rooms belong to one of two varieties at present it seems impossible to classify them more closely both are dangerous though in different ways i suspect however that a purely mental effort will be sufficient to disperse these nauseous shadow things probably you will not be troubled again to-night but whenever the phenomena return take off your coat to them you require no better companion than the one you had mark twain treat your visitors as one might imagine he would have treated them as a very poor joke but whenever it begins again ring me up don't hesitate whatever the hour i shall be at the hospital all day but from seven onward i shall be here and shall make a point of remaining give me a call when you return now and if there is no earlier occasion another in the morning then rely upon my active cooperation throughout the following night active sir i said active rob the next repetition of these manifestations shall be the last good night remember you have only to lift the receiver to know that you are not alone in your fight robert cairn took a second cigar lighted it finished his whisky and squared his shoulders good night sir he said i shan't run away a third time when the door had closed upon his exit dr cairn resumed his restless pacing up and down the library he had given roman counsel for he had sent his son out to face alone a real and dreadful danger only thus could he hope to save him but nevertheless it had been hard the next fight would be a fight to the finish for robert had said i shan't run away a third time and he was a man of his word as dr cairn had declared the manifestations belonged to one of two varieties 
according to the most ancient science in the world the science by which the egyptians and perhaps even earlier peoples ordered their lives we share this our plane of existence with certain other creatures often called elementals mercifully these fearsome entities are invisible to our normal sight just as the finer tones of music are inaudible to our normal powers of hearing victims of delirium tremens opium smokers and other debauchees artificially open that finer latent power of vision and the horrors which surround them are not imaginary but are elementals attracted to the victim by his peculiar excesses the crawling things then which reeked abominably might be elementals so dr cairn reasoned superimposed upon robert cairn's consciousness by a directing malignant intelligence on the other hand they might be mere glamours or thought forms thrust upon him by the same wizard mind emanations from an evil powerful will his reflections were interrupted by the ringing of the phone bell he took up the receiver hello that you sir all's clear now i'm turning in all right good night rob ring me in the morning good night sir dr cairn refilled his charred briar and taking from a drawer in the writing-table a thick manuscript sat down and began to study the closely written pages the paper was in the cramped handwriting of the late sir michael ferrara his travelling companion through many strange adventures and the sun had been flooding the library with dim golden light for several hours and a bustle below stairs acclaimed an awakened household ere the doctor's studies were interrupted again it was the phone bell he rose switched off the reading lamp and lifted the instrument that you rob yes sir all's well thank god can i breakfast with you certainly my boy dr cairn glanced at his watch why upon my soul it's seven o'clock End of chapter 5 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 6 of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer The Beatles Sixteen hours had elapsed and London's clocks were booming eleven that night when the uncanny drama entered upon its final stage once more dr cairn sat alone with sir michael's manuscript but at frequent intervals his glance would stray to the telephone at his elbow he had given orders to the effect that he was on no account to be disturbed and that his car should be ready at the door from ten o'clock onward as the sound of the final strokes was dying away the expected summons came dr cairn's jaw squared and his mouth was very grim when he recognized his son's voice over the wires well boy they're here sir now while i'm speaking i have been fighting fighting hard for half an hour the place smells like a charnel house and the shapes are taking definite horrible form they have eyes his voice sounded harsh quite black the eyes are and they shine like beads it's gradually wearing me down although i have myself in hand so far i mean i might crack up at any moment bah his voice ceased hello cried dr cairn hello rob it's all right sir came all but inaudibly the things are all around the edge of the light patch they make a sort of rustling noise it is a tremendous conscious effort to keep them at bay while i was speaking i somehow lost my grip of the situation one crawled it fastened on my hand a hairy many-limbed horror oh my god another is touching rob rob keep your nerve boy do you hear yes yes faintly pray my boy pray for strength and it will come to you you must hold out for another ten minutes ten minutes do you understand yes yes merciful god if you can help me do it sir or hold out boy in ten minutes you'll have won dr cairn hung up the receiver raced from the library and grabbing a cap from the rack in the wall ran down the steps and bounded into the waiting car shouting an address to the man piccadilly was gay with supper-bound theatre crowds when he leapt out and ran into the hallway which had been the scene of robert's meeting with myra duquesne dr cairn ran past the lift doors and went up the stairs three steps at a time he pressed his finger to the bell push beside anthony ferrara's door and held it there until the door opened and a dusky face appeared in the opening 
the visitor thrust his way in past the white-clad man holding out his arms to detain him not at home offend him dr cairn shot a sinewy hand grabbed the man he was a tall fellahin by the shoulder and sent him spinning across the mosaic floor of the mandara the air was heavy with the perfume of ambergris wasting no word upon the reeling man dr cairn stepped to the doorway he jerked the drapery aside and found himself in a dark corridor from his son's description of the chambers he had no difficulty in recognizing the door of the study he turned the handle the door proved to be unlocked and entered the darkened room in the grate a huge fire glowed redly the temperature of the place was almost unbearable on the table the light from the silver lamp shed a patch of radiance but the rest of the study was veiled in shadow a black-robed figure was seated in a high-backed carved chair one corner of the cowl-like garment was thrown across the table half rising the figure turned and an evil apparition in the glow from the fire antony ferrara faced the intruder dr cairn walked forward till he stood over the other uncover what you have on the table he said succinctly ferrara's strange eyes were lifted up to the speakers with an expression in their depths which in the middle ages alone would have sent a man to the stake dr cairn the husky voice had lost something of its suavity you heard my order your order surely doctor since i am in my own uncover what you have on the table or must i do it for you antony ferrara placed his hand upon the end of the black robe which lay across the table be careful dr cairn he said evenly you are taking risks dr cairn suddenly leaped seized the shielding hand in a sure grip and twisted ferrara's arm behind him then with a second rapid movement he snatched away the robe a faint smell a smell of corruption of ancient rottenness arose in the superheated air a square of faded linen lay on the table figured with all but indecipherable egyptian characters and upon it in rows which formed a definite geometrical design were arranged a great number of little black insects dr cairn released the hand which he held and ferrara sat quite still looking straight before him Vermestes beetles from the skull of a mummy you filthy obscene beast ferrara spoke with a calm suddenly regained is there anything obscene in the study of beetles my son saw these things here yesterday and last night and again to-night you cast magnified doubles glamours of the horrible creatures into his rooms by means which you know of but which i know of too you sought to bring your thought things down to the material plane dr cairn my respect for you is great but i fear that much study has made you mad ferrara reached out his hand towards an ebony box he was smiling don't dare to touch that box he paused glancing up more orders doctor exactly dr cairn grabbed the faded linen scooping up the beetles within it and striding across the room threw the whole unsavoury bundle into the heart of the fire a great flame leapt up there came a series of squeaky explosions so that almost one might have imagined those age-old insects to have had life then the doctor turned again ferrara leaped to his feet with a cry that had in it something inhuman and began rapidly to babble in a tongue that was not european he was facing dr cairn a tall sinister figure but one hand was groping behind him for the box stop that rapped the doctor imperatively and for the last time do not dare to touch that box the flood of strange words was damned ferrara stood quivering but silent the laws by which such as you were burnt the wise laws of long ago are no more said dr cairn english law cannot touch you but god has provided for your kind perhaps whispered ferrara you would like also to burn this box to which you object so strongly no power on earth would prevail upon me to touch it but you you have touched it and you know the penalty you raise forces of evil that have lain dormant for ages and dare to wield them beware i know of some whom you have murdered i cannot know how many you have sent to the madhouse but i swear that in future your victims shall be few there is a way to deal with you he turned and walked to the door beware also dear dr cairn came softly as you say i raise forces of evil 
Dr. Cairn spun about. In three strides he was standing over Anthony Ferrara, fists clenched and his sinewy body tense in every fibre. His face was pale, as was apparent even in that vague light, and his eyes gleamed like steel. "'You raise other forces,' he said, and his voice, though steady, was very low. "'Evil forces also.' Anthony Ferrara, invoker of nameless horrors, shrank before him, before the primitive Celtic man whom unwittingly he had invoked. Dr. Cairn was spare and lean, but in perfect physical condition. Now he was strong, with the strength of a just cause. Moreover, he was dangerous, and Ferrara knew it well. "'I fear,' began the latter huskily. "'Dare to bandy words with me,' said Dr. Cairn, with icy coolness answer me back but once again and before god i'll strike you dead ferrara sat silent clutching at the arms of his chair and not daring to raise his eyes for ten magnetic seconds they stayed so then again dr cairn turned and this time walked out the clocks had been chiming the quarter after eleven as he had entered anthony ferrara's chambers and some had not finished their chimes when his son choking called wildly upon heaven to aid him had fallen in the midst of crowding obscene things, and in the instant of his fall had found the room clear of the waving antennae, the beady eyes, and the beetle shapes. The whole horrible phantasmagoria, together with the odor of ancient rottenness, faded like a fevered dream at the moment that Dr. Cairn had burst in upon the creator of it. Robert Cairn stood up, weakly, trembling, then dropped upon his knees and sobbed out prayers of thankfulness that came from his frightened soul. End of chapter 6 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 7 of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer Sir Elwyn Grove's Patient When a substantial legacy is divided into two shares, one of which falls to a man, young, dissolute, and clever, and the other to a girl, pretty and inexperienced, there is laughter in the hells but to the girl's legacy add another item a strong stern guardian and the issue becomes one less easy to predict in the case at present under consideration such an arrangement led dr bruce cairn to pack off myra duquesne to a grim scottish manor in inverness upon a visit of indefinite duration it also led to heart burnings on the part of robert cairn and to other things about to be noticed anthony ferrara the co-legatee was not slow to recognize that a damaging stroke had been played but he knew dr cairn too well to put up any protest in his capacity of fashionable physician the doctor frequently met ferrara in society for a man at once rich handsome and bearing a fine name is not socially ostracized on the mere suspicion that he is a dangerous blackguard thus anthony ferrara was courted by the smartest women in town and tolerated by the men dr cairn would always acknowledge him and then turn his back upon the dark-eyed adopted son of his dearest friend there was that between the two of which the world knew nothing had the world known what dr cairn knew respecting anthony ferrara then despite his winning manner his wealth and his station every door in london from those of mayfair to that of the foulest den in limehouse would have been closed to him closed and barred with horror and loathing a tremendous secret was locked up within the heart of dr bruce cairn sometimes we seem to be granted a glimpse of the guiding hand that steers men's destinies then as comprehension is about to dawn we lose again our temporal lucidity of vision the following incident illustrates this sir elwyn groves of harley street took dr cairn aside at the club one evening i am passing a patient on to you cairn he said lord lashmore ah replied cairn thoughtfully i have never met him he has only quite recently returned to england you may have heard and brought a south american lady lashmore with him i had heard that yes lord lashmore is close upon fifty-five and his wife a passionate southern type is probably less than twenty they are an odd couple the lady has been doing some extensive entertaining at the town house grove stared hard at dr cairn your young friend antony ferrara is a regular visitor no doubt 
said cairn he goes everywhere i don't know how long his funds will last i have wondered too his chambers are like a scene from the arabian nights how do you know inquired the other curiously have you attended him yes was the reply his eastern servant phoned for me one night last week and i found ferrara lying unconscious in a room like a pasha's harem he looked simply ghastly but the man would give me no account of what had caused the attack it looked to me like sheer nervous exhaustion he gave me quite an anxious five minutes incidentally the room was blazing hot with a fire roaring right up the chimney and it smelt like a hindu temple ah muttered cairn between his mode of life and his peculiar studies he will probably crack up he has a fragile constitution who the deuce is he cairn pursued sir elwin you must know all the circumstances of his adoption you were with the late sir michael in egypt at the time the fellow is a mystery to me he repels in some way i was glad to get away from his rooms you were going to tell me something about lord lashmore's case i think said cairn sir elwin groves screwed up his eyes and readjusted his pince-nez for the deliberate way in which his companion had changed the conversation was unmistakable however cairn's brusque manners were proverbial and sir elwin accepted the lead yes yes i believe i was he agreed rather lamely well it's very singular i was called there last monday at about two o'clock in the morning i found the house upside down and lady lashmore with a dressing-gown thrown over her night-dress engaged in bathing a bad wound in her husband's throat what attempted suicide my first idea naturally but a glance at the wound set me wondering it was bleeding profusely and from its location i was afraid that it might have penetrated the internal jugular but the external only was wounded i arrested the flow of blood and made the patient comfortable lady lashmore assisted me coolly and displayed some skill as a nurse in fact she had applied a ligature before my arrival lord lashmore remained unconscious quite he was shaky of course i called again at nine o'clock that morning and found him progressing favourably when i had dressed the wounds wounds there were two actually i will tell you in a moment i asked lord lashmore for an explanation he had given out for the benefit of the household that stumbling out of bed in the dark he had tripped upon a rug so that he fell forward almost into the fireplace there is a rather ornate fender with an elaborate copper or scrollwork design and his account was that he came down with all his weight upon this in such a way that part of the copper work pierced his throat it was possible just possible cairn but it didn't satisfy me and i could see that it didn't satisfy lady lashmore however when we were alone lashmore told me the real facts he had been concealing the truth largely for his wife's sake i fancy he was anxious to spare her the alarm which knowing the truth she must have experienced his story was this related in confidence but he wishes that you should know he was awakened by a sudden sharp pain in the throat not very acute but accompanied by a feeling of pressure it was gone again in a moment and he was surprised to find blood upon his hands when he felt for the cause of the pain he got out of bed and experienced a great dizziness the hemorrhage was altogether more severe than he had supposed not wishing to arouse his wife he did not enter his dressing-room which is situated between his own room and lady lashmore's he staggered as far as the bell push and then collapsed his man found him on the floor sufficiently near to the fender to lend colour to the story of the accident dr cairn coughed dryly do you think it was attempted suicide after all then he asked no i don't replied sir elwin emphatically i think it was something altogether more difficult to explain not attempted murder almost possible except in chambers lord lashmore's valet no one could possibly have gained access to that suite of rooms they number four there is a small boudoir out of which opens lady lashmore's bedroom between this and lord lashmore's apartment is the dressing-room lord lashmore's door was locked and so was that of the boudoir these are the only two means of entrance 
but you said that chambers came in and found him chambers has a key of lord lashmore's door that is why i said excepting chambers but chambers has been with his present master since lashmore left cambridge it's out of the question windows first floor no balcony and overlook hyde park is there no clue to the mystery there are three what are they first the nature of the wounds second lord lashmore's idea that something was in the room at the moment of his awakening third the fact that an identical attempt was made upon him last night last night good god with what result the former wounds though deep are very tiny and had quite healed over one of them partially reopened but lord lashmore awoke altogether more readily and before any damage had been done he says that some soft body rolled off the bed he uttered a loud cry leapt out and switched on the electric lights at the same moment he heard a frightful scream from his wife's room when i arrived lashmore himself summoned me on this occasion i had a new patient lady lashmore exactly she had fainted from fright at hearing her husband's cry i assume there had been a slight hemorrhage from the throat too what tuberculosis i fear so fright would not produce hemorrhage in the case of a healthy subject would it dr cairn shook his head he was obviously perplexed and lord lashmore he asked the marks were there again replied sir elwin rather lower on the neck but they were quite superficial he had awakened in time and had struck out hitting something what some living thing apparently covered with long silky hair it escaped however and now said dr cairn these wounds what are they like they are like the marks of fangs replied sir elwin of two long sharp fangs End of chapter 7 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 8 of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer The Secret of Dune Lord Lashmore was a big, blond man, fresh-colored, and having his nearly white hair worn close-cut, and his moustache trimmed in the neat military fashion. For a fair man he had eyes of a singular color they were of so dark a shade of brown as to appear black southern eyes lending to his personality an oddness very striking when he was shown into dr cairn's library the doctor regarded him with that searching scrutiny peculiar to men of his profession at the same time inviting the visitor to be seated lashmore sat down in the red leathern chair resting his large hands upon his knees with the fingers widely spread he had a massive dignity but was not entirely at his ease dr cairn opened the conversation in his direct fashion you come to consult me lord lashmore in my capacity of occultist rather than that of physician in both replied lord lashmore distinctly in both sir elwin groves is attending you for certain throat wounds lord lashmore touched the high stock which he was wearing the scars remain he said do you wish to see them i am afraid i must trouble you the stock was untied and dr cairn through a powerful glass examined the marks one of them the lower was slightly inflamed lord lashmore retied his stock standing before the small mirror set in the overmantel you had an impression of some presence in the room at the time of the outrage pursued the doctor distinctly on both occasions did you say anything the room was too dark but you felt something hair my knuckles as i struck out i am speaking of the second outrage encountered a thick mass of hair the body of some animal probably the head but still you saw nothing i must confess that i had a vague idea of some shape flitting away across the room a white shape therefore probably a figment of my imagination your cry awakened lady lashmore unfortunately yes her nerves were badly shaken already and this second shock proved too severe sir elwin fears chest trouble i am taking her abroad as soon as possible 
she was found insensible where at the door of the dressing-room the door communicating with her own room not that communicating with mine she had evidently started to come into my assistance when faintness overcame her what is her own account that is her own account who discovered her i did dr cairn was drumming his fingers on the table you have a theory lord lashmore he said suddenly let me hear it lord lashmore started and glared across at the speaker with a sort of haughty surprise i have a theory i think so am i wrong lashmore stood on the rug before the fireplace with his hands locked behind him and his head lowered looking out under his tufted eyebrows at dr cairn thus seen lord lashmore's strange eyes had a sinister appearance if i had had a theory he began you would have come to me to seek confirmation suggested dr cairn ah yes you may be right sir elwin groves to whom i hinted something mentioned your name i am not quite clear upon one point dr cairn did he send me to you because he thought in a word are you a mental specialist i am not sir elwin has no doubts respecting your brain lord lashmore he has sent you here because i have made some study of what i may term psychical ailments there is a chapter in your family history he fixed his searching gaze upon the other's face which latterly has been occupying your mind at last lashmore started in good earnest to what do you refer lord lashmore you have come to me for advice a rare ailment happily very rare in england has assailed you circumstances have been in your favour thus far but a recurrence is to be anticipated at any time be good enough to look upon me as a specialist and give me all your confidence lashmore cleared his throat what do you wish to know dr cairn he asked with a queer intermingling of respect and hauteur in his tones i wish to know about mirza wife of the third baron lashmore lord lashmore took a stride forward his large hands clenched and his eyes were blazing what do you know about her surprise was in his voice and anger i have seen her portrait in dune castle you were not in residence at the time mirza lady lashmore was evidently a very beautiful woman what was the date of the marriage sixteen fifteen the third baron brought her to england from poland she was a pole a polish jewess there was no issue of the marriage but the baron outlived her and married again lord lashmore shifted his feet nervously and gnawed his fingernails there was issue of the marriage he snapped she was my ancestress ah dr cairn's grey eyes lighted up momentarily we get to the facts why was this birth kept secret dune castle has kept many secrets it was a grim noble of the middle ages who was speaking for a lashmore there was no difficulty in suppressing the facts arranging a hasty second marriage and representing the boy as the child of the later union had the second marriage proved fruitful this had been unnecessary but an heir to dune was essential i see had the second marriage proved fruitful the child of mirza would have been what shall we say smothered damn it what do you mean he was the rightful heir dr cairn said lashmore slowly you are probing an open wound the fourth baron lashmore represents what the world calls the curse of the house of dune at dune castle there is a secret chamber which has engaged the pens of many so-called occultists but which no man save every heir has entered for generations its very location is a secret measurements do not avail to find it you would appear to know much of my family's black secret perhaps you know where that room lies at dune certainly i do replied dr cairn calmly it is under the moat some thirty yards west of the former drawbridge lord lashmore changed colour when he spoke again his voice had lost its timbre perhaps you know what it contains i do it contains paul fourth baron lashmore son of mirza the polish jewess lord lashmore reseated himself in the big armchair staring at the speaker aghast 
i thought no other in the world knew that he said hollowly your studies have been extensive indeed for three years for three years three whole years from the night of my twenty-first birthday the horror hung over me dr cairn it ultimately brought my grandfather to the madhouse but my father was of sterner stuff and so it seems was i after those three years of horror i threw off the memories of paul dune the third baron it was on the night of your twenty-first birthday that you were admitted to the subterranean room you know so much dr cairn that you might as well know all lashmore's face was twitching but you are about to hear what no man has ever heard from the lips of one of my family before he stood up again restless nearly thirty-five years have elapsed he resumed since that december night but my very soul trembles now when i recall it there was a big house-party at dune but i had been prepared for some weeks by my mother for the ordeal that awaited me our family mystery is historical and there were many fearful glances bestowed upon me when at midnight my father took me aside from the company and led me to the old library by god dr cairn fearful as these reminiscences are it is a relief to relate them to some one a sort of suppressed excitement was upon lashmore but his voice remained low and hollow he asked me he continued the traditional question if i had prayed for strength god knows i had then his stern face very pale he locked the library door and from a closet concealed beside the ancient fireplace a closet which hitherto i had not known to exist he took out a bulky key of antique workmanship together we set to work to remove all the volumes from one of the bookshelves even when the shelves were empty it called for our united efforts to move the heavy piece of furniture but we accomplished the task ultimately making visible a considerable expanse of panelling nearly forty years had elapsed since that case had been removed and the carvings which it concealed were coated with all the dust which had accumulated there since the night of my father's coming of age a device upon the top of the centre panel represented the arms of the family the helm which formed part of the device projected like a knob my father grasped it turned it and threw his weight against the seemingly solid wall it yielded swinging inward upon concealed hinges and a damp earthy smell came out into the library taking up a lamp which he had in readiness my father entered the cavity beckoning me to follow i found myself descending a flight of rough steps and the roof above me was so low that i was compelled to stoop a corner was come to passed and a further flight of steps appeared beneath at that time the old moat was still flooded and even had i not divined as much from the direction of the steps i should have known at this point that we were beneath it between the stone blocks roofing us in oozed drops of moisture and the air was at once damp and icily cold a short passage commencing at the foot of the steps terminated before a massive iron-studded door my father placed the key in the lock and holding the lamp above his head turned and looked at me he was deathly pale summon all your fortitude he said he strove to turn the key but for a long time without success for the lock was rusty finally however he was a strong man his efforts were successful the door opened and an indescribable smell came out into the passage never before had i met with anything like it i have never met with it since lord lashmore wiped his brow with his handkerchief the first thing he resumed upon which the lamplight shone was what appeared to be a blood stain spreading almost entirely over one wall of the cell which i perceived before me i have learnt since that this was a species of fungus not altogether uncommon but at the time and in the situation it shocked me inexpressibly but let me hasten to that which we were come to see let me finish my story as quickly as may be my father halted at the entrance to this frightful cell his hand with which he held the lamp above his head was not steady and over his shoulder i looked into the place and saw him dr cairn for three years night and day that spectacle haunted me for three years night and day i seemed to have before my eyes the dreadful face the bearded grinning face of paul dune he lay there upon the floor of the dungeon his fists clenched and his knees drawn up as if in agony he had lain there for generations 
yet as god is my witness there was flesh on his bones yellow and seared it was and his joints protruded through it but his features were yet recognizable horribly dreadfully recognizable his black hair was like a mane long and matted his eyebrows were incredibly heavy and his lashes overhung his cheekbones the nails of his fingers no i will spare you but his teeth his ivory gleaming teeth with the two wolf fangs fully revealed by that death grin an aspen stake was driven through his breast pinning him to the earthen floor and there he lay in the agonized attitude of one who has died by such awful means yet that stake was not driven through his unhallowed body until a whole year after his death how i regained the library i do not remember i was unable to rejoin the guests unable to face my fellow-men for days afterwards dr cairn for three years i feared feared the world feared sleep feared myself above all for i knew that i had in my veins the blood of a vampire end of chapter eight read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter nine of brood of the witch queen by sax romer the polish jewess there was a silence of some minutes duration lord lashmore sat staring straight before him his fists clenched upon his knees then it was after death that the third baron developed certain qualities inquired dr cairn there were six cases of death in the district within twelve months replied lashmore the gruesome cry of vampire ran through the community the fourth baron son of paul doon turned a deaf ear to these reports until the mother of a child a child who had died traced a man or the semblance of a man to the gate of the doon family vault by night secretly the son of paul doon visited the vault and found the body which despite twelve months in the tomb looked as it had looked in life was carried to the dungeon in the middle ages a torture room no cry uttered there can reach the outer world and was submitted to the ancient process for slaying a vampire from that hour no supernatural visitant has troubled the district but but said dr cairn quietly the strain came from mirza the sorceress what of her lord lashmore's eyes shone feverishly how do you know that she was a sorceress he asked hoarsely these are family secrets they will remain so dr cairn answered but my studies have gone far and i know that mirza wife of the third baron lashmore practised the black art in life and became after death a ghoul her husband surprised her in certain detestable magical operations and struck her head off he had suspected her for some considerable time and had not only kept secret the birth of her son but had secluded the child from the mother no heir resulting from his second marriage however the son of mirza became baron lashmore and after death became what his mother had been before him lord lashmore the curse of the house of doon will prevail until the polish jewess who originated it has been treated as her son was treated dr cairn it is not known where her husband had her body concealed he died without revealing the secret do you mean that the taint the devil's taint may recur oh my god do you want to drive me mad i do not mean that after so many generations which have been free from it the vampirism will arise again in your blood but i mean that the spirit the unclean awful spirit of that vampire woman is still earthbound the son was freed and with him went the hereditary taint it seems but the mother was not freed her body was decapitated but her vampire soul cannot go upon its appointed course until the ancient ceremonial has been performed lord lashmore passed his hand across his eyes you daze me dr cairn in brief what do you mean i mean that the spirit of mirza is to this day loose upon the world and is forced by a deathless unnatural longing to seek incarnation in a human body it is such awful pariahs as this lord lashmore that constitute the danger of so-called spiritualism given suitable conditions such a spirit might gain control of a human being 
do you suggest that the spirit of the second lady it is distinctly possible that she haunts her descendants i seem to remember a tradition of dune castle to the effect that births and deaths are heralded by a woman's mocking laughter i myself heard it on the night i became lord lashmore that is the spirit who was known in life as mirza lady lashmore but it is possible to gain control of such a being by what means by unhallowed means yet there are those who do not hesitate to employ them the danger of such an operation is of course enormous i perceive dr cairn that a theory covering the facts of my recent experiences is forming in your mind that is so in order that i may obtain corroborative evidence i should like to call at your place this evening suppose i come ostensibly to see lady lashmore lord lashmore was watching the speaker there is someone in my household whose suspicions you do not wish to arouse he suggested there is shall we make it nine o'clock why not come to dinner thanks all the same but i think it would serve my purpose better if i came later dr cairn and his son dined alone together in half moon street that night i saw anthony ferrara in regent street to-day said robert cairn i was glad to see him dr cairn raised his heavy eyebrows why he asked well i was half afraid that he might have left london paid a visit to myra duquesne in inverness it would not have surprised me nor would it have surprised me rob but i think he is stocking other game at present robert cairn looked up quickly lady lashmore he began well prompted his father one of the paul pry brigade who fatten on scandal sent a veiled paragraph in to us at the planet yesterday linking ferrara's name with lady lashmore's of course we didn't use it he had come to the wrong market but ferrara was with lady lashmore when i met him to-day what of that it is not necessarily significant of course lady lashmore in all probability will outlive ferrara who looked even more pallid than usual you regard him as an utterly unscrupulous fortune hunter certainly did lady lashmore appear to be in good health perfectly ah a silence fell of some considerable duration then antony ferrara is a menace to society said robert cairn when i meet the reptilian glance of those black eyes of his and reflect upon what the man has attempted what he has done my blood boils it is tragically funny to think that in our new wisdom we have abolished the only laws that could have touched him he could not have existed in ancient chaldea and would probably have been burnt at the stake even under charles second but in this wise twentieth century he dallies in regent street with a prominent society beauty and laughs in the face of a man whom he has attempted to destroy be very wary warned dr cairn remember that if you died mysteriously to-morrow ferrara would be legally immune we must wait and watch you can return here to-night at about ten o'clock i think i can manage to do so yes i shall expect you have you brought up to date your record of those events which we know of together with my notes and explanations yes sir i spent last evening upon the notes there may be something to add this record bob one day will be a weapon to destroy an unnatural enemy i will sign two copies to-night and lodge one at my bank End of chapter 9 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 10 of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer The Laughter Lady Lashmore proved to be far more beautiful than Dr. Cairn had anticipated. She was a true brunette with a superb figure and eyes like the darkest passion flowers her creamy skin had a golden quality as though it had absorbed within its velvet texture something of the sunshine of the south she greeted dr cairn without cordiality i am delighted to find you looking so well lady lashmore said the doctor your appearance quite confirms my opinion 
your opinion of what dr cairn of the nature of your recent seizure sir elwyn groves invited my opinion and i gave it lady lashmore paled perceptibly lord lashmore i know she said was greatly concerned but indeed it was nothing serious i quite agree it was due to nervous excitement lady lashmore held a fan before her face there have been recent happenings she said as no doubt you are aware which must have shaken any one's nerves of course i am familiar with your reputation dr cairn as a physical specialist pardon me but from whom have you learnt of it from mr ferrara she answered simply he has assured me that you are the greatest living authority upon such matters dr cairn turned his head aside ah he said grimly and i want to ask you a question continued lady lashmore have you any idea any idea at all respecting the cause of the wounds upon my husband's throat do you think them due to something supernatural her voice shook and her slight foreign accent became more marked nothing is supernatural replied dr cairn but i think they are due to something supernormal i would suggest that possibly you have suffered from evil dreams recently lady lashmore started wildly and her eyes opened with a sort of sudden horror how can you know she whispered how can you know oh dr cairn she laid her hand upon his arm if you can prevent those dreams if you can assure me that i shall never dream them again it was a plea and a confession this was what had lain behind her coldness this horror which she had not dared to confide in another tell me he said gently you have dreamt these dreams twice she nodded wide-eyed with wonder for his knowledge on the occasions of your husband's illnesses yes yes what did you dream oh can i dare i tell you you must there was pity in his voice i dreamt that i lay in some very dark cavern i could hear the sea booming apparently over my head but above all the noise a voice was audible calling to me not by name i cannot explain in what way but calling calling imperatively i seemed to be clothed but scantily in some kind of ragged garments and upon my knees i crawled toward the voice through a place where there were other living things that crawled also things with many legs and clammy bodies she shuddered and choked down an hysterical sob that was half a laugh my hair hung dishevelled about me and in some inexplicable way oh am i going mad my head seemed to be detached from my living body i was filled with a kind of unholy anger which i cannot describe also i was consumed with thirst and this thirst i think i understand said dr cairn quietly what followed an interval quite blank after which i dreamt again dr cairn i cannot tell you of the dreadful the blasphemous and foul thoughts that then possessed me i found myself resisting resisting something some power that was dragging me back to the foul cavern with my thirst unslaked i was frenzied i dare not name i trembled to think of the ideas which filled my mind and then again came a blank and i awoke she sat trembling dr cairn noted that she avoided his gaze you awoke he said on the first occasion to find that your husband had met with a strange and dangerous accident there was something else dr lashmore's voice had become a tremulous whisper tell me don't be afraid she looked up her magnificent eyes were wild with horror i believe you know she breathed do you dr cairn nodded and on the second occasion he said you awoke earlier lady lashmore slightly moved her head the dream was identical yes excepting these two occasions you never dreamt it before i dreamt part of it on several other occasions or only remembered part of it on waking which part 
the first that awful cavern and now lady lashmore you have recently been present at a spiritualistic seance she was past wondering at his power of inductive reasoning and merely nodded i suggest i do not know that the seance was held under the auspices of mr antony ferrara ostensibly for amusement another affirmative nod answered him you prove to be mediumistic it was admitted and now lady lashmore dr cairn's face was very stern i will trouble you no further he prepared to depart when dr cairn whispered lady lashmore tremulously some dreadful thing something that i cannot comprehend but that i fear and loathe with all my soul has come to me oh for pity's sake give me a word of hope save for you i am alone with a horror i cannot name tell me at the door he turned be brave he said and went out lady lashmore sat still as one who had looked upon gorgon her beautiful eyes yet widely opened and her face pale as death for he had not even told her to hope robert cairn was sitting smoking in the library a bunch of notes before him when dr cairn returned to half moon street his face habitually fresh coloured was so pale that his son leapt up in alarm but dr cairn waved him away with a characteristic gesture of the hand sit down rob he said quietly i shall be all right in a moment but i have just left a woman a young woman and a beautiful woman whom a fiend of hell has condemned to that which my mind refuses to contemplate robert cairn sat down again watching his father make out a report of the following facts continued the latter beginning to pace up and down the room he recounted all that he had learnt of the history of the house of doom and all that he had learnt of recent happenings from lord and lady lashmore his son wrote rapidly and now said the doctor for our conclusions mirza the polish jewess who became lady lashmore in sixteen fifteen practised sorcery in life and became after death a ghoul one who sustained an unholy existence by unholy means a vampire but sir surely that is but a horrible superstition of the middle ages rob i could take you to a castle not ten miles from krakow in poland where there are certain relics which would for ever settle your doubts respecting the existence of vampires let us proceed the son of mirza paul dune inherited the dreadful proclivities of his mother but his shadowy existence was cut short in the traditional and effective manner him we may neglect it is mirza the sorceress who must engage our attention she was decapitated by her husband this punishment prevented her in the unhallowed life which for such as she begins after ordinary decease from practising the horrible rites of a vampire her headless body could not serve her as a vehicle for nocturnal wanderings but the evil spirit of the woman might hope to gain control of some body more suitable nurturing an implacable hatred against all of the house of dune that spirit disembodied would frequently be drawn to the neighbourhood of mirza's descendants both by hatred and by affinity two horrible desires of the spirit mirza would be gratified if a dune could be made her victim the desire for blood and the desire for vengeance the fate of lord lashmore would be sealed if that spirit could secure incarnation dr cairn paused glancing at his son who was writing at furious speed then a magician more mighty and more evil than mirza ever was or could be he continued a master of the black art expelled a woman's spirit from its throne and temporarily installed in its place the blood-lustful spirit of mirza my god sir cried robert cairn and threw down his pencil i begin to understand lady lashmore said dr cairn since she was weak enough to consent to be present at a certain seance has from time to time been possessed she has been possessed by the spirit of a vampire obedient to the nameless cravings of that control she has sought out lord lashmore the last of the house of dune 
the horrible attack made a mighty will which throughout her temporary incarnation has held her like a hound in leash has dragged her from her prey has forced her to remove from the garments clothing her borrowed body all traces of the deed and has cast her out again to the pit of abomination where her headless trunk was thrown by the third baron lashmore lady lashmore's brain retains certain memories they have been received at the moment when possession has taken place and at the moment when the control has been cast out again they thus are memories of some secret cavern near doon castle where the headless but deathless body lies and memories of the poignant moment when the vampire has been dragged back her thirst unslaked by the ruling will merciful god muttered robert cairn merciful god can such things be they can be they are two ways have occurred to me of dealing with the matter continued dr cairn quietly one is to find that cavern and to kill in the occult sense by means of a stake the vampire who lies there the other which i confess might only result in the permanent possession of lady lashmore is to get at the power which controls this disembodied spirit kill antony ferrara robert cairn went to the sideboard and poured out a brandy with a shaking hand what's his object he whispered dr cairn shrugged his shoulders lady lashmore would be the wealthiest widow in society he replied he will know now continued the younger man unsteadily that you are up against him have you i have told lord lashmore to lock at night not only his outer door but also that of his dressing-room for the rest he dropped into an easy chair i cannot face the facts i the telephone bell rang dr cairn came to his feet as though he had been electrified and as he raised the receiver to his ear his son knew by the expression on his face from where the message came and something of its purport come with me was all that he said when he had replaced the instrument on the table they went out together it was already past midnight but a cab was found at the corner of half moon street and within the space of five minutes they were at lord lashmore's house excepting chambers lord lashmore's valet no servants were to be seen they ran away sir out of the house explained the man huskily when it happened dr cairn delayed for no further questions but raced upstairs his son close behind him together they burst into lord lashmore's bedroom but just within the door they both stopped aghast sitting bolt upright in bed was lord lashmore his face a dingy grey and his open eyes though filming over yet faintly alight with a stark horror dead an electric torch was still gripped in his left hand bending over someone who lay upon the carpet near the bedside they perceived sir elwyn groves he looked up some little of his usual self-possession had fled ah cairn he jerked we both come too late the prostrate figure was that of lady lashmore a loose kimono worn over her nightrobe she was white and still and the physician had been engaged in bathing a huge bruise upon her temple she'll be all right said sir elwyn she has sustained a tremulous blow as you see but lord lashmore dr cairn stepped closer to the dead man hart he said he died of sheer horror he turned to chambers who stood in the open doorway behind him the dressing-room door is open he said i had advised lord lashmore to lock it yes sir his lordship meant to sir but we found that the lock had been broken it was to have been replaced to-morrow dr cairn turned to his son you hear he said no doubt you have some idea respecting which of the visitors to this unhappy house took the trouble to break that lock it was to have been replaced to-morrow hence the tragedy of to-night he addressed chambers again why did the servants leave the house to-night the man was shaking pitifully it was the laughter sir the laughter i can never forget it i was sleeping in an adjacent room and i had the key of his lordship's door in case of need but when i heard his lordship cry out quick and loud sir like a man who's been stabbed i jumped up to come to him 
then as i was turning the doorknob of my room sir someone something began to laugh it was here it was in here gentlemen it wasn't her ladyship it wasn't like any woman i can't describe it but it woke up every soul in the house when you came in i daren't come in sir i ran downstairs and called up sir elwyn groves before he came all the rest of the household huddled on their clothes and went away it was i who found him interrupted sir elwyn as you see him now with lady lashmore where she lies i have phoned for nurses ah said dr cairn i shall come back groves but i have a small matter to attend to he drew his son from the room on the stair you understand he asked the spirit of mirza came to him again clothed in his wife's body lord lashmore felt the teeth at his throat awoke instantly and struck out as he did so he turned the torch upon her and recognized his wife his heart completed the tragedy and so to the laughter of the sorceress passed the last of the house of doom the cab was waiting dr cairn gave an address in piccadilly and the two entered as the cab moved off the doctor took a revolver from his pocket with some loose cartridges charged the five chambers and quietly replaced the weapon in his pocket again one of the big doors of the block of chambers was found to be ajar and a porter proved to be yet in attendance mr ferrara began dr cairn you are five minutes too late sir said the man he left by motor at ten past twelve he's gone abroad sir End of chapter ten read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter eleven of brood of the witch queen by sax romer cairo the exact manner in which mental stress will affect a man's physical health is often difficult to predict robert cairn was in the pink of condition at the time that he left oxford to take up his london appointment but the tremendous nervous strain wrought upon him by this series of events wholly outside the radius of normal things had broken him up physically where it might have left unscathed the more highly strung though less physically vigorous man those who have passed through a nerve storm such as this which had laid him low will know that convalescence seems like a welcome awakening from a dreadful dream it was indeed in a state between awakening and dreaming that robert cairn took counsel with his father the latter more pale than was his wont and somewhat anxious-eyed and determined upon an egyptian rest cure i have made it all right at the office rob said dr cairn in three weeks or so you will receive instructions at cairo to write up a series of local articles until then my boy complete rest and don't worry and above all don't worry you and i have passed through a saturnalia of horror and you less inured to horrors than i have gone down i don't wonder where is anthony ferrara dr cairn shook his head and his eyes gleamed with a sudden anger for god's sake don't mention his name he said that topic is taboo rob i may tell you however that he has left england in this unreal frame of mind then and as one but partly belonging to the world of things actual cairn found himself an invalid who but yesterday had been a hale man found himself shipped for port said found himself entrained for cairo and with an awakening to the realities of life and emerging from an ill dream to lively interest in the novelties of egypt found himself following the red jerseyed shepherd's porter along the corridor of the train and out on to the platform a short drive through those singular streets where east meets west and mingles in the sudden violet dusk of lower egypt and he was amid the bustle of the popular hotel syme was there whom he had last seen at oxford syme the phlegmatic he apologized for not meeting the train but explained that his duties had rendered it impossible syme was attached temporarily to an archaeological expedition as medical man and his athletic and somewhat bovine appearance contrasted oddly with the unhealthy gauntness of cairn 
i only got in from wasta ten minutes ago cairn you must come out to the camp when i return the desert air will put you on your feet again in no time sime was unemotional but there was concern in his voice and in his glance for the change in cairn was very startling although he knew something if but very little of certain happenings in london gruesome happenings centering around the man called anthony ferrara he avoided any reference to them at the moment seated upon the terrace robert cairn studied the busy life in the street below with all the interest of a new arrival in the capital of the near east more than ever now his illness and the things which led up to it seemed to belong to a remote dream existence through the railings at his feet a hawker was thrusting fly whisks and imploring him in complicated english to purchase one vendors of beads of fictitious antiques of sweetmeats of what not fortune-tellers and all that chattering horde which some obscure process of gravitation seems to hurl against the terrace of shepherds buzzed about him carriages and motor-cars camels and donkeys mingled in the sharia kamel pasha voices american voices anglo-saxon guttural german tones and softly murmured arabic merged into one indescribable chord of sound but to robert cairn it was all unspeakably restful he was quite contented to sit there sipping his whisky and soda and smoking his pipe sheer idleness was good for him and exactly what he wanted and idling amid that unique throng is idleness deluxe sime watched him covertly and saw that his face had acquired lines lines which told of the fires through which he had passed something it was evident something horrible had seared his mind considering the many indications of tremendous nervous disaster in cairn sime wondered how near his companion had come to insanity and concluded that he had stood upon the frontiers of that grim land of phantoms and had only been plucked back in the eleventh hour cairn glanced around with a smile from the group of hawkers who solicited his attention upon the pavement below this is a delightful scene he said i could sit here for hours but considering that it's some time after sunset it remains unusually hot doesn't it rather replied sime they are expecting calm scene the hot wind you know i was up the river a week ago and we struck it badly in a soon it grew as black as night and one couldn't breathe for sand it's probably working down to cairo from your description i am not anxious to make the acquaintance of Kamsin. sime shook his head knocking out his pipe into the ash-tray this is funny country he said reflectively the most weird ideas prevail here to this day ideas which properly belong to the middle ages for instance he began to recharge the hot bowl it is not really time for Kamsin. consequently the natives feel called upon to hunt up some explanation of its unexpected appearance their ideas on the subject are interesting if idiotic one of our arabs we are excavating in the fayum you know solemnly assured me yesterday that the hot wind had been caused by an afrit a sort of arabian night's demon who has arrived in egypt he laughed gruffly but cairn was staring at him with a curious expression sime continued when i got to cairo this evening i found news of the afrit had preceded me honestly cairn it is all over the town the native town i mean all the shopkeepers in the muski are talking about it if a puff of kamsin should come i believe they would permanently shut up shop and hide in their cellars if they have any i am rather hazy on modern egyptian architecture cairn nodded his head absently you laugh he said but the active force of a superstition what we call a superstition is sometimes a terrible thing sime stared eh the medical man had suddenly come uppermost he recollected that this class of discussion was probably taboo you may doubt the existence of a freak continued cairn but neither you nor i can doubt the creative power of thought 
if a trained hypnotist by sheer concentration can persuade his subject that the latter sits upon the brink of a river fishing when actually he sits upon a platform in a lecture room what result should you expect from a concentration of thousands of native minds upon the idea that an afreet is visiting egypt sime stared in a dull way peculiar to him rather a poser he said i have a glimmer of a notion what you mean don't you think if you mean don't i think the result would be the creation of an afreet no i don't i hardly mean that either replied cairn but this wave of superstition cannot be entirely unproductive all that thought energy directed to one point sime stood up we shall get out of our depth he replied conclusively he considered the ground of discussion an unhealthy one this was the territory adjoining that of insanity a fortune teller from india proffered his services incessantly am she am she growled sime hold on said cairn smiling this chap is not an egyptian let us ask him if he has heard the rumour respecting the afreet sime reseated himself rather unwillingly the fortune-teller spread his little carpet and knelt down in order to read the palm of his hypothetical client but cairn waved him aside i don't want my fortune told he said but i will give you your fee with a smile at sime for a few minutes conversation yes sir yes sir the indian was all attention why cam pointed forensically at the fortune-teller why is Kamsin come so early this year the indian spread his hands palms upwards how should i know he replied in his soft melodious voice i am not of egypt i can only say what is told to me by the egyptians and what is told to you sime rested his hands upon his knees bending forward curiously he was palpably anxious that cairn should have confirmation of the afreet story from the indian they tell me sir the man's voice sank musically low that a thing very evil he tapped a long brown finger upon his breast not as i am he tapped sime upon the knee nor as he your friend he thrust the long finger at cairn not as you sir not a man at all though something like a man not having any father and mother you mean suggested sime a spirit the fortune-teller shook his head they tell me sir not a spirit a man but not as other men a very very bad man one that the great king long long ago the king you call wise solomon suggested cairn yes yes suleiman one that he when he banished all the tribe of demons from earth one that he not found one he overlooked jerked sime yes yes overlook a very evil man my gentlemen they tell me he has come to egypt he come not from the sea but across the great desert the libyan desert suggested sime the man shook his head seeking for words the arabian desert no no away beyond far up in africa he waved his long arms dramatically far far up beyond the sudan the sahara desert proposed sime yes yes it is sahara desert come across the sahara desert and is come to khartoum how did he get there asked cairn the indian shrugged his shoulders i cannot say but next he come to wadi halfa then he is in Asun and from a soon he come down to luxor yesterday an egyptian friend told me kamsin is the fayum therefore he is there the man of evil for he bring the hot wind with him the indian was growing impressive and two american tourists stopped to listen to his words to-night to-morrow he spoke now almost in a whisper glancing about him as if apprehensive of being overheard he may be here in cairo bringing with him the scorching breath of the desert the scorpion wind 
he stood up casting off the mystery with which he had invested his story and smiling insinuatingly his work was done his fee was due sime rewarded him with five piastres and he departed bowing you know sime cairn began to speak staring absently the while after the fortune teller as he descended the carpeted steps and rejoined the throng on the sidewalk below you know if a man any one could take advantage of such a wave of thought as this which is now sweeping through europe if he could cause it to concentrate upon him as it were don't you think that it would enable him to transcend the normal to do phenomenal things by what process should you propose to make yourself such a focus i was speaking impersonally sime it might be possible it might be possible to dress for dinner snapped sime if we shut up talking nonsense there's a carnival here to-night great fun suppose we concentrate our brain waves on another scotch and soda end of chapter eleven read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter twelve of brood of the witch queen by sax romer the mask of set above the palm trees swept the jewelled vault of egypt's sky and set amid the clustering leaves gleamed little red electric lamps fairy lanterns outlined the winding paths and paper japanese lamps hung dancing in long rows whilst in the centre of the enchanted garden a fountain spurned diamond spray high in the air to fall back coolly plashing into the marble home of the golden cart the rustling of innumerable feet upon the sandy pathway and the ceaseless murmur of voices with pealing laughter rising above all could be heard amid the strains of the military band ensconced in a flower-covered arbor into the brightly lighted places and back into the luminous shadows came and went fantastic forms sheiks were there with flowing robes dragomans who spoke no arabic sultans and priests of ancient egypt going arm in arm dancing girls of old thebes and harem ladies in silken trousers and high-heeled red shoes queens of babylon and cleopatras many geishas and desert gypsies mingled specks in a giant kaleidoscope the thick carpet of confetti rustled to the tread girls ran screaming before those who pursued them armed with handfuls of the tiny paper discs pipers of a highland regiment marched piping through the throng their scottish kilts seeming wildly incongruous amid such a scene within the hotel where the mosque lanterns glowed one might catch a glimpse of the heads of dancers gliding shadow-like a tremendous crowd said sime considering it is nearly the end of the season three silken ladies wearing gauzy white yashmaks confronted cairn and the speaker a gleaming of jewelled fingers there was and cairn found himself half choked with confetti which filled his eyes his nose his ears and of which quite a liberal amount found access to his mouth the three ladies of the yashmak ran screaming from their vengeance seeking victims sime pursuing two and cairn hard upon the heels of the third amid this scene of riotous carnival all else was forgotten and only the madness the infectious madness of the night claimed his mind in and out of the strangely attired groups darted his agile quarry all but captured a score of times but always eluding him sime he had hopelessly lost as around fountain and flower-bed arbor and palm trunk he leapt in pursuit of the elusive yashmak then in a shadowed corner of the garden he trapped her plunging his hand into the bag of confetti which he carried he leapt exulting in his revenge when a sudden gust of wind passed sibilantly through the palm tops and glancing upward cairn saw that the blue sky was overcast and the stars gleaming dimly as through a veil that moment of hesitancy proved fatal to his project for with a little excited scream the girl dived under his outstretched arm and fled back towards the fountain he turned to pursue again when a second puff of wind stronger than the first set waving the palm fronds and showered dry leaves upon the confetti carpet of the garden the band played loudly the murmur of conversation rose to something like a roar 
but above it whistled the increasing breeze and there was a sort of grittiness in the air then proclaimed by a furious lashing of the fronds above burst the wind in all its fury it seemed to beat down into the garden in waves of heat huge leaves began to fall from the tree-tops and the mast-like trunks bent before the fury from the desert the atmosphere grew hazy with impalpable dust and the stars were wholly obscured commenced a stampede from the garden shrill with fear rose a woman's scream from the heart of the throng a scorpion a scorpion panic threatened but fortunately the doors were wide so that without disaster the whole fantastic company passed into the hotel and even the military band retired cairn perceived that he alone remained in the garden and glancing along the path in the direction of the fountain he saw a blotchy drab creature fully four inches in length running zigzag towards him it was a huge scorpion but even as he leapt forward to crush it it turned and crept in amid the tangle of flowers beside the path where it was lost from view the scorching wind grew momentarily fiercer and cairn entering behind a few straggling revellers found something ominous and dreadful in its sudden fury at the threshold he turned and looked back upon the gaily lighted garden the paper lamps were thrashing in the wind many extinguished others were in flames a number of electric globes fell from their fastenings amid the palm-tops and burst bomb-like upon the ground the pleasure garden was now a battlefield beset with dangers and he fully appreciated the anxiety of the company to get within doors where chrysanthemum and yashmak turban and tarbush uraeus and indian plume had mingled gaily no soul remained but he was in error some one did remain as if embodying the fear that in a few short minutes had emptied the garden out beneath the waving lanterns the flying debris the whirling dust pacing sombrely from shadow to light and to shadow again advancing towards the hotel steps came the figure of one sandaled and wearing the short white tunic of ancient egypt his arms were bare and he carried a long staff but rising hideously upon his shoulders was a crocodile mask which seemed to grin the mask of set set the destroyer god of the underworld cairn alone of all the crowd saw the strange figure for the reason that cairn alone faced towards the garden the gruesome mask seemed to fascinate him he could not take his gaze from that weird advancing god he felt impelled hypnotically to stare at the gleaming eyes set in the saurian head the mask was at the foot of the steps and still cairn stood rigid when as the sandaled foot was set upon the first step a breeze dust-laden and hot as from a furnace door blew fully into the hotel blinding him a chorus arose from the crowd at his back and many voices cried out for doors to be shut someone tapped him on the shoulder and spun him about by god it was syme who now had him by the arm comsin has come with a vengeance they tell me that they have never had anything like it the native servants were closing and fastening the doors the night was now as black as erebus and the wind was howling about the building with the voices of a million lost souls cairn glanced back across his shoulder men were drawing heavy curtains across the doors and windows they have shut him out syme he said syme stared in his dull fashion you surely saw him persisted cairn irritably the man in the mask of set he was coming in just behind me syme strode forward pulled the curtains aside and peered out into the deserted garden not a soul old man he declared you must have seen the afreet end of chapter twelve read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california Chapter Thirteen of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer, The Scorpion Wind. This sudden and appalling change of weather had sadly affected the mood of the gathering. That part of the carnival planned to take place in the garden was perforce abandoned, together with the firework display. A half-hearted attempt was made at dancing but the howling of the wind and the omnipresent dust perpetually reminded the pleasure-seekers 
that Kamsin raged without, raged with a violence unparalleled in the experience of the oldest residents. This was a full-fledged sandstorm. A terror of the Sahara descended upon Cairo. But there were few departures, although many of the visitors who had long distances to go, especially those from Mina House, discussed the advisability of leaving before this unique storm should have grown even worse. The general tendency, though, was markedly gregarious. Safety seemed to be with the crowd, amid the gaiety, where music and laughter were, rather than in the sand-swept streets. "'Guess we've outstayed our welcome,' confided an American lady to Syme. "'Egypt wants to drive us all home now.' "'Possibly,' he replied with a smile. "'The season has run very late, this year, and so this sort of thing is more or less to be expected.' The orchestra struck up a lively one-step, and a few of the more enthusiastic dancers accepted the invitation, but the bulk of the company thronged around the edge of the floor, acting as spectators. Cairn and Syme wedged away through the heterogeneous crowd to the American bar. "'I prescribe a tango,' said Syme. "'A tango is?' a tango explained syme is a new kind of cocktail sacred to this buffet try it it will either kill you or cure you cairn smiled rather wanly i must confess that i need bucking up a bit he said that confounded sand seems to have got me by the throat syme briskly gave his orders to the bar attendant you know pursued cairn i cannot get out of my head the idea that there was someone wearing a crocodile mask in the garden a while ago look here growled syme studying the operations of the cocktail manufacturer suppose there were what about it well it's odd that nobody else saw him i suppose it hasn't occurred to you that the fellow might have removed his mask cairn shook his head slowly i don't think so he declared i haven't seen him anywhere in the hotel seen him syme turned his dull gaze upon the speaker how should you know him cairn raised his hand to his forehead in an oddly helpless way no of course not it's very extraordinary they took their seats at a small table and in mutual silence loaded and lighted their pipes syme in common with many young and enthusiastic medical men had theories theories of that revolutionary sort which only harsh experience can shatter secretly he was disposed to ascribe all the ills to which flesh is heir primarily to a disordered nervous system it was evident that cairn's mind persistently ran along a particular groove something lay back of all this erratic talk he had clearly invested the mask of set with a curious individuality i gather that you had a stiff bout of it in london syme said suddenly cairn nodded beastly stiff there is a lot of sound reason in your nervous theory syme it was touch and go with me for days i am told yet pathologically i was a hale man that would seem to show how nerves can kill just a series of shocks horrors one piled upon another did as much for me as influenza pneumonia and two or three other ailments together could have done syme shook his head wisely this was in accordance with his ideas you know antony ferrara continued cairn well he has done this for me his damnable practices are worse than any disease syme the man is a pestilence although the law cannot touch him although no jury can convict him he is a murderer he controls forces syme was watching him intently i will give you some idea syme of the pitch to which things had come when i tell you that my father drove to ferrara's rooms one night with a loaded revolver in his pocket for syme hesitated for protection no cairn leaned forward across the table to shoot him syme shoot him on sight as one shoots a mad dog are you serious as god is my witness if antony ferrara had been in his rooms that night my father would have killed him it would have been a shocking scandal it would have been a martyrdom the man who removes antony ferrara from the earth will be doing mankind a service worthy of the highest reward he is unfit to live sometimes i cannot believe that he does live 
i expect to wake up and find that he was a figure of a particularly evil dream this incident the call at his rooms occurred just before your illness the thing which he had attempted that night was the last straw sime it broke me down from the time that he left oxford antony ferrara has pursued a deliberate course of crime of crime so cunning so unusual and based upon such amazing and unholy knowledge that no breath of suspicion has touched him sime you remember a girl i told you about at oxford one evening a girl who came to visit him sime nodded slowly well he killed her oh there's no doubt about it i saw her body in the hospital how had he killed her then how only he and the god who permits him to exist can answer that sime he killed her without coming anywhere near her and he killed his adoptive father sir michael ferrara by the same unholy means sime watched him but offered no comment it was hushed up of course there is no existing law which could be used against him existing law they are ruled out sime the laws that could have reached him but he would have been burnt at the stake in the middle ages i see sime drummed his fingers upon the table you had those ideas about him at oxford and does dr cairns seriously believe the same he does so would you you could not doubt it sime not for a moment if you had seen what we have seen his eyes blazed into sudden fury suggestive of his old robust self he tried night after night by means of the same accursed sorcery which every one thought buried in the ruins of thebes to kill me he projected things suggested these things to your mind something like that i saw or thought i saw and smelt pa i seem to smell them now beetles mummy beetles you know from the skull of a mummy my rooms were thick with them it brought me very near to bedlam sime oh it was not merely imaginary my father and i caught him red-handed he glanced across at the other you read of the death of lord lashmore it was just after you came out yes heart it was his heart yes but ferrara was responsible that was the business which led my father to drive to ferrara's rooms with a loaded revolver in his pocket the wind was shaking the windows and whistling about the building with demoniacal fury as if seeking admission the band played a popular waltz and in and out of the open doors came and went groups of representatives of many ages and many nationalities ferrara began sime slowly was always a detestable man with his sleek black hair and ivory face those long eyes of his had an expression which always tempted me to hit him sir michael if what you say is true and after all cairn it only goes to show how little we know of the nervous system literally took a viper to his bosom he did anthony ferrara was his adopted son of course god knows to what evil brood he really belongs both were silent for a while then gracious heavens cairn started to his feet so wildly as almost to upset the table look sime look he cried sime was not the only man in the bar to hear and to heed his words sime looking in the direction indicated by cairn's extended finger received a vague impression that a grotesque long-headed figure had appeared momentarily in the doorway opening upon the room where the dancers were then it was gone again if it had ever been there and he was supporting cairn who swayed dizzily and had become ghastly pale sime imagined that the heated air had grown suddenly even more heated curious eyes were turned upon his companion who now sank back into his chair muttering the mask the mask i think i saw the chap who seems to worry you so much said sime soothingly wait here i will tell the waiter to bring you a dose of brandy and whatever you do don't get excited he made for the door pausing and giving an order to a waiter on his way and pushing into the crowd outside it was long past midnight and the gaiety which had been resumed seemed of a forced and feverish sort some of the visitors were leaving and a breath of hot wind swept in from the open doors a pretty girl wearing a yashmak who with two similarly attired companions was making her way to the entrance attracted his attention he seemed to be on the point of swooning he recognized the trio for the same that had pelted cairn and himself with confetti earlier in the evening 
a sudden heat has affected your friend he said stepping up to them my name is dr syme may i offer you my assistance the offer was accepted and with the three he passed out on to the terrace where the dust grated beneath the tread and helped the fainting girl into an arabia the night was thunderously black the heat almost insufferable and the tall palms in front of the hotel bowed before the might of the scorching wind as the vehicle drove off syme stood for a moment looking after it his face was very grave for there was a look in the bright eyes of the girl in the yashmak which professionally he did not like turning up the steps he learnt from the manager that several visitors had succumbed to the heat there was something furtive in the manner of his informant's glance and syme looked at him significantly kamsin brings clouds of septic dust with it he said let us hope that these attacks are due to nothing more than the unexpected rise in temperature an air of uneasiness prevailed now throughout the hotel the wind had considerably abated and crowds were leaving pouring from the steps into the deserted street a dreamlike company colonel roiland took syme aside as the latter was making his way back to the buffet the colonel whose regiment was stationed at the citadel had known syme almost from childhood you know my boy he said i should never have allowed eileen his daughter to remain in cairo if i had foreseen this change in the weather this infernal wind coming right through the native town is loaded with infection has it affected her then asked syme anxiously she nearly fainted in the ballroom replied the colonel her mother took her home half an hour ago i looked for you everywhere but couldn't find you quite a number have succumbed said syme eileen seemed to be highly hysterical continued the colonel she persisted that someone wearing a crocodile mask had been standing beside her at the moment that she was taken ill syme started perhaps cairn's story was not a matter of imagination after all there is someone here dressed like that i believe he replied with affected carelessness he seems to have frightened several people any idea who he is my dear chap cried the colonel i have been searching the place for him but i have never once set eyes upon him i was about to ask if you knew anything about it syme returned to the table where cairn was sitting the latter seemed to have recovered somewhat but he looked far from well syme stared at him critically i should turn in he said if i were you come seen as playing the deuce with people i only hope it does not justify its name and blow for fifty days have you seen the man in the mask asked cairn no replied syme but he's here all right others have seen him cairn stood up rather unsteadily and with syme made his way through the moving crowd to the stairs the band was still playing but the cloud of gloom which had settled upon the place refused to be dissipated good night cairn said syme see you in the morning robert cairn with aching head and a growing sensation of nausea paused on the landing looking down into the court below he could not disguise from himself that he felt ill not nervously ill as in london but physically sick this superheated air was difficult to breathe it seemed to rise in waves from below then from a weary glancing at the figures beneath him his attitude changed to one of tense watching a man wearing the crocodile mask of set stood by a huge urn containing a palm looking up to the landing cairn's weakness left him and in its place came an indescribable anger a longing to drive his fist into that grinning mask he turned and ran lightly down the stairs conscious of a sudden glow of energy reaching the floor he saw the mask making across the hall in the direction of the outer door as rapidly as possible for he could not run without attracting undesirable attention cairn followed the figure of set passed out on to the terrace but when cairn in turn swung open the door his quarry had vanished then in an arabia just driving off he detected the hideous mask hatless as he was he ran down the steps and threw himself into another the carriage controller was in attendance and cairn repeatedly told him to instruct the driver to follow the arabia which had just left the man lashed up his horses turned the carriage and went galloping on after the retreating figure past the espakia gardens they went through several narrow streets and on to the quarter of the muski 
time after time he thought he had lost the carriage ahead but his own driver's knowledge of the tortuous streets enabled him always to overtake it again they went rocking along lanes so narrow that with outstretched arms one could almost have touched the walls on either side past empty shops and unlighted houses cairn had not the remotest idea of his whereabouts save that he was evidently in the district of the bazaars a right-angled corner was abruptly negotiated and there ahead of him stood the pursued vehicle the driver was turning his horses around to return his fare was disappearing from sight into the black shadows of a narrow alley on the left cairn leaped from the arabia shouting to the man to wait and went dashing down the sloping lane after the retreating figure a sort of blind fury possessed him but he never paused to analyze it never asked himself by what right he pursued this man what wrong the latter had done him his action was wholly unreasoning he knew that he wished to overtake the wearer of the mask and to tear it from his head upon that he acted he discovered that despite the tropical heat of the night he was shuddering with cold but he disregarded this circumstance and ran on the pursued stopped before an iron-studded door which was opened instantly he entered as the runner came up with him and before the door could be reclosed cairn thrust his way in blackness utter blackness was before him the figure which he had pursued seemed to have been swallowed up he stumbled on gropingly hands outstretched and then fell fell as he realized in the moment of falling down a short flight of stone steps still amid utter blackness he got upon his feet shaken but otherwise unhurt by his fall he turned about expecting to see some glimmer of light from the stairway but the blackness was unbroken silence and gloom hemmed him in he stood for a moment listening intently a shaft of light pierced the darkness as a shutter was thrown open through an iron barred window the light shone and with the light came a breath of stifling perfume that perfume carried his imagination back instantly to a room at oxford and he advanced and looked through into the place beyond he drew a swift breath clutched the bars and was silent stricken speechless he looked into a large and lofty room lighted by several hanging lamps it had a carpeted divan at one end and was otherwise scantily furnished in the eastern manner a silver incense burner smoked upon a large praying carpet and by it stood the man in the crocodile mask an arab girl fantastically attired who had evidently just opened the shutters was now helping him to remove the hideous headdress she presently untied the last of the fastenings and lifted the thing from the man's shoulders moving away with the gliding step of the oriental and leaving him standing there in his short white tunic bare-legged and sandaled the smoke of the incense curled upwards and played around the straight slim figure drew vaporous lines about the still ivory face the handsome sinister face sometimes partly veiling the long black eyes and sometimes showing them in all their unnatural brightness so the man stood looking towards the barred window it was antony ferrara ah dear cairn the husky musical voice smote upon care's ears as the most hated sound in nature you have followed me not content with driving me from london you would also render cairo my dear cairo untenable for me cairn clutched the bars but was silent how wrong of you cairn the soft voice mocked this attention is so harmful to you do you know cairn the sudanese formed the extraordinary opinion that i was an efreet and this strange reputation has followed me down the nile your father my dear friend has studied these odd matters and he would tell you that there is no power in nature higher than the human will actually cairn they have ascribed to me the direction of the Khamsin, and so many worthy egyptians have made up their minds that i travel with the storm or that the storm follows me that something of the kind has really come to pass or is it merely coincidence cairn who can say motionless immobile save for a slow smile antony ferrara stood and cairn kept his eyes upon the evil face and with trembling hands clutched the bars it is certainly odd is it not resumed the taunting voice that Khamsin 
so violent too should thus descend upon the kyrene season i only arrived in the fayum this evening cairn and do you know they have the pestilence there i trust the hot wind does not carry it to cairo there are so many distinguished european and american visitors here it would be a thousand pities cairn released his grip of the bars raised his clenched fists above his head and in a voice and with a maniacal fury that were neither his own cursed the man who stood there mocking him then he reeled fell and remembered no more all right old man you'll do quite nicely now it was sime speaking cairn struggled upright and found himself in bed sime was seated beside him don't talk said sime you're in a hospital i'll do the talking you listen i saw you bowled out of shepherd's last night shut up i followed but lost you we got up a search party and with the aid of the man who had driven you ran you to earth in a dirty alley behind the mosque of el azhar four kindly mendicants who reside upon the steps of the establishment had been awakened by your blundering in among them they were holding you yes you were raving pretty badly you are a lucky man cairn you were inoculated before you left home cairn nodded weakly saved you be all right in a couple of days that damned camseen has brought a whiff of the plague from somewhere curiously enough over fifty per cent of the cases spotted so far are people who were at the carnival some of them cairn but we won't discuss that now i was afraid of it last night that's why i kept my eye on you my boy you were delirious when you bolted out of the hotel was i said cairn wearily and lay back on the pillow perhaps i was end of chapter thirteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter fourteen of brood of the witch queen by sax romer dr cairn arrives dr bruce cairn stepped into the boat which was to take him ashore and as it swung away from the side of the liner sought to divert his thoughts by a contemplation of the weird scene amid the smoky flare of many lights amid rising clouds of dust a line of laden toilers was crawling ant-like from the lighters into the bowels of the big ship and a second line unladen was descending by another gangway above the jewelled velvet of the sky swept in a glorious arc beyond the lights of port said broke through the black curtain of the night and the moving ray from the lighthouse intermittently swept the harbour waters whilst amid the indescribable clamour the grimily picturesque turmoil so characteristic of the place the liner took in coal for her run to rangoon dodging this way and that rounding the sterns of big ships and disputing the waterway with lesser craft the boat made for shore the usual delay at the custom house the usual soothing of the excited officials in the usual way and his arabia was jolting dr cairn through the noise and smell of those rambling streets a noise and a smell entirely peculiar to this clearing-house of the near east he accepted the room which was offered to him at the hotel without troubling to inspect it and having left instructions that he was to be called in time for the early train to cairo he swallowed a whisky and soda at the buffet and wearily ascended the stairs there were tourists in the hotel english and american marked by a gaping wonderment and loud with plans of sightseeing but port said nay all egypt had nothing of novelty to offer dr cairn he was there at great inconvenience a practitioner of his repute may not easily arrange to quit london at a moment's notice but the business upon which he was come was imperative for him the charm of the place had not existence but somewhere in egypt his son stood in deadly peril and dr cairn counted the hours that yet divided them his soul was up in arms against the man whose evil schemes had led to his presence in port said at a time when many sufferers required his ministrations in half moon street he was haunted by a phantom a ghoul in human shape antony ferrara the adopted son of his dear friend the adopted son who had murdered his adopter 
who whilst guiltless in the eyes of the law was blood guilty in the eyes of god dr cairn switched on the light and seated himself upon the side of the bed knitting his brows and staring straight before him with an expression in his clear grey eyes whose significance he would have denied hotly had any man charged him with it he was thinking of antony ferrara's record the victims of this fiendish youth for antony ferrara was barely of age seemed to stand before him with hands stretched out appealingly you alone they seemed to cry know who and what he is you alone know of our awful wrongs you alone can avenge them and yet he had hesitated it had remained for his own flesh and blood to be threatened ere he had taken decisive action the viper had lain within his reach and he had neglected to set his heel upon it men and women had suffered and had died of its venom and he had not crushed it then robert his son had felt the poison fang and dr cairn who had hesitated to act upon the behalf of all humanity had leapt to arms he charged himself with apparent selfishness and his conscience would hear no defence dimly the turmoil from the harbour reached him where he sat he listened dully to the hooting of a siren that of some vessel coming out of the canal his thoughts were evil company and with a deep sigh he rose crossed the room and threw open the double windows giving access to the balcony port said a panorama of twinkling lights lay beneath him the beam from the lighthouse swept the town searchingly like the eye of some pagan god lustful for sacrifice he imagined that he could hear the shouting of the gangs coaling the liner in the harbour but the night was full of the remote murmuring inseparable from that gateway of the east the streets below white under the moon looked empty and deserted and the hotel beneath him gave up no sound to tell of the many birds of passage who sheltered within it a stunning sense of his loneliness came to him his physical loneliness was symbolic of that which characterized his place in the world he alone had the knowledge and the power to crush antony ferrara he alone could rid the world of the unnatural menace embodied in the person bearing that name the town lay beneath his eyes but now he saw nothing of it before his mental vision loomed exclusively the figure of a slim and strangely handsome young man having jet-black hair lustreless a face of uniform ivory hue long dark eyes wherein lurked lambent fires and a womanish grace expressed in his whole bearing and emphasized by his long white hands upon a finger of the left hand gleamed a strange green stone antony ferrara in the eyes of this solitary traveller who stood looking down upon port said that figure filled the entire landscape of egypt with a weary sigh dr cairn turned and began to undress leaving the windows open he switched off the light and got into bed he was very weary with a weariness rather of the spirit than of the flesh but it was of that sort which renders sleep all but impossible around and about one fixed point his thoughts circled in vain he endeavoured to forget for a while antony ferrara and the things connected with him sleep was imperative if he would be in fit condition to cope with the matters which demanded his attention in cairo yet sleep defied him every trifling sound from the harbour and the canal seemed to rise upon the still air to his room through a sort of mist created by the mosquito curtains he could see the open windows and look out upon the stars he found himself studying the heavens with sleepless eyes and idly working out the constellations visible then one very bright star attracted the whole of his attention and with the dogged persistency of insomnia he sought to place it but could not determine to which group it belonged so he lay with his eyes upon the stars until the other veiled lamps of heaven became invisible and the patch of sky no more than a setting for that one white orb in this contemplation he grew restful his thoughts ceased feverishly to race along that one hateful groove the bright stars seemed to soothe him as a result of his fixed gaze it now appeared to have increased in size this was a common optical delusion upon which he scarcely speculated at all he recognized the welcome approach of sleep 
and deliberately concentrated his mind upon the globe of light yes a globe of light indeed for now it had assumed the dimensions of a lesser moon and it seemed to rest in the space between the open windows then he thought that it crept still nearer the realities the bed the mosquito curtain the room were fading and grateful slumber approached and weighed upon his eyes in the form of that dazzling globe the feeling of contentment was the last impression which he had ere with the bright star seemingly suspended just beyond the netting he slept end of chapter fourteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter fifteen of brood of the witch queen by sax romer the witch queen a man mentally overtired sleeps either dreamlessly or dreams with a vividness greater than that characterizing the dreams of normal slumber dr cairn dreamt a vivid dream he dreamt that he was awakened by the sound of a gentle rapping opening his eyes he peered through the cloudy netting he started up and wrenched back the curtain the rapping was repeated and peering again across the room he very distinctly perceived a figure upon the balcony by the open window it was that of a woman who wore the black silk dress and the white yashmak of the moslem and who was bending forward looking into the room who is there he called what do you want Shh. the woman raised her hand to her veiled lips and looked right and left as if fearing to disturb the occupants of the adjacent rooms dr cairn reached out for his dressing-gown which lay upon the chair beside the bed threw it over his shoulders and stepped out upon the floor he stooped and put on his slippers never taking his eyes from the figure at the window the room was flooded with moonlight he began to walk towards the balcony when the mysterious visitor spoke you are dr cairn the words were spoken in the language of dreams that is to say that although he understood them perfectly he knew that they had not been uttered in the english language nor in any language known to him yet as is the way with one who dreams he had understood i am he he said who are you make no noise but follow me quickly someone is very ill there was a sincerity in the appeal spoken in the softest most silvern tone which he had ever heard he stood beside the veiled woman and met the glance of her dark eyes with a consciousness of some magnetic force in the glance which seemed to set his nerves quivering why do you come to the window how do you know the visitor raised her hand again to her lips it was of a gleaming ivory colour and the long tapered fingers were laden with singular jewellery exquisite enamel work which he knew to be ancient egyptian but which did not seem out of place in this dream adventure i was afraid to make any unnecessary disturbance she replied please do not delay but come at once dr cairn adjusted his dressing-gown and followed the veiled messenger along the balcony for a dream city port said appeared remarkably substantial as it spread out at his feet its dingy buildings whitened by the moonlight but his progress was dreamlike for he seemed to glide past many windows around the corner of the building and without having consciously exerted any physical effort found his hands grasped by warm jewelled fingers found himself guided into some darkened room and then possessed by that doubting which sometimes comes in dreams he found himself hesitating the moonlight did not penetrate to the apartment in which he stood and the darkness about him was impenetrable but the clinging fingers did not release their hold and vaguely aware that he was acting in a manner which might readily be misconstrued he nevertheless allowed his unseen guide to lead him forward stairs were descended in phantom silence many stairs the coolness of the air suggested that they were outside the hotel but the darkness remained complete along what seemed to be a stone carved passage they advanced mysteriously and by this time dr cairn was wholly resigned to the strangeness of his dream then although the place lay in blackest shadow he saw that they were in the open air for the starry sky swept above them 
it was a narrow street at points the buildings almost met above wherein he now found himself in reality had he been in possession of his usual faculties awake he would have asked himself how this veiled woman had gained admittance to the hotel and why she had secretly led him out from it but the dreamer's mental lethargy possessed him and with the blind faith of a child he followed on until he now began vaguely to consider the personality of his guide she seemed to be of no more than average height but she carried herself with an unusual grace and her progress was marked by a certain hauteur at the point where a narrow lane crossed that which they were traversing the veiled figure was silhouetted for a moment against the light of the moon and through the gauze-like fabric he perceived the outlines of a perfect shape his vague wonderment concerned itself now with the ivory jewel-laden hands his condition differed from the normal dream state in that he was not entirely resigned to the anomalous misty doubts were forming when his dream guide paused before a heavy door of a typical native house which once had been of some consequence and which faced the entrance to a mosque indeed lay in the shadow of the minaret it was opened from within although she gave no perceptible signal and its darkness to dr cairn's dulled perceptions seemed to swallow them both up he had an impression of a trap raised of stone steps descended of a new darkness almost palpable the gloom of the place affected him as a mental blank and when a bright light shone out it seemed to mark the opening of a second dream phase but where the light came from he knew not cared not but it illuminated a perfectly bare room with a floor of native mud bricks a plastered wall and wood-beamed ceiling a tall sarcophagus stood upright against the wall before him its lid leant close beside it and his black-robed guide her luminous eyes looking straightly over the yashmak stood rigidly upright within it she raised the jewelled hands and with a swift movement discarded robe and yashmak and stood before him in the clinging draperies of an ancient queen wearing the leopard skin and the uraeus and carrying the flail of royal egypt her pale face formed a perfect oval the long almond eyes had an evil beauty which seemed to chill and the brilliantly red mouth was curved in a smile which must have made any man forget the evil in the eyes but when we move in a dream world our emotions become dreamlike too she placed a sandaled foot upon the mud floor and stepped out of the sarcophagus advancing towards dr cairn a vision of such sinful loveliness as he could never have conceived in his waking moments in that strange dream language in a tongue not of east or west she spoke and her silvern voice had something of the tone of those egyptian pipes whose dree fills the nights upon the upper nile the seductive music of remote and splendid wickedness you know me now she whispered and in his dream she seemed to be a familiar figure at once dreadful and worshipful a fitful light played through the darkness and seemed to dance upon a curtain draped behind the sarcophagus picking out diamond points the dreamer groped in the mental chaos of his mind and found a clue to the meaning of this the diamond points were the eyes of thousands of tarantula spiders with which the curtain was broidered the sign of the spider what did he know of it yes of course it was the secret mark of egypt's witch queen of the beautiful woman whose name after her mysterious death had been erased from all her monuments a sweet whisper stole to his ears you will befriend him befriend my son for my sake and in his dream state he found himself prepared to forswear all that he held holy for her sake she grasped both his hands and her burning eyes looked closely into his your reward shall be a great one she whispered even more softly came a sudden blank and dr cairn found himself walking again through the narrow street led by the veiled woman his impressions were growing dim and now she seemed less real than hitherto 
the streets were phantom streets built of shadow stuff and the stairs which presently he found himself ascending were unsubstantial and he seemed rather to float upward until with the jewelled fingers held fast in his own he stood in a darkened apartment and saw before him an open window knew that he was once more back in the hotel a dim light dawned in the blackness of the room and the musical voice breathed in his ear your reward shall be easily earned i did but test you strike and strike truly the whisper grew sibilant serpentine dr cairn felt the hilt of a dagger thrust into his right hand and in the dimly mysterious light looked down at one who lay in a bed close beside him at the sight of the face of the sleeper the perfectly chiselled face with the long black lashes resting on the ivory cheeks he forgot all else forgot the place wherein he stood forgot his beautiful guide and only remembered that he held a dagger in his hand and that antony ferrara lay there sleeping strike came the whisper again dr cairn felt a mad exultation boiling up within him he raised his hand glanced once more on the face of the sleeper and nerved himself to plunge the dagger into the heart of this evil thing a second more and the dagger would have been buried to the hilt in the sleeper's breast when there ensued a deafening an appalling explosion a wild red light illuminated the room the building seeming to rock close upon that frightful sound followed a cry so piercing that it seemed to ice the blood in dr cairn's veins stop sir stop my god what are you doing a swift blow struck the dagger from his hand and the figure on the bed sprang upright swaying dizzily dr cairn stood there in the darkness and as the voice of awakened sleepers reached his ears from adjoining rooms the electric light was switched on and across the bed the bed upon which he had thought antony ferrara lay he saw his son robert cairn no one else was in the room but on the carpet at his feet lay an ancient dagger the hilt covered with beautiful and intricate gold and enamel work rigid with a mutual horror these two so strangely met stood staring at one another across the room everyone in the hotel it would appear had been awakened by the explosion which as if by the intervention of god had stayed the hand of dr cairn had spared him from a deed impossible to contemplate there were sounds of running footsteps everywhere but the origin of the disturbance at that moment had no interest for these two robert was the first to break the silence merciful god sir he whispered huskily how did you come to be here what is the matter are you ill dr cairn extended his hands like one groping in darkness rob give me a moment to think to collect myself why am i here by all that is wonderful why are you here i am here to meet you to meet me i had no idea that you were well enough for the journey and if you came to meet me why that's it sir why did you send me that wireless i sent no wireless boy robert cairn with a little colour returning to his pale cheeks advanced and grasped his father's hand but after i arrived here to meet the boat sir i received a wireless from the p and o due in the morning to say that you had changed your mind and come via brindisi dr cairn glanced at the dagger upon the carpet repressed a shudder and replied in a voice which he struggled to make firm i did not send that wireless then you actually came by the boat which arrived last night and to think that i was asleep in the same hotel what an amazing amazing indeed rob and the result of a cunning and well-planned scheme he raised his eyes looking fixedly at his son you understand the scheme the scheme that could only have germinated in one mind a scheme to cause me your father to his voice failed and again his glance sought the weapon which lay so close to his feet partly in order to hide his emotion he stooped picked up the dagger and threw it on the bed for god's sake sir groaned robert what were you doing here in my room with that dr cairn stood straightly upright and replied in an even voice i was here to do murder murder i was under a spell no need to name its weaver i thought that a poisonous thing at last lay at my mercy and by cunning means the primitive evil within me was called up 
and braving the laws of god and man i was about to slay that thing thank god he dropped upon his knees silently bowed his head for a moment and then stood up self-possessed again as his son had always known him it had been a strange and awful awakening for robert cairn to find his room illuminated by a lurid light and to find his own father standing over him with a knife but what had moved him even more deeply than the fear of these things had been the sight of the emotion which had shaken that stern and unemotional man now as he gathered together his scattered wits he began to perceive that a malignant hand was moving above them that his father and himself were pawns which had been moved mysteriously to a dreadful end a great disturbance had now arisen in the streets below streams of people it seemed were pouring towards the harbour but dr cairn pointed to an armchair sit down rob he said i will tell my story and you shall tell yours by comparing notes we can arrive at some conclusion then we must act this is a fight to a finish and i begin to doubt if we are strong enough to win he took up the dagger and ran a critical glance over it from the keen point to the enameled hilt this is unique he muttered whilst his son spellbound watched him the blade is as keen as if tempered but yesterday yet it was made full five thousand years ago as the workmanship of the hilt testifies rob we deal with powers more than human we have to cope with a force which might have awed the greatest masters which the world has known it would have called for all the knowledge and all the power of a polonius of tyana to have dealt with him antony ferrara undoubtedly rob it was by the agency of antony ferrara that the wireless message was sent to you from the p and o it was by the agency of antony ferrara that i dreamt the dream to-night in fact it was no true dream i was under the influence of what shall i term it hypnotic suggestion to what extent that malign will was responsible for you and i being placed in rooms communicating by means of a balcony we probably shall never know but if this proximity was merely accidental the enemy did not fail to take advantage of the coincidence i lay watching the stars before i slept and one of them seemed to grow larger as i watched he began to pace about the room in growing excitement rob i cannot doubt that a mirror or a crystal was actually suspended before my eyes by someone who had been watching for the opportunity i yielded myself to the soothing influence and thus deliberately deliberately placed myself in the power of antony ferrara you think that he is here in this hotel i cannot doubt that he is in the neighbourhood the influence was too strong to have emanated from a mind at a great distance removed i will tell you exactly what i dreamt he dropped into a cane chair comparative quiet reigned again in the streets below but a distant clamour told of some untoward happening at the harbour dawn would break ere long and there was a curious rawness in the atmosphere dr cairn seated himself upon the side of the bed and watched his father whilst the latter related those happenings with which we are already acquainted you think sir said robert at the conclusion of the strange story that no part of your experience was real dr cairn held up the antique dagger glancing at the speaker significantly on the contrary he replied i do know that part of it was dreadfully real my difficulty is to separate the real from the phantasmal silence fell for a moment then it is almost certain said the younger man frowning thoughtfully that you did not actually leave the hotel but merely passed from your room to mine by way of the balcony dr cairn stood up walked again to the open window and looked out then turned and faced his son again i believe i can put that matter to the test he declared in my dream as i turned into the lane where the house was the house of the mummy there was a patch covered with deep mud where at some time during the evening a quantity of water had been spilt i stepped upon that patch or dreamt that i did we can settle the point he sat down on the bed beside his son and stooping pulled off one of his slippers the night had been full enough of dreadful surprises but here was yet another which came to them as dr cairn with the inverted slipper in his hand sat looking into his son's eyes the sole of the slipper was caked with reddish-brown mud 
End of chapter 15, read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California. Chapter 16 of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sex Romer Lair of the Spiders We must find that house, find the sarcophagus, for I no longer doubt that it exists. Drag it out and destroy it. Should you know it again, sir? Beyond any possibility of doubt, it is the sarcophagus of a queen. What queen? A queen whose tomb the late Sir Michael Ferrara and I sought for many months, but failed to find. Is this queen well known in Egyptian history? Dr. Cairn stared at him with an odd expression in his eyes. Some histories ignore her existence entirely, he said and with an evident desire to change the subject added i shall return to my room to dress now do you dress also we cannot afford to sleep whilst the situation of that house remains unknown to us robert cairn nodded and his father stood up and went out of the room dawn saw the two of them peering from the balcony upon the streets of port said already dotted with moving figures for the egyptian is an early riser have you any clue asked the younger man to the direction in which this place lies absolutely none for the reason that i do not know where my dreaming left off and the reality commenced did someone really come to my window and lead me out through another room downstairs and into the street or did i wander out of my own accord and merely imagine the existence of the guide in either event i must have been guided in some way to a back entrance for had i attempted to leave by the front door of the hotel in that trance-like condition i should certainly have been detained by the boab suppose we commence then by inquiring if there is such another entrance the hotel staff was already afoot and their inquiries led to the discovery of an entrance communicating with the native servants quarters this could not be reached from the main hall but there was a narrow staircase to the left of the lift shaft by which it might be gained the two stood looking out across the stone paved courtyard upon which the door opened beyond doubt said dr cairn i might have come down that staircase and out by this door without arousing a soul either by passing through my own room or through any other on that floor they crossed the yard where members of the kitchen staff were busily polishing various cooking utensils and opened the gate dr cairn turned to one of the men nearby is this gate bolted at night he asked in arabic the man shook his head and seemed to be much amused by the question revealing his white teeth as he assured them that it was not a narrow lane ran along behind the hotel communicating with a maze of streets almost exclusively peopled by natives rob said dr cairn slowly it begins to dawn upon me that this is the way i came he stood looking to right and left and seemed to be undecided then we will try right he determined they set off along the narrow way once clear of the hotel wall high buildings rose upon either side so that at no time during the day could the sun have penetrated to the winding lane suddenly robert cairn stopped look he said and pointed the mosque you spoke of a mosque near to the house dr cairn nodded his eyes were gleaming now that he felt himself to be on the track of this great evil which had shattered his peace they advanced until they stood before the door of the mosque and there in the shadow of a low archway was just such an ancient iron-studded door as dr cairn remembered latticed windows overhung the street above but no living creature was in sight he very gently pressed upon the door but as he had anticipated it was fastened from within in the vague light his face seemed strangely haggard as he turned to his son raising his eyebrows interrogatively it is just possible that i may be mistaken he said so that i scarcely know what to do he stood looking about him in some perplexity adjoining the mosque was a ruinous house which clearly had had no occupants for many years as robert cairn's gaze lighted upon its gaping window frames and doorless porch he seized his father by the arm we might hide up there he suggested and watch for anyone entering or leaving the place opposite 
i have little doubt this was the scene of my experience replied dr cairn therefore i think we will adopt your plan perhaps there is some means of egress at the back it will be useful if we have to remain on the watch for any considerable time they entered the ruined building and by means of a rickety staircase gained the floor above it moved beneath them unsafely but from the divan which occupied one end of the apartment an uninterrupted view of the door below was obtainable stay here said dr kane and watch whilst i reconnoiter he descended the stairs again to return in a minute or so and announce that another street could be reached through the back of the house there and then they settled the plan of campaign one at a time they would go to the hotel for their meals so that the door would never be unwatched throughout the day dr cairn determined to make no inquiries respecting the house as this might put the enemy upon his guard we are in his own country rob he said here we can trust no one thereupon they commenced their singular and self-imposed task in turn they went back to the hotel for breakfast and watched fruitlessly throughout the morning they lunched in the same way and throughout the great midday heat sat hidden in the ruined building mounting guard over that iron-studded door it was a dreary and monotonous day long to be remembered by both of them and when the hour of sunset drew nigh and their vigil remained unrewarded they began to doubt the wisdom of their tactics the street was but little frequented there was not the slightest chance of their presence being discovered it was very quiet too so that no one could have approached unheard at the hotel they had learnt the cause of the explosion during the night an accident in the engine room of a tramp steamer which had done considerable damage but caused no bodily injury we may hope to win yet said dr cairn in speaking of the incident it was the hand of god silence had prevailed between them for a long time and he was about to propose that his son should go back to dinner when the rare sound of a footstep below checked the words upon his lips both craned their necks to obtain a view of the pedestrian an old man stooping beneath the burden of years and resting much of his weight upon a staff came tottering into sight the watchers crouched back breathless with excitement as the newcomer paused before the iron-studded door and from beneath his cloak took out a big key inserting it into the lock he swung open the door it creaked upon ancient hinges as it opened inward revealing a glimpse of a stone floor as the old man entered dr cairn grasped his son by the wrist down he whispered now is our chance they ran down the rickety stairs crossed the narrow street and robert cairn cautiously looked in around the door which had been left ajar black against the dim light of another door at the farther end of the large and barn-like apartment showed the stooping figure tap 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 went the stick and the old man had disappeared around a corner where can we hide whispered dr cairn he is evidently making a tour of inspection the sound of footsteps mounting to the upper apartments came to their ears they looked about them right and left and presently the younger man detected a large wooden cupboard set in one wall opening it he saw that it contained but one shelf only near the top when he returns he said we can hide in here until he has gone out dr cairn nodded he was peering about the room intently this is the place i came to rob he said softly but there was a stone stair leading down to some room underneath we must find it the old man could be heard passing from room to room above then his uneven footsteps sounded on stair again and glancing at one another the two stepped into the cupboard and pulled the door gently inward a few moments later the old caretaker since such appeared to be his office passed out slamming the door behind him at that they emerged from their hiding place and began to examine the apartment carefully it was growing very dark now indeed with the door shut it was difficult to detect the outlines of the room suddenly a loud cry broke the perfect stillness seeming to come from somewhere above robert cairn started violently grasping his father's arm but the older man smiled you forget that there is a mosque almost opposite he said that is the muedin his son laughed shortly 
my nerves are not yet all that they might be he explained and bending low began to examine the pavement there must be a trap door in the floor he continued don't you think so his father nodded silently and upon hands and knees also began to inspect the cracks and crannies between the various stones in the right-hand corner furthest from the entrance their quest was rewarded a stone some three feet square moved slightly when pressure was applied to it and gave up a sound of hollowness beneath the tread dust and litter covered the entire floor but having cleared the top of this particular stone a ring was discovered lying flat in a circular groove cut to receive it the blade of a penknife served to raise it from its resting place and dr cairn standing astride across the trap tugged at the ring and without great difficulty raised the stone block from its place a square hole was revealed there were irregular stone steps leading down into the blackness a piece of candle stuck in a crude wooden holder lay upon the topmost dr cairn taking a box of matches from his pocket very quickly lighted the candle and with it held in his left hand began to descend his head was not yet below the level of the upper apartment when he paused you have your revolver he said robert nodded grimly and took his revolver from his pocket a singular and most disagreeable smell was arising from the trap which they had opened but ignoring this they descended and presently stood side by side in a low cellar here the odour was almost unsupportable it had in it something menacing something definitely repellent and at the foot of the steps they stood hesitating dr cairn slowly moved the candle throwing the light along the floor where it picked out strips of wood and broken cases straw packing and kindred litter until it impinged upon a brightly painted slab further he moved it and higher and the end of a sarcophagus came into view he drew a quick hissing breath and bending forward directed the light into the interior of the ancient coffin then he had all need of his iron nerve to choke down the cry that rose to his lips by god look whispered his son swathed in white wrappings anthony ferrara lay motionless before them the seconds passed one by one until a whole minute was told and still the two remained inert and the cold lights shone fully upon that ivory face is he dead robert cairn spoke huskily grasping his father's shoulder i think not was the equally hoarse reply he is in the state of trance mentioned in certain ancient writings he is absorbing evil force from the sarcophagus of the witch queen footnote a note it seems exceedingly probable that the mummy case sarcophagus with its painted presentment of the living person was the material basis for the preservation of the coup magical powers of a fully equipped adept collectanea hermetica volume eight there was a faint rustling sound in the cellar which seemed to grow louder and more insistent but dr cairn apparently did not notice it for he turned to his son and albeit the latter could see him but vaguely he knew that his face was grimly set it seems like butchery he said evenly but in the interests of the world we must not hesitate a shot might attract attention give me your knife for a moment the other scarcely comprehended the full purport of the words mechanically he took out his knife and opened the big blade good heavens sir he gasped breathlessly it is too awful awful i grant you replied dr cairn but a duty a duty boy and one that we must not shirk i alone among living men know whom and what lies here and my conscience directs me in what i do his end shall be that which he had planned for you give me the knife he took the knife from his son's hand with the light directed upon the still ivory face he stepped towards the sarcophagus as he did so something dropped from the roof narrowly missed falling upon his outstretched hand and with a soft dull thud dropped upon the mud brick floor impelled by some intuition he suddenly directed the light to the roof above then with a shrill cry which he was wholly unable to repress robert cairn seized his father's arm and began to pull him back towards the stair quick sir he screamed shrilly almost hysterically my god my god be quick 
the appearance of the roof above had puzzled him for an instant as the light touched it then in the next had filled his very soul with loathing and horror for directly above them was moving a black patch a foot or so in extent and it was composed of a dense moving mass of tarantula spiders a line of the disgusting creatures was mounting the wall and crossing the ceiling ever swelling the unclean group dr cairn did not hesitate to leap for the stair and as he did so the spiders began to drop indeed they seemed to leap toward the intruders until the floor all about them and the bottom steps of the stair presented a mass of black moving insects a perfect panic fear seized upon them at every step spiders crunched beneath their feet they seemed to come from nowhere to be conjured up out of the darkness till the whole cellar the stairs the very fetid air above them became black and nauseous with spiders halfway to the top dr cairn turned snatched out a revolver and began firing down into the cellar in the direction of the sarcophagus a hairy clutching thing ran up his arm and his son uttering a groan of horror struck at it and stained the tweed with its poisonous blood they staggered to the head of the steps and there dr cairn turned and hurled the candle at a monstrous spider that suddenly sprang into view the candle still attached to its wooden socket went bounding down steps that now were literally carpeted with insects tarantulas began to run out from the trap as if pursuing the intruders and a faint light showed from below then came a crackling sound and a wisp of smoke floated up dr cairn threw open the outer door and the two panic-stricken men leaped out into the street and away from the spider army white to the lips they stood leaning against the wall was it really ferrara whispered robert i hope so was the answer dr cairn pointed to the closed door a fan of smoke was creeping from beneath it the fire which ensued destroyed not only the house in which it had broken out but the two adjoining and the neighbouring mosque was saved only with the utmost difficulty when in the dawn of the new day dr cairn looked down into the smoking pit which had once been the home of the spiders he shook his head and turned to his son if our eyes did not deceive us rob he said a just retribution at last has claimed him pressing away through the surrounding crowd of natives they returned to the hotel the hall porter stopped them as they entered excuse me sir he said but which is mr robert cairn robert cairn stepped forward a young gentleman left this for you sir half an hour ago said the man a very pale gentleman with black eyes he said you dropped it robert cairn unwrapped the little parcel it contained a penknife the ivory handle charred as if it had been in a furnace it was his own which he had handed to his father in that awful cellar at the moment when the first spider had dropped and a card was enclosed bearing the penciled words with anthony ferrara's compliments end of chapter sixteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter seventeen a brood of the witch queen by sax romer the story of ali mohammed saluting each of the three in turn the tall egyptian passed from dr cairn's room upon his exit followed by a brief but electric silence dr cairn's face was very stern and syme with his hands locked behind him stood staring out of the window into the palmy garden of the hotel robert cairn looked from one to the other excitedly what did he say sir he cried addressing his father it had something to do with dr cairn turned syme did not move it had something to do with the matter which has brought me to cairo replied the former yes you see said robert my knowledge of arabic is nil syme turned in his heavy fashion and directed a dull gaze upon the last speaker ali mohammed he explained slowly who has just left had come down from the fayum to report a singular matter he was unaware of its real importance but it was sufficiently unusual to disturb him and ali mohammed s sufi is not easily disturbed dr cairn dropped into an armchair nodding towards syme tell him all that we have heard he said we stand together in this affair well continued syme in his deliberate fashion 
when we struck our camp beside the pyramid of Midum, ali mohammed remained behind with a gang of workmen to finish off some comparatively unimportant work he is an unemotional person fear is alien to his composition it has no meaning for him but last night something occurred at the camp or what remained of the camp which seems to have shaken even ali mohammed's iron nerve robert cairn nodded watching the speaker intently the entrance to the Maidum pyramid continued sime one of the entrances interrupted dr cairn smiling slightly there is only one entrance said sime dogmatically dr cairn waved his hand go ahead he said we can discuss these archaeological details later sime stared dully but without further comment resumed the camp was situated on the slope immediately below the only known entrance to the Maidum pyramid one might say that it lay in the shadow of the building there are tumuli in the neighbourhood part of a prehistoric cemetery and it was work in connection with this which had detained ali mohammed in that part of the fayum last night about ten o'clock he was awakened by an unusual sound or series of sounds he reports he came out of the tent into the moonlight and looked up at the pyramid the entrance was a good way above his head of course and quite fifty or sixty yards from the point where he was standing but the moonbeams bathed that side of the building in dazzling light so that he was enabled to see a perfect crowd of bats whirling out of the pyramid bats ejaculated robert cairn yes there is a small colony of bats in this pyramid of course but the bat does not hunt in bands and the sight of these bats flying out from the place was one which ali mohammed had never witnessed before their concerted squeaking was very clearly audible he could not believe that it was this which had awakened him and which had awakened the ten or twelve workmen who also slept in the camp for these were now clustering around him and all looking up at the side of the pyramid Fayum nights are strangely still except for the jackals and the village dogs and some other sounds to which one grows accustomed there is nothing absolutely nothing audible in this stillness then the flapping of the bat regiment made quite a disturbance overhead some of the men were only half awake but most of them were badly frightened and now they began to compare notes with the result that they determined upon the exact nature of the sound which had aroused them it seemed almost certain that this had been a dreadful scream the scream of a woman in the last agony he paused looking from dr cairn to his son with a singular expression upon his habitually immobile face go on said robert cairn slowly sime resumed the bats had begun to disperse in various directions but the panic which had seized upon the camp does not seem to have dispersed so readily ali mohammed confesses that he himself felt almost afraid a remarkable admission for a man of his class to make picture these fellows then standing looking at one another and very frequently up at the opening in the side of the pyramid then the smell began to reach their nostrils the smell which completed the panic and which led to the abandonment of the camp the smell what kind of smell jerked robert cairn dr cairn turned himself in his chair looking fully at his son the smell of hades boy he said grimly and turned away again naturally continued sime i can give you no particulars on the point but it must have been something very fearful to have affected the egyptian native there was no breeze but it swept down upon them this poisonous smell as though borne by a hot wind was it actually hot i cannot say but ali mohammed is positive that it came from the opening in the pyramid it was not apparently in disgust but in sheer stark horror that the whole crowd of them turned tail and ran they never stopped and never looked back until they came to Recca on the railway. A short silence followed. Then, that was last night? questioned Cairn. His father nodded. The man came in by the first train from Wasta, he said, and we have not a moment to spare. Syme stared at him. I don't understand. I have a mission, said Dr. Cairn quietly it is to run to earth to stamp out as i would stamp out a pestilence a certain thing i cannot call it a man antony ferrara 
i believe sime that you are at one with me in this matter sime drummed his fingers upon the table frowning thoughtfully and looking from one to the other of his companions under his lowered brows with my own eyes he said i have seen something of this secret drama which has brought you dr cairn to egypt and up to a point i agree with you regarding anthony ferrara you have lost all trace of him since leaving port said said dr cairn i have seen and heard nothing of him but lady lashmore who was an intimate and an innocent victim god help her of ferrara in london after staying at the semiramis in cairo for one day departed where did she go what has lady lashmore to do with the matter asked sime if what i fear be true replied dr cairn but i anticipate at the moment it is enough for me that unless my information be at fault lady lashmore yesterday left cairo by the luxor train at eight thirty robert cairn looked in a puzzled way at his father what do you suspect sir he asked i suspect that she went no further than wasta replied dr cairn still i do not understand declared sime you may understand later was the answer we must not waste a moment you egyptologists think that egypt has little or nothing to teach you the pyramid of Midum lost interest directly you learnt that it apparently contained no treasure how little you know what it really contained sime mariette did not suspect sir gaston maspero does not suspect the late sir michael ferrara and i once camped by the pyramid of Midum, as you have camped there and we made a discovery well said sime with growing interest that is a point upon which my lips are sealed but do you believe in black magic i am not altogether sure that i do very well you are entitled to your opinion but although you appear to be ignorant of the fact the pyramid of Midum was formerly one of the strongholds the second greatest in all the land of egypt of ancient egyptian sorcery i pray heaven i may be wrong but in the disappearance of lady lashmore and in the story of ali mohammed i see a dreadful possibility ring for a time-table we have not a moment to waste End of chapter 17 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 18 of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer The Bats Rekka was a mile behind. It'll take us fully an hour yet, said Dr. Cairn, to reach the pyramid, although it appears so near. Indeed, in the violet dusk, the great Mastaba Pyramid of Maydum seemed already to loom above them, although it was quite four miles away. The narrow path along which they trotted their donkeys ran through the fertile lowlands of the Fayum. They had just passed a village, amid an angry chorus from the pariah dogs, and were now following the track along the top of the embankment. Where the green carpet merged ahead into the grey ocean of sand, the desert began and out in that desert resembling some weird work of nature rather than anything wrought by the hand of man stood the gloomy and lonely building ascribed by the egyptologists to the pharaoh sneferu dr cairn and his son rode ahead and sime with ali mohammed brought up the rear of the little company i am completely in the dark sir said robert cairn respecting the object of our present journey what leads you to suppose that we shall find antony ferrara here i scarcely hope to find him here was the enigmatical reply but i am almost certain that he is here i might have expected it and i blame myself for not having provided against this against what it is impossible rob for you to understand this matter indeed if i were to publish what i know not what i imagine but what i know about the pyramid of Maidum, i should not only call down upon myself the ridicule of every egyptologist in europe i should be accounted mad by the whole world his son was silent for a time then according to the guide-books he said it is merely an empty tomb it is empty certainly replied dr cairn grimly or that apartment known as the king's chamber is now empty 
but even the so-called king's chamber was not empty once and there is another chamber in the pyramid which is not empty now if you know of the existence of such a chamber sir why have you kept it secret because i cannot prove its existence i do not know how to enter it but i know it is there i know what it was formerly used for and i suspect that last night it was used for that same unholy purpose again after a lapse of perhaps four thousand years even you would doubt me i believe if i were to tell you what i know if i were to hint at what i suspect but no doubt in your reading you have met with julian the apostate certainly i have read of him he is said to have practised necromancy when he was at kara in mesopotamia he retired to the temple of the moon with a certain sorcerer and some others and his nocturnal operations concluded he left the temple locked the door sealed and placed the guard over the gate he was killed in the war and never returned to kara but when in the reign of jovian the seal was broken and the temple opened a body was found hanging by its hair i will spare you the particulars it was a case of that most awful form of sorcery anthropomacy an expression of horror had crept over robert cairn's face do you mean sir that this pyramid was used for similar purposes in the past it has been used for many purposes was the quiet reply the exodus of the bats points to the fact that it was again used for one of those purposes last night the exodus of the bats and something else sime who had been listening to this strange conversation cried out from the rear we cannot reach it before sunset no replied dr cairn turning in his saddle but that does not matter inside the pyramid day and night make no difference having crossed a narrow wooden bridge they turned now fully in the direction of the great ruin pursuing a path along the opposite bank of the cutting they rode in silence for some time robert cairn deep in thought i suppose that antony ferrara actually visited this place last night he said suddenly although i cannot follow your reasoning but what leads you to suppose that he is there now this answered his father slowly the purpose for which i believe him to have come here would detain him at least two days and two nights i shall say no more about it because if i am wrong or if for any reason i am unable to establish my suspicions as facts you would certainly regard me as a madman if i had confided those suspicions to you mounted upon donkeys the journey from Recca and the pyramid of medum occupies fully an hour and a half and the glories of the sunset had merged into the violet dusk of egypt before the party passed the outskirts of the cultivated land and came upon the desert sands the mountainous pile of granite its peculiar orange hue a ghastly yellow in the moonlight now assumed truly monstrous proportions seeming like a great square tower rising in three stages from its mound of sand to some three hundred and fifty feet above the level of the desert there is nothing more awesome in the world than to find one's self at night far from all fellow men in the shadow of one of those edifices raised by unknown hands by unknown means to an unknown end for despite all the wisdom of our modern inquirers these stupendous relics remain unsolved riddles set to posterity by a mysterious people neither sime nor ali mohammed were of highly strung temperament neither subject to those subtle impressions which more delicate organizations receive as the nostrils receive an exhalation from such place as this but dr cairn and his son though each in a different way came now within the aura of this temple of the dead ages the great silence of the desert a silence like no other in the world the loneliness which must be experienced to be appreciated of that dry and tideless ocean the traditions which had grown up like fungi in this venerable building lastly the knowledge that it was associated in some way with the sorcery the unholy activity of antony ferrara combined to chill them with a supernatural dread which called for all their courage to combat what now said sime descending from his mount 
we must lead the donkeys up the slope replied dr cairn where those blocks of granite are and tether them there in silence then the party commenced the tedious ascent of the mound by the narrow path to the top until at some hundred and twenty feet above the surrounding plain they found themselves actually under the wall of the mighty building the donkeys were made fast sign and i said dr cairn quietly will enter the pyramid but interrupted his son apart from the fatigue of the operation continued the doctor the temperature in the lower part of the pyramid is so tremendous and the air so bad that in your present state of health it would be absurd for you to attempt it apart from which there is a possibly more important task to be undertaken here outside he turned his eyes upon sime who was listening intently then continued whilst we are penetrating to the interior by means of the sloping passage on the north side ali mohammed and yourself must mount guard on the south side what for said sime rapidly for the reason replied dr cairn that there is an entrance on to the first stage but the first stage is nearly seventy feet above us even assuming that there were an entrance there which i doubt escape by that means would be impossible no one could climb down the face of the pyramid from above no one has ever succeeded in climbing up for the purpose of surveying the pyramid a scaffold had to be erected its sides are quite unscalable that may be agreed dr cairn but nevertheless i have my reasons for placing a guard over the south side if anything appears upon the stage above rob anything shoot and shoot straight he repeated the same instructions to ali mohammed to the evident surprise of the latter i don't understand at all muttered sime but as i presume you have good reason for what you do let it be as you propose can you give me any idea respecting what we may hope to find inside this place i only entered once and i am not anxious to repeat the experiment the air is unbreathable the descent to the level passage below is stiff work and apart from the inconvenience of navigating the latter passage which as you probably know is only sixteen inches high the climb up the vertical shaft into the tomb is not a particularly safe one i exclude the possibility of snakes he added ironically you have also omitted the possibility of antony ferrara said dr cairn pardon my scepticism doctor but i cannot imagine any man voluntarily remaining in that awful place yet i am greatly mistaken if he is not there then he is trapped said sime grimly and examining a browning pistol which he carried unless he stopped and an expression almost of fear crept over his stoical features that sixteen-inch passage he muttered with antony ferrara at the further end exactly said dr cairn but i consider it my duty to the world to proceed i warn you that you are about to face the greatest peril probably which you will ever be called upon to encounter i do not ask you to do this i am quite prepared to go alone that remark was wholly unnecessary doctor said sime rather truculently suppose the other two proceed to their post but sir began robert cairn you know the way said the doctor with an air of finality there is not a moment to waste and although i fear we are too late it is just possible we may be in time to prevent a dreadful crime the tall egyptian and robert cairn went stumbling off amongst the heaps of rubbish and broken masonry until an angle of the great wall concealed them from view then the two who remained continued the climb yet higher following the narrow zigzag path leading up to the entrance of the descending passage immediately under the square black hole they stood and glanced at one another we may as well leave our outer garments here said sime i note that you wear rubber-soled shoes but i shall remove my boots as otherwise i should be unable to obtain any foothold dr cairn nodded and without more ado proceeded to strip off his coat an example which was followed by sime it was as he stooped and placed his hat upon the little bundle of clothes at his feet that dr cairn detected something which caused him to stoop yet lower and appear at the dark object on the ground with a strange intentness what is it jerked sime glancing back at him dr cairn from a hip pocket took out an electric lamp 
and directed the white ray upon something lying on the splintered fragments of granite it was a bat a fairly large one and a clot of blood marked the place where its head had been for the bat was decapitated as though anticipating what he should find there dr cairn flashed the ray of lamp all around the ground in the vicinity of the entrance of the pyramid scores of dead bats headless lay there for god's sake what does this mean whispered sime glancing apprehensively into the black entrance beside him it means answered cairn in a low voice that my suspicion almost incredible though it seems was well founded steel yourself against the task that is before you sime we stand upon the borderland of strange horrors sime hesitated to touch any of the dead bats surveying them with an ill-concealed repugnance what kind of creature he whispered has done this one of a kind that the world has not known for many ages the most evil kind of creature conceivable a man-devil but what does he want with bats heads the synonic terrace or pyramid bat has a leaf-like appendage beside the nose a gland in this secretes a rare oil this oil is one of the ingredients of the incense which is never named in the magical writings sime shuddered here said dr cairn proffering a flask this is only the overture no nerves the other nodded shortly and poured out a peg of brandy now said dr cairn shall i go ahead as you like replied sime quietly and again quite master of himself look out for snakes i will carry the light and you can keep yours handy in case you may need it dr cairn drew himself up into the entrance the passage was less than four feet high and generations of sandstorms had polished its sloping granite floor so as to render it impossible to descend except by resting one's hands on the roof above and lowering one's self foot by foot a passage of this description descending at a sharp angle for over two hundred feet is not particularly easy to negotiate and progress was slow dr cairn at every five yards or so would stop and with the pocket lamp which he carried would examine the sandy floor and the crevices between the huge blocks composing the passage in quest of those faint tracks which warn the traveller that a serpent has recently passed that way then replacing his lamp he would proceed sime followed in like manner employing only one hand to support himself and with the other constantly directing the ray of his pocket-torch past his companion and down into the blackness beneath out in the desert the atmosphere had been sufficiently hot but now with every step it grew hotter and hotter that indescribable smell as of a decay begun in remote ages that rises with the impalpable dust in these mysterious labyrinths of ancient egypt which never know the light of day rose stiflingly until at some forty or fifty feet below the level of the sand outside respiration became difficult and the two paused bathed in perspiration and gasping for air another thirty or forty feet panted sime and we shall be in the level passage there is a sort of low artificial cavern there you may remember where although we cannot stand upright we can sit and rest for a few moments speech was exhausting and no further words were exchanged until the bottom of the slope was reached and the combined lights of the two pocket lamps showed them that they had reached a tiny chamber irregularly hewn in the living rock this also was less than four feet high but its jagged floor being level they were enabled to pause here for a while do you notice something unfamiliar in the smell of the place dr cairn was the speaker sime nodded wiping the perspiration from his face the while it was bad enough when i came here before he said hoarsely it is terrible work for a heavy man but to-night it seems to be reeking i have smelt nothing like it in my life correct replied dr cairn grimly i trust that once clear of this place you will never smell it again what is it it is the incense was the reply come the worst of our task is before us yet the continuation of the passage now showed as an opening no more than fifteen to seventeen inches high it was necessary therefore to lie prone upon the rubbish of the floor and to proceed serpent fashion one could not even employ one's knees so low was the roof but was compelled to progress by clutching at the irregularities in the wall 
and by digging the elbows into the splintered stones one crawled upon. For three yards or so they proceeded thus. Then Dr. Cairn lay suddenly still. "'What is it?' whispered Syme. A threat of panic was in his voice. He dared not conjecture what would happen if either should be overcome in that evil-smelling burrow deep in the bowels of the ancient building. At that moment it seemed to him absurdly enough that the weight of the giant pile rested upon his back, was crushing him, pressing the life out from his body as he lay there prone, with his eyes fixed upon the rubber soles of Dr. Cairn's shoes directly in front of him. "'Do not speak again. Proceed as quietly as possible, and pray heaven we are not expected.' Syme understood. With a malignant enemy before them, this hole in the rock through which they crawled was a certain death-trap. He thought of the headless bats, and of how he, in crawling out into the shaft ahead, must lay himself open to a similar fate. Dr. Cairn moved slowly onward. Despite their anxiety to avoid noise, neither he nor his companion could control their heavy breathing. Both were panting for air. The temperature was now deathly. A candle would scarcely have burnt in the vitiated air, and above that odor of ancient rottenness which all explorers of the monuments of Egypt know, rose that other indescribable odor which seemed to stifle one's very soul. Dr. Cairn stopped again. Syme knew, having performed this journey before, that his companion must have reached the end of the passage, that he must be lying peering out into the shaft for which they were making. He extinguished his lamp. Again Dr. Cairn moved forward. Stretching out his hand, Syme found only emptiness. He wriggled forward, in turn, rapidly, all the time groping with his fingers, then— "'Take my hand,' came a whisper. "'Another two feet, and you can stand upright.' He proceeded, grasped the hand which was extended to him in the impenetrable darkness, and, panting, temporarily exhausted, rose upright beside Dr. Cairn, and stretched his cramped limbs. Side by side they stood, mantled about in such a darkness as cannot be described, in such a silence as dwellers in the busy world cannot conceive, in such an atmosphere of horror that only a man morally and physically brave could have retained his composure. Dr. Cairn bent to Syme's ear. "'We must have the light for the ascent,' he whispered. "'Have your pistol ready. I am about to press the button of the lamp.' A shaft of white light shone suddenly up the rocky sides of the pit in which they stood, and lost itself in the gloom of the chamber above. "'On to my shoulders,' jerked Syme. "'You are lighter than I. Then, as soon as you can reach, place your lamp on the floor above and mount up beside it. I will follow.' Dr. Cairn, taking advantage of the rugged walls and of the blocks of stone amid which they stood, mounted upon Syme's shoulders. "'Could you carry your revolver in your teeth?' asked the latter. I think you might hold it by the trigger-guard. I propose to do so, replied Dr. Cairn grimly. Stand fast. Gradually he rose upon the other's shoulders, then placing his foot in a cranny of the rock, and with his left hand grasping a protruding fragment above, he mounted yet higher, all the time holding the lighted lamp in his right hand. Upward he extended his arms, and upward until he could place the lamp upon the ledge above his head where its white beam shone across the top of the shaft. "'Mind it does not fall,' panted Syme, craning his head upward to watch these operations. Dr. Cairn, whose strength and agility were wonderful, twisted around sideways and succeeded in placing his foot on a ledge of stone on the opposite side of the shaft. Resting his weight upon this, he extended his hand to the lip of the opening and drew himself up to the top, where he crouched fully in the light of the lamp. Then, wedging his foot into a crevice a little below him, he reached out his hand to Syme. The latter, following much the same course as his companion, seized the extended hand and soon found himself beside Dr. Cairn. Impetuously he snatched out his own lamp and shone its beams about the weird apartment in which they found themselves, the so-called King's Chamber of the Pyramid. Right and left leapt the searching rays, touching the ends of the wooden beams, which, practically fossilized by long contact with the rock, still survive in that sepulchral place. Above and below and all around he directed the light, upon the litter covering the rock floor, upon the blocks of the higher walls, upon the frowning roof. They were in the king's chamber. End of chapter 18, read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California.
Chapter Nineteen of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer. Anthropomancy. There is no one here. Syme looked about the place excitedly. Fortunately for us, answered Dr. Cairn. He breathed rather heavily yet with his exertions, and, moreover, the air of the chamber was disgusting. But otherwise he was perfectly calm, although his face was pale and bathed in perspiration. Make as little noise as possible. Syme, who now that the place proved to be empty, began to cast off that dread which had possessed him in the passageway, found something ominous in the words. Dr. Cairn, stepping carefully over the rubbish of the floor, advanced to the east corner of the chamber, waving his companion to follow. Side by side they stood there. "'Do you notice that the abominable smell of the incense is more overpowering here than anywhere?' Syme nodded. "'You are right. What does that mean?' Dr. Cairn directed the ray of light down behind a little mound of rubbish into a corner of the wall. "'It means,' he said, with a subdued expression of excitement, "'that we have got to crawl in there.' Syme stifled an exclamation. One of the blocks of the bottom tier was missing, a fact which he had not detected before it by reason of the presence of the mound of rubbish before the opening. "'Silence again,' whispered Dr. Cairn. He lay down flat, and without hesitation crept into the gap. As his feet disappeared, Syme followed. Here it was possible to crawl upon hands and knees. The passage was formed of square stone blocks. It was but three yards or so in length, then it suddenly turned upward at a tremendous angle of about one in four. Square footholds were cut in the lower face. The smell of incense was almost unbearable. Dr. Cairn bent to Syme's ear. "'Not a word now,' he said. "'No light. Pistol ready.' He began to mount. Syme, following, counted the steps. When they had mounted sixty, he knew that they must have come close to the top of the original mastaba, and close to the first stage of the pyramid. Despite the shaft beneath, there was little danger of falling, for one could lean back against the wall while seeking for the foothold above. Dr. Cairn mounted very slowly, fearful of striking his head upon some obstacle. Then on the seventieth step he found that he could thrust his foot forward, and that no obstruction met his knee. They had reached a horizontal passage. Very softly he whispered back to Syme, "'Take my hand. I have reached the top.' They entered the passage. The heavy, sickly, sweet odour almost overpowered them. But grimly set upon their purpose, they, after one moment of hesitancy, crept on. A fitful light rose and fell ahead of them. It gleamed upon the polished walls of the corridor in which they now found themselves that inexplicable light burning in a place which had known no light since the dim ages of the early pharaohs. The events of that incredible night had afforded no such emotion as this. This was the crowning wonder, and, in its dreadful mystery, the crowning terror of Midam. When first that lambent light played upon the walls of the passage, both stopped, stricken motionless with fear and amazement. Syme, who would have been prepared to swear that the Midam Pyramid contained no apartment other than the king's chamber, now was past mere wonder, past conjecture. But he could still fear. Dr. Cairn, although he had anticipated this, temporarily also fell a victim to the supernatural character of the phenomenon. They advanced. They looked into a square chamber of about the same size as the king's chamber. In fact, although they did not realize it until later, this second apartment, no doubt, was situated directly above the first. The only light was that of a fire burning in a tripod, and by means of this illumination which rose and fell in a strange manner, it was possible to perceive the details of the place. But, indeed, at the moment they were not concerned with these. They had eyes only for the black-robed figure beside the tripod. It was that of a man who stood with his back towards them, and he chanted monotonously in a tongue unfamiliar to Syme. At certain points in his chant he would raise his arms in such a way that 
clad in the black robe he assumed the appearance of a gigantic bat each time that he acted thus the fire in the tripod as if fanned into new life would leap up casting a hellish glare about the place then as the chanter dropped his arms again the flame would drop also a cloud of reddish vapour flowed low in the apartment there were a number of curiously shaped vessels upon the floor and against the farther wall only rendered visible when the flames leapt high was some motionless white object apparently hung from the roof dr cairn drew a hissing breath and grasped sime's wrist we are too late he said strangely he spoke at a moment when his companion peering through the ruddy gloom of the place had been endeavouring more clearly to perceive that ominous shape which hung horrible in the shadow he spoke too at a moment when the man in the black robe raised his arms when as if obedient to his will the flames leapt up fitfully although sime could not be sure of what they saw the recollection came to him of words recently spoken by dr cairn he remembered the story of julian the apostate julian the emperor the necromancer he remembered what had been found in the temple of the moon after julian's death he remembered that lady lashmore and thereupon he experienced such a nausea that but for the fact that dr cairn gripped him he must have fallen tutored in a materialistic school he could not even now admit that such monstrous things could be with a necromancer operation taking place before his eyes with the unholy perfume of the secret incense all but suffocating him with the dreadful oracle dully gleaming in the shadows of that temple of evil his reason would not accept the evidences any man of the ancient world of the middle ages would have known that he looked upon a professed wizard upon a magician who according to one of the most ancient formulae known to mankind was seeking to question the dead respecting the living but how many modern men are there capable of realizing such a circumstance how many who would accept the statement that such operations are still performed not only in the east but in europe how many who witnessing this mass of satan would accept it for verity would not deny the evidence of their very senses he could not believe such an orgy of wickedness possible a pagan emperor might have been capable of these things but to-day wondrous is our faith in the virtue of to-day am i mad he whispered hoarsely or a thinly veiled shape seemed to float out from that still form in the shadows it assumed definite outlines it became a woman beautiful with a beauty that could only be described as awful she wore upon her brow the uraeus of ancient egyptian royalty her sole garment was a robe of finest gauze like a cloud like a vision she floated into the light cast by the tripod a voice a voice which seemed to come from a vast distance from somewhere outside the mighty granite walls of that unholy place spoke the language was unknown to sign but the fierce hand grip upon his wrist grew fiercer that dead tongue that language unspoken since the dawn of christianity was known to the man who had been the companion of sir michael ferrara in upon sime swept a swift conviction that one could not witness such a scene as this and live and move again amongst one's fellow men in a sort of frenzy then he wrenched himself free from the detaining hand and launched a retort of modern science against the challenge of ancient sorcery raising his browning pistol he fired shot after shot at that bat-like shape which stood between himself and the tripod a thousand frightful echoes filled the chamber with a demon mockery boomed along those subterranean passages beneath and bore the conflict of sound into the hidden places of the pyramid which had known not sound for untold generations my god vaguely he became aware that dr cairn was seeking to drag him away through a cloud of smoke he saw the black-robed figure turn dream fashion he saw the pallid glistening face of anthony ferrara the long evil eyes alight like the eyes of a serpent were fixed upon him he seemed to stand amid a chaos in a mad world beyond the borders of reason beyond the dominions of god but to his stupefied mind one astounding fact found access he had fired at least seven shots at the black-robed figure 
and it was not humanly possible that all could have gone wide of their mark yet antony ferrara lived utter darkness blotted out the evil vision then there was a white light ahead and feeling that he was struggling for sanity sime managed to realize that dr cairn retreating along the passage was crying to him in a voice rising almost to a shriek to run run for his life for his salvation you should not have fired he seemed to hear unconscious of any contact with the stones although afterwards he found his knees and shins to be bleeding he was scrambling down that long sloping shaft he had a vague impression that dr cairn descending beneath him sometimes grasped his ankles and placed his feet into the footholds a continuous roaring sound filled his ears as if a great ocean were casting its storm waves against the structure around him the place seemed to rock down flat some sense of reality was returning to him now he perceived that dr cairn was urging him to crawl back along the short passage by which they had entered from the king's chamber heedless of hurt he threw himself down and pressed on a blank like the sleep of exhaustion which follows delirium came then sime found himself standing in the king's chamber dr cairn who held an electric lamp in his hand beside him and half supporting him the realities suddenly reasserting themselves i've dropped my pistol muttered sime he threw off the supporting arm and turned to that corner behind the heap of debris where was the opening through which they had entered the satanic temple no opening was visible he has closed it cried dr cairn there are six stone doors between here and the place above if he had succeeded in shutting one of them before we my god whispered sime let us get out i am nearly at the end of my tether fear lends wings and it was with something like the lightness of a bird that sime descended the shaft at the bottom onto my shoulders he cried looking up dr cairn lowered himself to the foot of the shaft you go first he said he was gasping as if nearly suffocated but retained a wonderful self-control once over into the borderland and bravery assumes a new guise the courage which can face physical danger undaunted melts in the fires of the unknown sime his breath whistling sibilantly between his clenched teeth hauled himself through the low passage with incredible speed the two worked their way arduously up the long slope they saw the blue sky above them something like a huge bat said robert cairn crawled out upon the first stage we both fired dr cairn raised his hand he lay exhausted at the foot of the mound he had lighted the incense he replied and was reciting the secret ritual i cannot explain but your shots were wasted we came too late lady lashmore until the pyramid of maydom is pulled down stone by stone the world will never know her fate sime and i have looked in at the gate of hell only the hand of god plucked us back look he pointed to sime he lay pallid with closed eyes and his hair was abundantly streaked with white End of chapter 19, read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California. Chapter 20 of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer, The Incense To Robert Cairn it seemed that the boat train would never reach Charing Cross. His restlessness was appalling. He perpetually glanced from his father, with whom he shared the compartment, to the flying landscape with its vistas of hop-poles and dr cairn although he exhibited less anxiety was nevertheless strung to the highest tension that dash from cairo homeward had been something of a fevered dream to both men to learn whilst one is searching for a malign and implacable enemy in egypt that the enemy having secretly returned to london is weaving his evil spells around some we loved the loveliest and the best is to know the meaning of ordeal in pursuit of antony ferrara the incarnation of an awful evil dr cairn had deserted his practice had left england for egypt now he was hurrying back for whilst he had sought in strange and dark places of that land of mystery for antony ferrara the latter had been darkly active in london again and again robert cairn read the letter which surely as a royal command had recalled them it was from myra duquesne one line in it had fallen upon them like a bomb had altered all their plans 
had shattered the one fragment of peace remaining to them in the eyes of robert cairn the whole universe centred around myra duquesne she was the one being in the world of whom he could not bear to think in conjunction with antony ferrara now he knew that antony ferrara was beside her was doubtless at this very moment directing those black arts of which he was master to the destruction of her mind and body perhaps of her very soul again he drew the worn envelope from his pocket and read that ominous sentence which when his eyes had first fallen upon it had blotted out the sunlight of egypt and you will be surprised to hear that anthony is back in london and is a frequent visitor here it is quite like old times raising his haggard eyes robert cairn saw that his father was watching him keep calm my boy urged the doctor it can profit us nothing it can profit myra nothing for you to shatter your nerves at a time when real trials are before you you are inviting another breakdown oh i know it is hard but for everybody's sake try to keep yourself in hand i am trying sir replied robert hollowly dr cairn nodded drumming his fingers upon his knee we must be diplomatic he continued that james saunderson proposed to return to london i had no idea i thought that myra would be far outside the black maelstrom in scotland had i suspected that saunderson would come to london i should have made other arrangements of course sir i know that but even so we could never have foreseen this dr cairn shook his head to think that whilst we have been scouring egypt from port said to assouan he has been laughing at us in london he said directly after the affair at Maidum, he must have left the country how heaven only knows that letter is three weeks old now robert cairn nodded what may have happened since what may have happened you take too gloomy a view james saunderson is a roman guardian even antony ferrara could make little headway there but myra says that ferrara is a frequent visitor and saunderson replied dr cairn with a grim smile is a scotchman rely upon his diplomacy rob myra will be safe enough god grant that she is at that silence fell between them until punctually to time the train slowed into charing cross inspired by a common anxiety dr cairn and his son were first among the passengers to pass the barrier the car was waiting for them and within five minutes of the arrival of the train they were whirling through london's traffic to the house of james saunderson it lay in that quaint backwater remote from motor-bus highways dulwich common and was a rambling red-tiled building which at some time had been a farmhouse as the big car pulled up at the gate saunderson a large-boned scotchman tawny-eyed and with his gray hair worn long and untidily came out to meet them myra duquesne stood beside him a quick blush colored her face momentarily then left it pale again indeed her pallor was alarming as robert cairn leaping from the car seized both her hands and looked into her eyes it seemed to him that the girl had almost an ethereal appearance something clutched at his heart iced his blood for myra duquesne seemed a creature scarcely belonging to the world of humanity seemed already half a spirit the light in her sweet eyes was good to see but her fragility and a certain transparency of complexion horrified him yet he knew that he must hide these fears from her and turning to mr saunderson he shook him warmly by the hand and the party of four passed by the low porch into the house in the hallway miss saunderson a typical scottish housekeeper stood beaming welcome but in the very instant of greeting her robert cairn stopped suddenly as if transfixed dr cairn also pulled up just within the door his nostrils quivering and his clear gray eyes turning right and left searching the shadows miss saunderson detected this sudden restraint is anything the matter she asked anxiously myra standing beside mr saunderson began to look frightened but dr cairn shaking off the incubus which had descended upon him forced a laugh and clapping his hand upon robert's shoulder cried wake up my boy i know it is good to be back in england again but keep your daydreaming for after lunch robert cairn forced a ghostly smile in return and the odd incident promised soon to be forgotten 
how good of you said myra as the party entered the dining-room to come right from the station to see us and you must be expected in half moon street dr cairn of course we came to see you first replied robert cairn significantly myra lowered her face and pursued that subject no further no mention was made of anthony ferrara and neither dr cairn nor his son cared to broach the subject the lunch passed off then without any reference to the very matter which had brought them there that day it was not until nearly an hour later that dr cairn and his son found themselves alone for a moment then with a furtive glance about him the doctor spoke of that which had occupied his mind to the exclusion of all else since first they had entered the house of james saunderson you noticed it rob he whispered my god it nearly choked me dr cairn nodded grimly it is all over the house he continued in every room that i have entered they are used to it and evidently do not notice it but coming in from the clean air it is abominable unclean unholy we know it continued dr cairn softly that smell of unholiness we have good reason to know it it heralded the death of sir michael ferrara it heralded the death of another with a just god in heaven can such things be it is the secret incense of ancient egypt whispered dr cairn glancing towards the open door it is the odour of that black magic which by all natural law should be buried and lost for ever in the tombs of the ancient wizards only two living men within my knowledge know the use and the hidden meaning of that perfume only one living man has ever dared to make it to use it anthony ferrara we knew he was here boy now we know that he is using his powers here something tells me that we come to the end of the fight may victory be with the just end of chapter twenty read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter twenty one of brood of the witch queen by sax romer the magician half moon street was bathed in tropical sunlight dr cairn with his hands behind him stood looking out of the window he turned to his son, who leant against the corner of the bookcase in the shadows of the big room. "'Hot enough for Egypt, Rob,' he said. Robert Cairn nodded. "'Antony Ferrara,' he replied, "'seemingly travels his own atmosphere with him. I first became acquainted with his hellish activities during a phenomenal thunderstorm. In Egypt his movements apparently corresponded with those of the Kamsian. Now he waved his hand vaguely towards the window this is egypt in london egypt is in london indeed muttered dr cairn jarman has decided that our fears are well founded you mean sir that the will antony ferrara would have an almost unassailable case in the event of of myra you mean that her share of the legacy would fall to that fiend if she if she died exactly robert cairn began to stride up and down the room clenching and unclenching his fists he was a shadow of his former self but now his cheeks were flushed and his eyes feverishly bright before heaven he cried suddenly the situation is becoming unbearable a thing more deadly than the plague is abroad here in london apart from the personal aspect of the matter of which i dare not think what do we know of ferrara's activities his record is damnable to our certain knowledge his victims are many if the murder of his adopted father sir michael was actually the first of his crimes we know of three other poor souls who beyond any shadow of doubt were launched into eternity by the black arts of this ghastly villain we do rob replied dr cairn sternly he has made attempts upon you he has made attempts upon me we owe our survival he pointed to a row of books upon a corner shelf to the knowledge which you have accumulated in half a lifetime of research in the face of science in the face of modern scepticism in the face of our belief in a benign god this creature antony ferrara has proved himself conclusively to be he is what the benighted ancients call the magician interrupted dr cairn quietly he is what was known in the middle ages as a wizard what that means exactly few modern thinkers know but i know and one day others will know meanwhile his shadow lies upon a certain house 
dr cairn shook his clenched fists in the air in some men the gesture had seemed melodramatic in him it was the expression of a soul's agony but sir he cried are we to wait inert helpless whatever he is he has a human body and there are bullets there are knives there are a hundred drugs in the british pharmacopoeia quite so answered dr cairn watching his son closely and by his own collected manner endeavouring to check the other's growing excitement i am prepared at any personal risk to crush anthony ferrara as i would crush a scorpion but where is he robert cairn groaned dropping into the big red leathern armchair and burying his face in his hands our position is maddening continued the elder man we know that antony ferrara visits mr saunderson's house we know that he is laughing at our vain attempts to trap him crowning comedy of all saunderson does not know the truth he is not the type of man who could ever understand in fact we dare not tell him and we dare not tell myra the result is that those whom we would protect unwittingly are working against us and against themselves that perfume burst out robert cairn that hell's incense which loads the atmosphere of saunderson's house to think that we know what it means that we know what it means perhaps i know even better than you do rob the occult uses of perfume are not understood nowadays but you from experience know that certain perfumes have occult uses at the pyramid of my dome in egypt antony ferrara dared and the just god did not strike him dead to make a certain incense it was often made in the remote past and a portion of it probably in a jar hermetically sealed had come into his possession i once detected its dreadful odour in his rooms in london had you asked me prior to that occasion if any of the hellish stuff had survived to the present day i should most emphatically have said no i should have been wrong ferrara had some he used it all and went to the midam pyramid to renew his stock robert cairn was listening intently all this brings me back to a point which i have touched upon before sir he said to my certain knowledge the late sir michael and yourself have delved into the black mysteries of egypt more deeply than any men of the present century yet antony ferrara little more than a boy has mastered secrets which you after years of research have failed to grasp what does this mean sir dr cairn again locking his hands behind him stared out of the window he is not an ordinary man continued his son he is supernormal and supernaturally wicked you have admitted indeed it was evident that he is merely the adopted son of the late sir michael now that we have entered upon the final struggle for i feel that this is so i will ask you again who is antony ferrara dr cairn spun around upon the speaker his grey eyes were very bright there is one little obstacle he answered which has deterred me from telling you what you have asked so often although and you have had dreadful opportunities to peer behind the veil you will find it hard to believe i hope very shortly to be able to answer that question and to tell you who antony ferrara really is robert cairn beat his fist upon the arm of the chair i sometimes wonder he said that either of us has remained sane oh what does it mean what can we do what can we do we must watch rob to enlist the services of saunderson would be almost impossible he lives in his orchid houses they are his world in matters of ordinary life i can thrust him above most men but in this he shrugged his shoulders could we suggest to him a reason any reason but the real one why he should refuse to receive ferrara it might destroy our last chance but sir cried robert wildly it amounts to this we are using myra as a lure in order to save her rob simply in order to save her retorted dr cairn sternly how ill she looks groaned the other how pale and worn there are great shadows under her eyes oh i cannot bear to think about her when was he last there apparently some ten days ago you may depend upon him to be aware of our return he will not come there again sir but there are other ways in which he might reach her does he not command a whole shadow army and mr saunderson is entirely unsuspicious and myra thinks of the fiend as a brother yet she has never once spoken of him i wonder dr cairn sat deep in reflection 
Suddenly he took out his watch. "'Go around now,' he said. "'You will be in time for lunch, and remain there till I come. "'From today onward, although actually your health does not permit of the strain, "'we must watch, watch night and day.'" End of chapter 21 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 22 of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer Myra Myra Duquesne came under an arch of roses to the wooden seat where Robert Cairn awaited her. In her plain white linen frock, with the sun in her hair and her eyes looking unnaturally large, owing to the pallor of her beautiful face, she seemed to the man who rose to greet her an ethereal creature, but lightly linked to the flesh and blood world. An impulse which had possessed him often enough before, but which hitherto he had suppressed, suddenly possessed him anew, set his heart beating, and filled his veins with fire. As a soft blush spread over the girl's pale cheeks, and with a sort of timidity she held out her hand, he leapt to his feet, threw his arms around her, and kissed her, kissed her eyes, her hair, her lips. There was a moment of frightened hesitancy, and then she had resigned herself to this sort of savage tenderness which was better in its very brutality than any caress she had ever known, which thrilled her with a glorious joy such as, she realized now, she had dreamt of and lacked and wanted, which was a harborage to which she came, blushing, confused, but glad, conquered, and happy in the thrall of that exquisite slavery. "'Myra,' he whispered, "'Myra, have I frightened you? Will you forgive me?' She nodded her head quickly and nestled upon his shoulder. "'I could wait no longer,' he murmured in her ear. "'Words seemed unnecessary. I just wanted you. You are everything in the world, and,' he concluded simply, "'I took you.' She whispered his name very softly. What a serenity there is in such a moment! What a glow of secure happiness, of immunity from the pains and sorrows of the world! Robert Cairn, his arms about this girl, who, from his early boyhood, had been his ideal of womanhood, of love, and of all that love meant, forgot those things which had shaken his life and brought him to the threshold of death, forgot those evidences of illness which marred the once glorious beauty of the girl, forgot the black menace of the future, forgot the wizard enemy whose hand was stretched over that house and that garden, and was merely happy. But this paroxysm of gladness, which Eliphas Levi, last of the adepts, has so marvelously analyzed in one of his works, is of short duration, as are all joys. It is needless to recount here the broken sentences punctuated with those first kisses which sweeten the memory of old age, that now passed for conversation, and which lovers have believed to be conversation since the world began. As dusk creeps over a glorious landscape, so the shadow of Antony Ferrara crept over the happiness of these two. Gradually that shadow fell between them and the sun, the grim thing which loomed big in the lives of them both, refused any longer to be ignored. Robert Cairn, his arm about the girl's waist, broached the hated subject. "'When did you last see Ferrara?' Myra looked up suddenly. "'Over a week? Nearly a fortnight ago.' ah cairn noted that the girl spoke of ferrara with an odd sort of restraint for which he was at a loss to account myra had always regarded her guardian's adopted son in the light of a brother therefore her present attitude was all the more singular you did not expect him to return to england so soon he asked i had no idea that he was in england said myra until he walked in here one day i was glad to see him then and should you not be glad to see him now inquired cairn eagerly myra her head lowered deliberately pressed out a crease in her white skirt one day last week she replied slowly he came here and acted strangely in what way jerked cairn he pointed out to me that actually we he and i were in no way related well you know how i have always liked antony I have always thought of him as my brother. Again she hesitated, and a troubled expression crept over her pale face. Karen raised his arm and clasped it about her shoulders. "'Tell me about it,' he whispered reassuringly. "'Well,' continued Myra, in evident confusion, "'his behavior became embarrassing, and suddenly 
he asked me if i could ever love him not as a brother but i understand said cairn grimly and you replied for some time i could not reply at all i was so surprised and so horrified i cannot explain how i felt about it but it seemed horrible it seemed horrible but of course you told him i told him that i could never be fond of him in any different way that i could never think of it and although i endeavoured to avoid hurting his feelings he took it very badly he said in such a queer choking voice that he was going away away from england yes and he made a strange request what was it in the circumstances you see i felt sorry for him i did not like to refuse him it was only a trifling thing he asked for a lock of my hair a lock of your hair and you i told you that i did not like to refuse and i let him snip off a tiny piece with a pair of pocket scissors which he had are you angry of course not you were almost brought up together you then she paused he seemed to change suddenly i found myself afraid dreadfully afraid of ferrara not of antony exactly but what is the good of my trying to explain a most awful dread seized me his face was no longer the face that i have always known something her voice trembled and she seemed disposed to leave the sentence unfinished then something evil sinister had come into it and since then said cairn you have not seen him he has not been here since then no cairn his hands resting upon the girl's shoulders leant back in the seat and looked into her troubled eyes with a kind of sad scrutiny you have not been fretting about him myra shook her head yet you look as though something were troubling you this house he indicated the low-lying garden with a certain irritation is not healthily situated this place lies in a valley look at the rank grass and there are mosquitoes everywhere you do not look well myra the girl smiled a little wistful smile but i was so tired of scotland she said you do not know how i looked forward to london again i must admit though that i was in better health there i was quite ashamed of my dairy-maid appearance you have nothing to amuse you here said cairn tenderly no company for mr saunderson only lives for his orchids they are very fascinating said myra dreamily i too have felt their glamour i am the only member of the household whom he allows amongst his orchids perhaps you spend too much time there interrupted cairn that superheated artificial atmosphere myra shook her head playfully patting his arm there is nothing in the world the matter with me she said almost in her old bright manner now that you are back i do not approve of orchids jerked cairn doggedly they are parodies of what a flower should be place an odontoglossum beside a rose and what a distorted unholy thing it looks unholy laughed myra unholy yes they are products of feverish swamps and deathly jungles i hate orchids the atmosphere of an orchid house cannot possibly be clean and healthy one might as well spend one's time in a bacteriological laboratory myra shook her head with affected seriousness you must not let mr saunderson hear you she said his orchids are his children their very mystery enthralls him and really it is most fascinating to look at one of those shapeless bulbs and to speculate upon what kind of bloom it will produce is almost as thrilling as reading a sensational novel he has one growing now it will bloom some time this week about which he is frantically excited where did he get it asked cairn without interest he bought it from a man who had almost certainly stolen it there were six bulbs in the parcel only two have lived and one of these is much more advanced than the other it is so high she held out her hand indicating a height of some three feet from the ground it has not flowered yet no but the buds huge smooth egg-shaped things seem on the point of bursting at any moment we call it the mystery and it is my special care mr saunderson has shown me how to attend to its simple needs and if it proves to be a new species which is almost certain he is going to exhibit it and name it after me shall you be proud of having an orchid named after after my wife cairn concluded seizing her hands 
I could never be more proud of you than I am already. End of chapter 22 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 23 of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sex Romer The Face in the Orchid House Dr. Cairn walked to the window with its old-fashioned leaded panes. A lamp stood by the bedside, and he had tilted the shade so that it shone upon the pale face of the patient, Myra Duquesne. Two days had wrought a dreadful change in her. She lay with closed eyes and sunken face upon which ominous shadows played. Her respiration was imperceptible. The reputation of Dr. Bruce Cairn was a well-deserved one, but this case puzzled him. He knew that Myra Duquesne was dying before his eyes. He could still see the agonized face of his son Robert, who at that moment was waiting, filled with intolerable suspense, downstairs in Mr. Saunderson's study. But with all he was helpless. He looked out from the rose-entwined casement across the shrubbery to where the moonlight glittered among the trees. Those were the orchid houses, and with his back to the bed Dr. Cairn stood for long thoughtfully watching the distant gleams of reflected light. Craig Fenton and Sir Elwyn Groves, with whom he had been consulting, were but just gone. The nature of Myra Duquesne's illness had utterly puzzled them, and they had left mystified. Downstairs Robert Cairn was pacing the study, wondering if his reason would survive with his final blow which threatened. He knew, and his father knew, that a sinister something underlay this strange illness, an illness which had commenced on the day that Antony Ferrara had last visited the house. The evening was unsufferably hot. Not a breeze stirred in the leaves, and despite open windows the air of the room was heavy and lifeless. A faint perfume, having a sort of sweetness, but which yet was unutterably revolting, made itself perceptible to the nostrils. Apparently it had pervaded the house by slow degrees. The occupants were so used to it that they did not notice it at all. Dr. Cairn had busied himself that evening in the sick-room, burning some pungent preparation to the amazement of the nurse and of the consultants. Now the biting fumes of his pastilles had all been wafted out of the window, and the faint sweet smell was as noticeable as ever. Not a sound broke the silence of the house, and when the nurse quietly opened the door and entered, Dr. Cairn was still standing staring thoughtfully out of the window in the direction of the orchid-houses. He turned, and walking back to the bedside, bent over the patient. Her face was like a white mask. She was quite unconscious, and so far as he could see, showed no change for either better or worse. But her pulse was slightly more feeble, and the doctor suppressed a groan of despair, for this mysterious progressive weakness could only have one end. All his experience told him that unless something could be done, and every expedient thus far attempted had proved futile, Myra Duquesne would die about dawn. He turned on his heel and strode from the room, whispering a few words of instruction to the nurse. Descending the stairs, he passed the closed study door, not daring to think of his son who waited within, and entered the dining-room. A single lamp burnt there, and the gaunt figure of Mr. Saunderson was outlined dimly where he sat in the window-seat. Crombie, the gardener, stood by the table. "'Now, Crombie,' said Dr. Cairn, quietly closing the door behind him, "'what is this story about the orchid-houses, and why did you not mention it before?' The man stared persistently into the shadows of the room, avoiding Dr. Cairn's glance. "'Since he has had the courage to own up,' interrupted Mr. Saunderson, i have overlooked the matter but he was afraid to speak before because he had no business to be in the orchid houses his voice grew suddenly fierce he knows it well enough i know sir that you don't want me to interfere with the orchids replied the man but i only ventured in because i thought i saw a light moving there rubbish snapped mr saunderson pardon me saunderson said dr cairn but a matter of more importance than the welfare of all the orchids in the world is under consideration now saunderson coughed dryly you are right cairn he said i shouldn't have lost my temper for such a trifle at a time like this tell your own tale crombie i won't interrupt it was last night then continued the man i was standing at the door of my cottage smoking a pipe before turning in when i saw a faint light moving over by the orchid houses a reflection of the moon muttered saunderson 
i am sorry go on crombie i knew that some of the orchids were very valuable and i thought there would not be time to call you also i did not want to worry you knowing that you had worry enough already so i knocked out my pipe and put it in my pocket and went through the shrubbery i saw the light again it seemed to be moving from the first house into the second i couldn't see what it was was it like a candle or a pocket lamp jerked dr cairn nothing like that sir a softer light more like a glow-worm but much brighter i went around and tried the door and it was locked then i remembered the door at the other end then i cut round by the path between the houses and the wall so that i had no chance to see the light again until i got to the other door i found this unlocked there was a close kind of smell in there sir and the air was very hot naturally it was hot interrupted saunderson i mean much hotter than it should have been it was like an oven and the smell was stifling what smell asked dr cairn can you describe it excuse me sir but i seem to notice it here in this room to-night and i think i noticed it about the place before never so strong as in the orchid houses go on said dr cairn i went through the first house and saw nothing the shadow of the wall prevented the moonlight from shining in there but just as i was about to enter the middle house i thought i saw a face what do you mean you thought you saw snapped mr saunderson i mean sir that it was so horrible and so strange that i could not believe it was real which was one of the reasons why i did not speak before it reminded me of the face of a gentleman i have seen here mr ferrara dr cairn stifled an exclamation but in other ways it was quite unlike the gentleman in some ways it was more like the face of a woman a very bad woman it had a sort of bluish light on it but where it could have come from i don't know it seemed to be smiling and two bright eyes looked straight out at me crombie stopped raising his hand to his head confusedly i could see nothing but just his face low down as if the person it belonged to was crouching on the floor and there was a tall plant of some kind just beside it well said dr cairn go on what did you do i turned to run confessed the man if you had seen that horrible face you would understand how frightened i was then when i got to the door i looked back i hope you had closed the door behind you snapped saunderson never mind that never mind that interrupted dr cairn i had closed the door behind me yes sir but just as i was going to open it again i took a quick glance back and the face had gone i came out and i was walking over the lawn wondering whether i should tell you when it occurred to me that i hadn't noticed whether the key had been left in or not did you go back to see asked dr cairn i didn't want to admitted crombie but i did and well the door was locked sir so you concluded that your imagination had been playing you tricks said saunderson grimly in my opinion you were right dr cairn dropped into an armchair all right crombie that will do crombie with a mumbled good night gentlemen turned and left the room why are you worrying about this matter inquired saunderson when the door had closed at a time like the present never mind replied dr cairn wearily i must return to half moon street now but i shall be back within an hour with no other word to saunderson he stood up and walked out to the hall he rapped at the study door and it was instantly opened by robert cairn no spoken word was necessary the burning question could be read in his two bright eyes dr cairn laid his hand upon his son's shoulder i won't excite false hopes robs he said huskily i'm going back to the house and i want you to come with me robert cairn turned his head aside groaning aloud but his father grasped him by the arm and together they left the house of shadows entered the car which waited at the gate and without exchanging a word en route came to half moon street End of chapter twenty three read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter twenty four of brood of the witch queen by sax romer flowering of the lotus dr cairn led the way into the library switching on the reading lamp upon the large table his son stood just within the doorway his arms folded and his chin upon his breast the doctor sat down at the table watching the other suddenly robert spoke 
is it possible sir is it possible his voice was barely audible that her illness can in any way be due to the orchids dr cairn frowned thoughtfully what do you mean exactly he asked orchids are mysterious things they come from places where there are strange and dreadful diseases is it not possible that they may convey some sort of contagion concluded dr cairn it is a point that i have seen raised certainly but nothing of the sort has ever been established i have heard something to-night though which what have you heard sir asked his son eagerly stepping forward to the table never mind at the moment rob let me think he rested his elbow upon the table and his chin in his hand his professional instincts had told him that unless something could be done something which the highest medical skill in london had thus far been unable to devise myra decayne had but four hours to live somewhere in his mind a memory lurked evasive taunting him this wild suggestion of his son's that the girl's illness might be due in some way to her contact with the orchids was in part responsible for this confused memory but it seemed to be associated too with the story of crombie the gardener and with antony ferrara he felt that somewhere in the darkness surrounding him there was a speck of light if he could but turn in the right direction to see it so whilst robert cairn walked restlessly about the big room the doctor sat with his chin resting in the palm of his hand seeking to concentrate his mind upon that vague memory which defied him whilst the hand of the library clock crept from twelve towards one whilst he knew that the faint life in myra duquesne was slowly ebbing away in response to some mysterious condition utterly outside his experience distant clocks chimed one three hours only robert cairn began to beat his fist into the palm of his left hand convulsively yet his father did not stir but sat there a black shadowed wrinkle between his brows by god the doctor sprang to his feet and with feverish haste began to fumble amongst a bunch of keys what is it sir what is it the doctor unlocked the drawer of the big table and drew out a thick manuscript written in small and exquisitely neat characters he placed it under the lamp and rapidly began to turn the pages it is hope rob he said with quiet self-possession robert cairn came round the table and leant over his father's shoulder sir michael ferrara's writing his unpublished book rob we were to have completed it together but death claimed him and in view of the contents i perhaps superstitiously decided to suppress it ah he placed the point of his finger upon a carefully drawn sketch designed to illustrate the text it was evidently a careful copy from the ancient egyptian it represented a row of priestesses each having her hair plaited in a thick queue standing before a priest armed with a pair of scissors in the centre of the drawing was an altar upon which stood vases of flowers and upon the right ranked a row of mummies corresponding in number with the priestesses upon the left by god repeated dr cairn we were both wrong we were both wrong what do you mean sir for heaven's sake what do you mean this drawing replied dr cairn was copied from the wall of a certain tomb now reclosed since we knew that the tomb was that of one of the greatest wizards who ever lived in egypt we knew also that the inscription had some magical significance we knew that the flowers represented here were a species of the extinct sacred lotus all our researches did not avail us to discover for what purpose or by what means these flowers were cultivated nor could we determine the meaning of the cutting off he ran his fingers over the sketch of the priestess's hair by the high priest of the goddess what goddess sir a goddess rob of which egyptology knows nothing a mystical religion the existence of which has been vaguely suspected by a living french savant but this is no time dr cairn closed the manuscript replaced it and relocked the drawer he glanced at the clock a quarter past one he said come rob without hesitation his son followed him from the house the car was waiting and shortly they were speeding through the deserted streets back to the house where death in a strange guise was beckoning to myra duquesne as the car started do you know asked dr cairn if saunderson has bought any orchids quite recently i mean yes replied his son dully he bought a small parcel only a fortnight ago a fortnight cried dr cairn excitedly you are sure of that you mean that the purchase was made since ferrara 
ceased to visit the house yes why it must have been the very day after dr cairn clearly was labouring under tremendous excitement where did he buy these orchids he asked evenly from someone who came to the house someone he had never dealt with before the doctor his hands resting upon his knees was rapidly drumming with his fingers and did he cultivate them two only proved successful one is on the point of blooming if it is not blooming already he calls it the mystery at that the doctor's excitement overcame him suddenly leaning out of the window he shouted to the chauffeur quicker quicker never mind risks keep on top speed what is it sir cried his son heavens what is it did you say that it might have bloomed rob myra robert cairn swallowed noisily told me three days ago that it was expected to bloom before the end of the week what is it like a thing four feet high with huge egg-shaped bulbs merciful god grant that we are in time whispered dr cairn i could believe once more in the justice of heaven if the great knowledge of sir michael ferrara should prove to be the weapon to destroy the fiend whom we raised he and i may we be forgiven robert cairn's excitement was dreadful can you tell me nothing he cried what do you hope what do you fear don't ask me rob replied his father you will know within five minutes the car indeed was leaping along the dark suburban roads at a speed little below that of an express train corners the chauffeur negotiated in racing fashion so that at times two wheels thrashed the empty air and once or twice the big car swung round as upon a pivot only to recover again in response to the skilled tactics of the driver they roared down the sloping narrow lane to the gate of mr saunderson's house with a noise like the coming of a great storm and were nearly hurled from their seats when the brakes were applied and the car brought to a standstill dr cairn leapt out pushed open the gate and ran up to the house his son closely following there was a light in the hall and miss saunderson who had expected them and had heard their stormy approach already held the door open in the hall wait here one moment said dr cairn ignoring saunderson who had come out from the library he ran upstairs a minute later his face very pale he came running down again she is worse began saunderson but give me the key of the orchid house said dr cairn tersely orchid house don't hesitate don't waste a second give me the key saunderson's expression showed that he thought dr cairn to be mad but nevertheless he plunged his hand into his pocket and pulled out a key ring dr cairn snatched it in a flash which key he snapped the chub but follow me rob down the hall he raced his son beside him and mr saunderson following more slowly out into the garden he went and over the lawn towards the shrubbery the orchid houses lay in dense shadow but the doctor almost threw himself against the door strike a match he panted then never mind i have it the door flew open with a bang a sickly perfume swept out to them matches matches rob this way they went stumbling in robert cairn took out a box of matches and struck one his father was further along in the centre of the building your knife boy quick quick as the dim light crept along the aisle between the orchids robert cairn saw his father's horror-stricken face and saw a vivid green plant growing in a sort of tub before which the doctor stood four huge smooth egg-shaped bulbs grew upon the leafless stems two of them were on the point of opening and one already showed a delicious rosy flush about its apex dr cairn grasped the knife which robert tremblingly offered him the match went out there was a sound of hacking a soft swishing and a dull thud upon the tiled floor as another match fluttered into brief life the mysterious orchid severed just above the soil fell from the tub dr cairn stamped the swelling buds under his feet a profusion of colourless sap was pouring out on the floor above the intoxicating odour of the place a smell like that of blood made itself perceptible the second match went out another dr cairn's voice rose barely above a whisper with fingers quivering robert cairn managed to light a third match his father from a second tub tore out a smaller plant and ground its soft tentacles beneath his feet the place smelt like an operating theatre the doctor swayed dizzily as the third match became extinguished clutching at his son for support her life was in it boy he whispered she would have died in the hour that it bloomed the priestesses were consecrated to this let me get into the air mr saunderson silent with amazement met them don't speak said dr cairn to him 
look at the dead stems of your mystery you will find a thread of bright hair in the heart of each dr cairn opened the door of the sick room and beckoned to his son who haggard trembling waited upon the landing come in boy he said softly and thank god robert cairn on tiptoe entered myra duquesne pathetically pale but with that dreadful ominous shadow gone from her face turned her wistful eyes towards the door and their wistfulness became gladness rob she sighed and stretched out her arms end of chapter twenty four read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter twenty five of brood of the witch queen by sax romer cairn meets ferrara not the least of the trials which robert cairn experienced during the time that he and his father were warring with their supernaturally equipped opponent was that of preserving silence upon this matter which loomed so large in his mind and which already had changed the course of his life sometimes he met men who knew ferrara but who knew him only as a man about town of somewhat evil reputation yet even to these he dared not confide what he knew of the true ferrara undoubtedly they would have deemed him mad had he spoken of the knowledge and of the deeds of this uncanny this fiendish being how would they have listened to him had he sought to tell them of the den of spiders in port said of the bats of Maidum, of the secret incense and of how it was made of the numberless murders and atrocities wrought by means not human which stood to the account of this adopted son of the late sir michael ferrara so excepting his father he had no confidant for above all it was necessary to keep the truth from myra duquesne from myra around whom his world circled but who yet thought of the dreadful being who wielded the sorcery of forgotten ages as a brother whilst myra lay ill not yet recovered from the ghastly attack made upon her life by the man whom she trusted whilst having painful evidence of his presence in london dr cairn and himself vainly sought for antony ferrara whilst any night might bring some unholy visitant to his rooms obedient to the will of this modern wizard whilst these fears anxieties doubts and surmises danced impish through his brain it was all but impossible to pursue with success his vocation of journalism yet for many reasons it was necessary that he should do so and so he was employed upon a series of articles which were the outcome of his recent visit to egypt his editor having given him that work as being less exacting than that which properly falls to the lot of the fleet street copy hunter he left his rooms about three o'clock in the afternoon in order to seek in the british museum library a reference which he lacked and he derived some little satisfaction from the fact that at his present work he was not called upon to endue the armour of respectability pipe in mouth he made his way across the strand towards bloomsbury as he walked up the steps crossed the hallway and passed in beneath the dome of the reading-room he wondered if amid these mountains of erudition surrounding him there was any wisdom so strange and so awful as that of antony ferrara he soon found the information for which he was looking and having copied it into his notebook he left the reading-room then as he was recrossing the hall near the foot of the principal staircase he paused he found himself possessed by a sudden desire to visit the egyptian rooms upstairs he had several times inspected the exhibits in those apartments but never since his return from the land to whose ancient civilization they bore witness cairn was not pressed for time in these days therefore he turned and passed slowly up the stairs there were but few visitors to the grove of mummies that afternoon when he entered the first room he found a small group of tourists passing idly from case to case but on entering the second he saw that he had the apartment to himself he remembered that his father had mentioned on one occasion that there was a ring in this room which had belonged to the witch queen robert cairn wondered in which of the cases it was exhibited and by what means he should be enabled to recognize it bending over a case containing scarabs and other amulets 
many set in rings he began to read the inscriptions upon the little tickets placed beneath some of them but none answered to the description neither the ticketed nor the unticketed a second case he examined with like results but on passing to a third in an angle near the door his gaze immediately lighted upon a gold ring set with a strange green stone engraved in a peculiar way it bore no ticket yet as robert cairn eagerly bent over it he knew beyond the possibility of doubt that this was the ring of the witch queen where had he seen it or its duplicate with his eyes fixed upon the gleaming stone he sought to remember that he had seen this ring before or one exactly like it he knew but strangely enough he was unable to determine where and upon what occasion so his hands resting upon the case he leant peering down at the singular gem and as he stood thus frowning in the effort of recollection a dull white hand having long tapered fingers glided across the glass until it rested directly beneath his eyes upon one of the slim fingers was an exact replica of the ring in the case robert cairn leapt back with a stifled exclamation antony ferrara stood before him the museum ring is a copy dear cairn came the huskily musical hateful voice the one upon my finger is the real one cairn realized in his own person the literal meaning of the overworked phrase frozen with amazement before him stood the most dangerous man in europe a man who had done murder and worse a man only in name a demon in nature his long black eyes half closed his perfectly chiselled ivory face expressionless and his blood-red lips parted in a mirthless smile antony ferrara watched cairn cairn whom he had sought to murder by means of hellish art despite the heat of the day he wore a heavy overcoat lined with white fox fur in his right hand for his left still rested upon the case he held a soft hat with an easy nonchalance he stood regarding the man who had sworn to kill him and the latter made no move uttered no word stark amazement held him inert i knew that you were in the museum cairn ferrara continued still having his basilisk eyes fixed upon the other from beneath the drooping lids and i called to you to join me here still cairn did not move did not speak you have acted very harshly towards me in the past dear cairn but because my philosophy consists in an admirable blending of that practised in sybaris with that advocated by the excellent zeno because whilst i am prepared to make my home in a diogenes tub i nevertheless can enjoy the fragrance of a rose the flavour of a peach the husky voice seemed to be hypnotising cairn it was a siren's voice thralling him because continued ferrara evenly in common with all humanity i am compound of man and woman i can resent the enmity which drives me from shore to shore but being myself a connoisseur of the red lips and laughing eyes of maidenhood i am thinking more particularly of myra i can forgive you dear cairn then cairn recovered himself you white-faced cur he snared through clenched teeth his knuckles whitened as he stepped around the case you dare to stand there mocking me ferrara again placed the case between himself and his enemy pause my dear cairn he said without emotion what would you do be discreet dear cairn reflect that i have only to call an attendant in order to have you pitched ignominiously into the street before god i will throttle the life from you said cairn in a voice savagely hoarse he sprang again towards ferrara again the latter dodged around the case with an agility which defied the heavier man your temperament is so painfully celtic cairn he protested mockingly i perceive quite clearly that you will not discuss this matter judicially must i then call for the attendant cairn clenched his fists convulsively through all the tumult of his rage the fact had penetrated that he was helpless he could not attack ferrara in that place he could not detain him against his will 
for ferrara had only to claim official protection to bring about the complete discomfiture of his assailant across the case containing the duplicate ring he glared at this incarnate fiend whom the law which he had secretly outraged now served to protect ferrara spoke again in his huskily musical voice i regret that you will not be reasonable cairn there is so much that i should like to say to you there are so many things of interest which i could tell you do you know in some respects i am particularly gifted cairn at times i can recollect quite distinctly particulars of former incarnations do you see that priestess lying there just through the doorway i can quite distinctly remember having met her when she was a girl she was beautiful cairn and i can even recall how one night beside the nile but i see that you are growing impatient if you will not avail yourself of this opportunity i must bid you good day he turned and walked towards the door cairn leapt after him but ferrara suddenly beginning to run reached the end of the egyptian room and darted out on to the landing before his pursuer had time to realize what he was about at the moment that ferrara turned the corner ahead of him cairn saw something drop coming to the end of the room he stooped and picked up this object which was a plaited silk cord about three feet in length he did not pause to examine it more closely but thrust it into his pocket and raced down the steps after the retreating figure of ferrara at the foot a constable held out his arm detaining him cairn stopped in surprise i must ask you for your name and address said the constable gruffly for heaven's sake what for a gentleman has complained my good man exclaimed cairn and proffered his card it is it is a practical joke on his part i know him well the constable looked at the card and from the card suspiciously back to cairn apparently the appearance of the latter reassured him or he may have formed a better opinion of cairn from the fact that half a crown had quickly changed hands all right sir he said it is no affair of mine he did not charge you with anything he only asked me to prevent you from following him quite so snapped cairn irritably and dashed off along the gallery in the hope of overtaking ferrara but as he had feared ferrara had made good use of his ruse to escape he was nowhere to be seen and cairn was left to wonder with what object he had risked the encounter in the egyptian room for that it had been deliberate and not accidental he quite clearly perceived he walked down the steps of the museum deep in reflection the thought that he and his father for months had been seeking the fiend ferrara that they were sworn to kill him as they would kill a mad dog and that he robert cairn had stood face to face with ferrara had spoken with him and had let him go free unscathed was maddening yet in the circumstances how could he have acted otherwise with no recollection of having traversed the intervening streets he found himself walking under the archway leading to the court in which his chambers were situated in the far corner shadowed by the tall plane tree where the worn iron railings of the steps and the small panes of glass in the solicitor's window on the ground floor called up memories of charles dickens he paused filled with a sort of wonderment it seemed strange to him that such an air of peace could prevail anywhere whilst antony ferrara lived and remained at large he ran up the stairs to the second landing opened the door and entered his chambers he was oppressed to-day with a memory the memory of certain gruesome happenings whereof these rooms had been the scene knowing the powers of antony ferrara he often doubted the wisdom of living there alone but he was persuaded that to allow these fears to make headway would be to yield a point to the enemy yet there were nights when he found himself sleepless listening for sounds which had seemed to arouse him imagining sinister whispers in his room and imagining that he could detect the dreadful odour of the secret incense seating himself by the open window he took out from his pocket the silken cord which ferrara had dropped in the museum and examined it curiously his examination of the thing did not serve to enlighten him respecting its character it was merely a piece of silken cord very closely and curiously plaited he threw it down on the table determined to show it to dr cairn at the earliest opportunity 
he was conscious of a sort of repugnance and prompted by this he carefully washed his hands as though the cord had been some unclean thing then he sat down to work only to realize immediately that work was impossible until he had confided in somebody his encounter with dr ferrara lifting the telephone receiver he called up dr cairn but his father was not at home he replaced the receiver and sat staring vaguely at his open notebook end of chapter twenty five read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter twenty six of brood of the witch queen by sax romer the ivory hand for close upon an hour robert cairn sat at his writing-table endeavouring to puzzle out a solution to the mystery of ferrara's motive his reflections served only to confuse his mind a tangible clue lay upon the table before him the silk cord but it was a clue of such a nature that whatever deductions an expert detective might have based upon it robert cairn could base none dusk was not far off and he knew that his nerves were not what they had been before those events which had led to his egyptian journey he was back in his own chamber scene of one gruesome outrage in ferrara's unholy campaign for darkness is the ally of crime and it had always been in the darkness that ferrara's activities had most fearfully manifested themselves what was that cairn ran to the window and leaning out looked down into the court below he could have sworn that a voice a voice possessing a strange music a husky music wholly hateful had called him by name but at the moment the court was deserted for it was already past the hour at which members of the legal fraternity desert their business premises to hasten homewards shadows were creeping under the quaint old archways shadows were draping the ancient walls and there was something in the aspect of the place which reminded him of a quadrangle at oxford across which upon a certain fateful evening he and another had watched the red light rising and falling in antony ferrara's rooms clearly his imagination was playing him tricks and against this he knew full well that he must guard himself the light in his rooms was growing dim but instinctively his gaze sought out and found the mysterious silken cord amid the litter on the table he contemplated the telephone but since he had left a message for his father he knew that the latter would ring him up directly he returned work he thought should be the likeliest antidote to the poisonous thoughts which oppressed his mind and again he seated himself at the table and opened his notes before him the silken rope lay close to his left hand but he did not touch it he was about to switch on the reading lamp for it was now too dark to write when his mind wandered off along another channel of reflection he found himself picturing myra as she had looked the last time that he had seen her she was seated in mr saunderson's garden still pale from her dreadful illness but beautiful more beautiful in the eyes of robert cairn than any other woman in the world the breeze was blowing her rebellious curls across her eyes eyes bright with a happiness which he loved to see her cheeks were paler than they were wont to be and the sweet lips had lost something of their firmness she wore a short cloak and a wide-brimmed hat unfashionable but becoming no one but myra could successfully have worn that hat he thought wrapped in such lover-like memories he forgot that he had sat down to write forgot that he held a pen in his hand and that this same hand had been outstretched to ignite the lamp when he ultimately awoke again to the hard facts of his lonely environment he also awoke to a singular circumstance he made the acquaintance of a strange phenomenon he had been writing unconsciously and this is what he had written robert cairn renounce your pursuit of me and renounce myra or to-night the sentence was unfinished momentarily he stared at the words endeavouring to persuade himself that he had written them consciously in idle mood but some voice within gave him the lie so that with a suppressed groan he muttered aloud it has begun almost as he spoke there came a sound from the passage outside 
that led him to slide his hand across the table and to seize his revolver the visible presence of the little weapon reassured him and as a further sedative he resorted to tobacco filled and lighted his pipe and leant back in the chair blowing smoke rings toward the closed door he listened intently and heard the sound again it was a soft hiss and now he thought he could detect another noise as of some creature dragging its body along the floor a lizard he thought and a memory of the basilisk eyes of antony ferrara came to him both the sounds seemed to come slowly nearer and nearer the dragging thing being evidently responsible for the hissing until cairn decided that the creature must be immediately outside the door revolver in hand he leaped across the room and threw the door open the red carpet to right and left was innocent of reptiles perhaps the creaking of the revolving chair as he had prepared to quit it had frightened the thing with the idea before him he systematically searched all the rooms into which it might have gone his search was unavailing the mysterious reptile was not to be found returning again to the study he seated himself behind the table facing the door which he left ajar ten minutes passed in silence only broken by the dim murmur of the distant traffic he had almost persuaded himself that his imagination quickened by the atmosphere of mystery and horror wherein he had recently moved was responsible for the hiss when a new sound came to confute his reasoning the people occupying the chambers below were moving about so that their footsteps were faintly audible but above these dim footsteps a rustling vague indefinite demonstrated itself as in the case of the hiss it proceeded from the passage a light burnt inside the outer door and this as cairn knew must cast a shadow before anything or person approaching the room came the rustle of light draperies the nervous suspense was almost unbearable he waited what was creeping slowly cautiously towards the open door cairn toyed with the trigger of his revolver the arts of the west shall try conclusions with those of the east he said a shadow inch upon inch it grew creeping across the door until it covered all the threshold visible someone was about to appear he raised the revolver the shadow moved along cairn saw the tail of it creep past the door until no shadow was there the shadow had come and gone but there was no substance i am going mad the words forced themselves to his lips he rested his chin upon his hands and clenched his teeth grimly did the horrors of insanity stare him in the face from that recent illness in london when his nervous system had collapsed utterly despite his stay in egypt he had never fully recovered a month will see you fit again his father had said but perhaps he had been wrong perchance the affection had been deeper than he had suspected and now this endless carnival of supernatural happenings had strained the weakening cells so that he was become as a man in a delirium where did reality end and fantasy begin was it all merely subjective he had read of such aberrations and now he sat wondering if he were the victim of a like affliction and while he wondered he stared at the rope of silk that was real logic came to his rescue if he had seen and heard strange things so too had sime in egypt so had his father both in egypt and in london inexplicable things were happening around him and all could not be mad i'm getting morbid again he told himself the tricks of our damnable ferrara are getting on my nerves just what he desires and intends this latter reflection spurred him to new activity and pocketing the revolver he switched off the light in the study and looked out of the window glancing across the court he thought that he saw a man standing below peering upward with his hands resting upon the window ledge cairn looked long and steadily there certainly was someone standing in the shadow of the tall plane tree but whether man or woman he could not determine the unknown remaining in the same position apparently watching cairn ran downstairs and passing out to the court walked rapidly across to the tree 
there he paused in some surprise there was no one visible by the tree and the whole court was deserted must have slipped off through the archway he concluded and walking back he remounted the stair and entered his chambers again feeling a renewed curiosity regarding the silken rope which had so strangely come into his possession he sat down at the table and mastering his distaste for the thing took it in his hands and examined it closely by the light of the lamp he was seated with his back to the windows facing the door so that no one could possibly have entered the room unseen by him it was as he bent down to scrutinize the curious plating that he felt a sensation stealing over him as though someone were standing very close to his chair grimly determined to resist any hypnotic tricks that might be practised against him and well assured that there could be no person actually present in the chambers he sat back resting his revolver on his knee prompted by he knew not what he slipped the silk cord into the table drawer and turned the key upon it as he did so a hand crept over his shoulder followed by a bare arm of the hue of old ivory a woman's arm transfixed he sat his eyes fastened upon the ring of dull metal bearing a green stone inscribed with a complex figure vaguely resembling a spider perfume stole to his nostrils that of the secret incense and the ring was the ring of the witch queen in this incredible moment he relaxed that iron control of his mind which alone had saved him before even as he realized it and strove to recover himself he knew that it was too late he knew that he was lost gloom blackness unrelieved by any speck of light murmuring subdued all around the murmuring of a concourse of people the darkness was odorous with a heavy perfume a voice came followed by complete silence again the voice sounded chanting sweetly a response followed in deep male voices the response was taken up all around with time a tiny speck grew in the gloom and grew until it took form and out of the darkness the shape of a white-robed woman appeared high up far away wherever the ray that illumined her figure emanated from it did not perceptibly dispel the stygian gloom all about her she was bathed in dazzling light but framed in impenetrable darkness her dull gold hair was encircled by a band of white metal like silver bearing in front a round burnished disc that shone like a minor sun above the disc projected an ornament having the shape of a spider the intense light picked out every detail vividly neck and shoulders were bare and the gleaming ivory arms were uplifted the long slender fingers held aloft a golden casket covered with dim figures almost indiscernible at that distance a glittering zone of the same white metal confined the snowy draperies her bare feet peeped out from beneath the flowing robe above below and around her was memphian darkness silence the perfume was stifling a voice seeming to come from a great distance cried on your knees to the book of toth on your knees to the wisdom queen who is deathless being unborn who is dead though living whose beauty is for all men that all men may die the whole invisible concourse took up the chant and the light faded until only the speck on the disc below the spider was visible then that too vanished a bell was ringing furiously its din grew louder and louder it became insupportable cairn threw out his arms and staggered up like a man intoxicated he grasped at the table lamp only just in time to prevent it overturning the ringing was that of his telephone bell he had been unconscious then under some spell he unhooked the receiver and heard his father's voice that you rob asked the doctor anxiously yes sir replied cairn eagerly and he opened the drawer and slid his hand in for the silken cord there is something you have to tell me cairn without preamble plunged excitedly into an account of his meeting with dr ferrara the silk cord he concluded i have in my hand at the present moment and hold on a moment came dr cairn's voice rather grimly followed a short interval then hello bob listen to this from tonight's paper a curious discovery was made by an attendant in one of the rooms of the indian section of the british museum late this evening 
a case had been opened in some way and although it contained more valuable objects the only item which the thief had abstracted was a thug strangling cord from kundali district of nursing for but i don't understand ferrara meant you to find that cord boy remember he is unacquainted with your chambers and he requires a focus for his damnable forces he knows well that you will have the thing somewhere near to you and probably he knows something of its awful history you are in danger keep a fast hold upon yourself i shall be with you in less than half an hour End of chapter 26 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 27 of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer The Thug's Cord As Robert Cairn hung up the receiver and found himself cut off again from the outer world, he realized, with terror beyond his control, how in this quiet backwater, so near to the main stream, he yet was far from human companionship he recalled a night when amid such a silence as this which now prevailed about him he had been made the subject of an uncanny demonstration how his sanity his life had been attacked how he had fled from the crowding horrors which had been massed against him by his supernaturally endowed enemy there was something very terrifying in the quietude of the court a quietude which to others might have spelt peace, but which to Robert Cairn spelt menace. That Ferrara's device was aimed at his freedom, that his design was intended to lead to the detention of his enemy whilst he directed his activities in other directions, seemed plausible, if inadequate. The carefully planned incident at the museum whereby the constable had become possessed of Cairn's card, the distinct possibility that a detective might knock upon his door at any moment with the inevitable result of his detention pending inquiries formed a chain which had seemed complete save that anthony ferrara was the schemer for another to have compassed so much would have been a notable victory for ferrara such a victory would be trivial what then did it mean his father had told him and the uncanny events of the evening stood evidence of dr cairn's wisdom the mysterious and evil force which antony ferrara controlled was being focused upon him slight sounds from time to time disturbed the silence and to these he listened attentively he longed for the arrival of his father for the strong calm counsel of the one man in england fitted to cope with the hell thing which had uprisen in their midst that he had already been subjected to some kind of hypnotic influence he was unable to doubt and having once been subjected to this influence he might at any moment it was a terrible reflection fall victim to it again cairn directed all the energies of his mind to resistance ill-defined reflection must at all costs be avoided for the brain vaguely employed he knew to be more susceptible to attack than that directed in a well-ordered channel clocks were chiming the hour he did not know what hour nor did he seek to learn he felt that he was at rapier play with a skilled antagonist and that to glance aside however momentarily was to lay himself open to a fatal thrust he had not moved from the table so that only the reading lamp upon it was lighted and much of the room lay in half shadow the silken cord coiled snake-like was close to his left hand the revolver was close to his right the muffled roar of traffic diminished since the hour grew late reached his ears as he sat but nothing disturbed the stillness of the court and nothing disturbed the stillness of the room the notes which he had made in the afternoon at the museum were still spread open before him and he suddenly closed the book fearful of anything calculated to distract him from the mood of tense resistance his life and more than his life depended on his successfully opposing the insidious forces which beyond doubt invisibly surrounded the lighted table there is a courage which is not physical nor is it entirely moral a courage often lacking in the most intrepid soldier and this was the kind of courage which robert cairn now called up to his aid 
the occult inquirer can face unmoved horrors which would turn the brain of many a man who wears the v c on the other hand it is questionable if the possessor of this peculiar type of bravery could face a bayonet charge pluck of the physical sort cairn had in plenty pluck of that more subtle kind he was acquiring from growing intimacy with the terrors of the borderland who's there he spoke the words aloud and the eerie sound of his own voice added a new dread to the enveloping shadows his revolver grasped in his hand he stood up but slowly and cautiously in order that his own movements might not prevent him from hearing any repetition of that which had occasioned his alarm and what had occasioned this alarm either he was become again a victim of the strange trickery which already had borne him though not physically from fleet street to the sacred temple of maydoom or with his material senses he had detected a soft rapping upon the door of his room he knew that his outer door was closed he knew that there was no one else in his chambers yet he had heard a sound as of knuckles beating upon the panels of the door the closed door of the room in which he sat standing upright he turned deliberately and faced in that direction the light pouring out from beneath the shade of the table lamp scarcely touched upon the door at all only the ledges of the lower panels were clearly perceptible the upper part of the door was masked in greenish yellow intent tensely strung he stood then advanced in the direction of the switch in order to light the lamp fixed above the mantelpiece and to illuminate the whole of the room one step forward he took then the soft rapping was repeated who's there this time he cried the words loudly and acquired some new assurance from the imperative note in his own voice he ran to the switch and pressed it down the lamp did not light the filament has burned out he muttered terror grew upon him a terror akin to that which children experience in the darkness but he yet had a fair mastery of his emotions when not suddenly as is the way of a failing electric lamp but slowly uncannily unnaturally the table lamp became extinguished darkness cairn turned towards the window this was a moonless night and little enough illumination entered the room from the court three resounding raps were struck upon the door at that terror had no darker meaning for cairn he had plumbed its ultimate deeps now like a diver he arose again to the surface heedless of the darkness of the seemingly supernatural means by which it had been occasioned he threw open the door and thrust his revolver out into the corridor for terrors he had been prepared for some gruesome shape such as we read of in the magus there was nothing instinctively he had looked straight ahead of him as one looks who expects to encounter a human enemy but the hallway was empty a dim light finding access over the door from the stair prevailed there yet it was sufficient to have revealed the presence of any one or anything had any one or anything been present cairn stepped out from the room and was about to walk to the outer door the idea of flight was strong upon him for no man can fight the invisible when on a level with his eyes flat against the wall as though someone crouched there he saw two white hands they were slim hands like the hands of a woman and upon one of the tapered fingers there dully gleamed a green stone a peal of laughter came chokingly from his lips he knew that his reason was tottering for these two white hands which now moved along the wall as though they were sliding to the room which cairn had just quitted were attached to no visible body just two ivory hands were there and nothing more that he was in deadly peril cairn realized fully his complete subjection by the will force of ferrara had been interrupted by the ringing of the telephone bell but now the attack had been renewed the hands vanished too well he remembered the ghastly details attendant upon the death of sir michael ferrara to doubt that these slim hands were directed upon murderous business a soft swishing sound reached him something upon the writing-table had been moved the strangling cord whilst speaking to his father he had taken it out from the drawer and when he quitted the room it had lain upon the blotting-pad 
he stepped back towards the outer door something fluttered past his face and he turned in a mad panic the dreadful bodiless hands groped in the darkness between himself and the exit vaguely it came home to him that the menace might be avoidable he was bathed in icy perspiration he dropped the revolver into his pocket and placed his hands upon his throat then he began to grope his way towards the closed door of his bedroom lowering his left hand he began to feel for the doorknob as he did so he saw and knew the crowning horror of the night that he had made a false move in retiring he had thrown away his last his only chance the phantom hands a yard apart holding the silken cords stretched tightly between them were approaching him swiftly he lowered his head and charged along the passage with a wild cry the cord stretched taut struck him under the chin back he reeled the cord was about his throat god he choked and thrust up his hands madly he strove to pluck the deadly silken thing from his neck it was useless a grip of steel was drawing it tightly and ever more tightly about him despair touched him and almost he resigned himself then rob rob open the door dr cairn was outside a new strength came and he knew that it was the last atom left to him to remove the rope was humanly impossible he dropped his cramped hands bent his body by a mighty physical effort and hurled himself forward upon the door the latch now was just above his head he stretched up and was plucked back but the fingers of his right hand grasped the knob convulsively even as that superhuman force jerked him back he turned the knob and fell all his weight hung upon the fingers which were locked about that brass disc in a grip which even the powers of darkness could not relax the door swung open and cairn swung back with it he collapsed an inert heap upon the floor dr cairn leapt in over him when he reopened his eyes he lay in bed and his father was bathing his inflamed throat all right boy there's no damage done thank god the hands i quite understand but i saw no hands but your own rob and if it had come to an inquest i could not even have raised my voice against a verdict of suicide but i opened the door they would have said that you repented your awful act too late although it is almost impossible for a man to strangle himself under such conditions there is no jury in england who would have believed that antony ferrara had done the deed End of chapter 27 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 28 of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer The High Priest Hortotef The breakfast room of Dr. Cairn's house in Half Moon Street presented a cheery appearance, and this despite the gloom of the morning for thunderous clouds hung low in the sky and there were distant mutterings ominous of a brewing storm robert cairn stood looking out of the window he was thinking of an afternoon at oxford when to such an accompaniment as this he had witnessed the first scene in the drama of evil wherein the man called antony ferrara sustained the leading role that the denouement was at any moment to be anticipated his reason told him and some instinct that was not of his reason forewarned him too that he and his father dr cairn were now upon the eve of that final decisive struggle which should determine the triumph of good over evil or of evil over good already the doctor's house was invested by the uncanny forces marshalled by antony ferrara against them the distinguished patients who daily flocked to the consulting room of the celebrated specialist who witnessed his perfect self-possession and took comfort from his confidence knowing it for the confidence of strength little suspected that a greater ill than any flesh is heir to assailed the doctor to whom they came for healing a menace dreadful and unnatural hung over the home as now the thunder-clouds hung over it this well-ordered household so modern so typical of twentieth-century culture and refinement presented none of the appearances of a beleaguered garrison yet the house of dr cairn in half moon street was nothing less than an invested fortress a peal of distant thunder boomed from the direction of hyde park robert cairn looked up at the lowering sky as if seeking a portent 
to his eyes it seemed that a livid face malignant with the malignancy of a devil looked down out of the clouds myra duquesne came into the breakfast room he turned to greet her and in his capacity of accepted lover was about to kiss the tempting lips when he hesitated and contented himself with kissing her hand a sudden sense of the proprieties had assailed him he reflected that the presence of the girl beneath the same roof as himself although dictated by imperative need might be open to misconstruction by the prudish dr cairn had decided that for the present myra duquesne must dwell beneath his own roof as in feudal days the baron at first hint of an approaching enemy formerly was accustomed to call within the walls of the castle those whom it was his duty to protect unknown to the world a tremendous battle raged in london the outer works were in the possession of the enemy and he was now before their very gates myra though still pale from her recent illness already was recovering some of the freshness of her beauty and in her simple morning dress as she busied herself about the breakfast table she was a sweet picture enough and good to look upon robert cairn stood beside her looking into her eyes and she smiled up at him with a happy contentment which filled him with a new longing but did you dream again last night he asked in a voice which he strove to make matter-of-fact myra nodded and her face momentarily clouded over the same dream yes she said in a troubled way at least in some respects dr cairn came in glancing at his watch good morning he cried cheerily i have actually overslept myself they took their seats at the table myra has been dreaming again sir said robert cairn slowly the doctor serviette in hand glanced up with an inquiry in his grey eyes we must not overlook any possible weapon he replied give us particulars of your dream myra as marston entered silently with the morning fare and having placed the dishes upon the table as silently withdrew myra began i seem to stand again in the barn-like building which i have described to you before through the rafters of the roof i could see the cracks in the tiling and the moonlight shone through forming light and irregular patches upon the floor a sort of door like that of a stable with a heavy bar across was dimly perceptible at the farther end of the place the only furniture was a large deal table and a wooden chair of very common kind upon the table stood a lamp what kind of lamp jerked dr cairn a silver lamp she hesitated looking from robert to his father one that i have seen in antony's rooms its shaded light shone upon a closed iron box i immediately recognized this box you know that i described to you a dream which terrified me on the previous night dr cairn nodded frowning darkly repeat your account of the former dream he said i regard it as important in my former dream the girl resumed and her voice had an odd far-away quality the scene was the same except that the light of the lamp was shining down upon the leaves of an open book a very very old book written in strange characters these characters appeared to dance before my eyes almost as though they lived she shuddered slightly then the same iron box but open stood upon the table and a number of other smaller boxes around it each of these boxes was of a different material some were wooden one i think was of ivory one was of silver and one of some dull metal which might have been gold in the chair by the table antony was sitting his eyes were fixed upon me with such a strange expression that i awoke trembling frightfully dr cairn nodded again and last night he prompted last night continued myra with a note of trouble in her sweet voice at four points around the table stood four smaller lamps and upon the floor were rows of characters apparently traced in luminous paint they flickered up and then grew dim then flickered up again in a sort of phosphorescent way they extended from lamp to lamp so as entirely to surround the table and chair in the chair antony ferrara was sitting he held a wand in his right hand a wand with several copper rings about it his left hand rested upon the iron box in my dream 
although i could see this all very clearly i seemed to see it from a distance yet at the same time i stood apparently close by the tables i cannot explain but i could hear nothing only by the movements of his lips could i tell that he was speaking or, or chanting she looked across at dr cairn as if fearful to proceed but presently continued suddenly i saw a frightful shape appear on the far side of the circle that is to say the table was between me and this shape it was just like a grey cloud having the vague outlines of a man but with two eyes of red fire glaring out from it horribly oh horribly it extended its shadowy arms as if saluting antony he turned and seemed to question it then with a look of ferocious anger oh it was frightful he dismissed the shape and began to walk up and down beside the table but never beyond the lighted circle shaking his fists in the air and to judge by the movements of his lips uttering most awful imprecations he looked gaunt and ill i dreamt no more but awoke conscious of a sensation as though some dead weight which had been pressing upon me had been suddenly removed dr cairn glanced across at his son significantly but the subject was not renewed throughout breakfast breakfast concluded come into the library rob said dr cairn i have half an hour to spare and there are some matters to be discussed he led the way into the library with its orderly rows of obscure works its store of forgotten wisdom and pointed to the red leathern armchair as robert cairn seated himself and looked across at his father who sat at the big writing-table that scene reminded him of many dangers met and overcome in the past for the library at half moon street was associated in his mind with some of the blackest pages in the history of antony ferrara do you understand the position rob asked the doctor abruptly i think so sir this i take it is his last card this outrageous ungodly thing which he has loosed upon us dr cairn nodded grimly the exact frontier he said dividing what we may term hypnotism from what we know as sorcery has yet to be determined and to which territory the doctrine of elemental spirits belongs it would be purposeless at the moment to discuss we may note however remembering with whom we are dealing that the one hundred and eighth chapter of the ancient egyptian book of the dead is entitled the chapter of knowing the spirits of the west forgetting pro tem that we dwell in the twentieth century and looking at the situation from the point of view say of eliphas levi cornelius agrippa or the abbe de villars the man whom we know as antony ferrara is directing against this house and those within it a type of elemental spirit known as a salamander robert cairn smiled slightly ah said the doctor with an answering smile in which there was little mirth we are accustomed to laugh at this medieval terminology but by what other can we speak of the activities of ferrara sometimes i think we are the victims of a common madness said his son raising his hand to his head in a manner almost pathetic we are the victims of a common enemy replied his father sternly he employs weapons which often enough in this enlightened age of ours have condemned poor souls as sane as you or i to the madhouse why in god's name he cried with a sudden excitement does science persistently ignore all these laws which cannot be examined in the laboratory will the day never come when some true man of science shall endeavour to explain the movements of a table upon which a ring of hands has been placed will no exact scientist condescend to examine the properties of a planchette will no one do for the phenomena termed thought forms what newton did for that of the falling apple ah rob in some respects this is a darker age than those which bear the stigma of darkness silence fell for a few moments between them then one thing is certain said robert cairn deliberately we are in danger in the greatest danger antony ferrara realizing that we are bent upon his destruction is making a final stupendous effort to compass ours i know that you have placed certain seals upon the windows of this house and that after dusk these windows are never opened i know that imprints strangely like the imprints of fiery hands may be seen at this moment upon the casements of myra's room 
your room my room and elsewhere i know that myra's dreams are not ordinary meaningless dreams i have had other evidence i don't want to analyze these things i confess that my mind is not capable of the task i do not even want to know the meaning of it all at the present moment i only want to know one thing who is antony ferrara dr cairn stood up and turning faced his son the time has come he said when that question which you have asked me so many times before shall be answered i will tell you all i know and leave you to form your own opinion for ere we go any further i assure you that i do not know for certain who he is you have said so before sir will you explain what you mean when his adoptive father sir michael ferrara resumed the doctor beginning to pace up and down the library when sir michael and i were in egypt in the winter of eighteen ninety three we conducted certain inquiries in the fayum we camped for over three months beside the medum pyramid the object of our inquiries was to discover the tomb of a certain queen i will not trouble you with the details which could be of no interest to anyone but an egyptologist i will merely say that apart from the name and titles by which she is known to the ordinary student this queen is also known to certain inquirers as the witch queen she was not an egyptian but an asiatic in short she was the last high priestess of a cult which became extinct at her death her secret mark i am not referring to a cartouche or anything of that kind was a spider it was the mark of the religion or cult which she practised the high priest of the principal temple of ra during the reign of the pharaoh who was this queen's husband was one hortotef this was his official position but secretly he was also the high priest of the sinister creed to which i have referred the temple of this religion a religion allied to black magic was the pyramid of Maidum. so much we knew or ferrara knew and imparted to me but for any corroborative evidence of this cult's existence we searched in vain we explored the interior of the pyramid foot by foot inch by inch and found nothing we knew that there was some other apartment in the pyramid but in spite of our soundings measurements and laborious excavations we did not come upon the entrance to it the tomb of the queen we failed to discover also and therefore concluded that her mummy was buried in the secret chamber of the pyramid we had abandoned our quest in despair when excavating in one of the neighbouring mounds we made a discovery he opened a box of cigars selected one and pushed the box towards his son robert shook his head almost impatiently but dr cairn lighted the cigar ere resuming directed as i now believe by a malignant will we blundered upon the tomb of the high priest you found his mummy we found his mummy yes but owing to the carelessness and the fear of the native labourers it was exposed to the sun and crumpled was lost i would a similar fate had attended the other one which we found what another mummy we discovered dr cairn spoke very deliberately a certain papyrus the translation of this is contained he rested the point of his finger upon the writing-table in the unpublished book of sir michael ferrara which lies here that book rob will never be published now furthermore we discovered the mummy of a child a child a boy not daring to trust the natives we removed it secretly at night to our own tent before we commenced the task of unwrapping it sir michael the most brilliant scholar of his age had proceeded so far in deciphering the papyrus that he determined to complete his reading before we proceeded further it contained directions for performing a certain process this process had reference to the mummy of the child do i understand already you are discrediting the story ah i can see it but let me finish unaided we performed this process upon the embalmed body of the child then in accordance with the directions of that dead magician that accursed malignant being who thus had sought to secure for himself a new tenure of evil life we laid the mummy treated in a certain fashion in the king's chamber of the maidum pyramid it remained there for thirty days from moon to moon you guarded the entrance you may assume what you like rob 
but i could swear before any jury that no one entered that pyramid through that time yet since we were only human we may have been deceived in this i have only to add that when at the rising of the new moon in the ancient sothic month of panoy we again entered the chamber a living baby some six months old perfectly healthy solemnly blinked up at the lights which we held in our trembling hands dr cairn reseated himself at the table and turned the chair so that he faced his son with the smouldering cigar between his teeth he sat a slight smile upon his lips now it was robert's turn to rise and begin feverishly to pace the floor you mean sir that this infant which lay in the pyramid was adopted by sir michael was adopted yes sir michael engaged nurses for him reared him here in england educating him as an englishman sent him to a public school sent him to to oxford antony ferrara what do you seriously tell me that this is the history of antony ferrara on my word of honour boy that is all i know of antony ferrara is it not enough merciful god it is incredible groaned robert cairn from the time that he attained to manhood said dr cairn evenly this adopted son of my poor old friend has passed from crime to crime by means which are beyond my comprehension and which alone serve to confirm his supernatural origin he has acquired knowledge according to the ancient egyptian beliefs the coup or magical powers of a fully equipped adept at the death of the body could enter into anything prepared for its reception according to these ancient beliefs then the coup of the high priest hortotef entered into the body of this infant who was his son and whose mother was the witch queen and to-day in this modern london a wizard of ancient egypt armed with the lost lore of that magical land walks amongst us what that lore is worth it will be profitless for us to discuss but that he possesses it all of it i know beyond doubt the most ancient and most powerful magic book which has ever existed was the book of toth he walked across to a distant shelf selected a volume opened it at a particular page and placed it on his son's knees read here he said pointing the words seemed to dance before the younger man's eyes and this is what he read to read two pages enables you to enchant the heavens the earth the abyss the mountains and the sea you shall know what the birds of the sky and the crawling things are saying and when the second page is read if you are in the world of ghosts you will grow again in the shape you were on earth heavens whispered robert cairn is this the writing of a madman or can such things possibly be he read on this book is in the middle of the river at koptos in an iron box an iron box he muttered an iron box so you recognize the iron box jerked dr cairn his son read on in the iron box is a bronze box in the bronze box is a sycamore box in the sycamore box is an ivory and ebony box in the ivory and ebony box is a silver box in the silver box is a golden box and in that is the book it is twisted all round with snakes and scorpions and all other crawling things the man who holds the book of toth said dr cairn breaking the silence holds a power that should only belong to god the creature who is known to the world as antony ferrara holds that book do you doubt it therefore you know now as i have known long enough with what manner of enemy we are fighting you know that this time it is a fight to the death he stopped abruptly staring out of the window a man with a large photographic camera standing upon the opposite pavement was busily engaged in focusing the house what is this muttered robert cairn also stepping to the window it is a link between sorcery and science replied the doctor you remember ferrara's photographic gallery at oxford the zenana you used to call it you remember having seen in his collection photographs of persons who afterwards came to violent ends i begin to understand thus far his endeavours to concentrate the whole of the evil forces at his command upon this house have had but poor results 
having merely caused myra to dream strange dreams clairvoyant dreams instructive dreams more useful to us than to the enemy and having resulted in certain marks upon the outside of the house adjoining the windows windows which i have sealed in a particular manner you understand by means of photographs he concentrates in some way malignant forces upon certain points he focuses his will yes the man who can really control his will rob is supreme below the godhead ferrara can almost do this now before he has become wholly proficient i understand sir snapped his son grimly he is barely of age boy dr cairn said almost in a whisper in another year he would menace the world where are you going he grasped his son's arm as robert started for the door that man yonder diplomacy rob guile against guile let the man do his work which he does in all innocence then follow him learn where his studio is situated and from that point proceed to learn the situation of ferrara's hiding place cried his son excitedly i understand of course you are right sir i will leave the inquiry in your hands rob unfortunately other duties call me End of chapter 28, read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California. Chapter 29 of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer, The Wizard's Den. Robert Cairn entered a photographer's shop in Baker Street. You recently arranged to do views of some houses in the West End for a gentleman, he said to the girl in charge that is so she replied after a moment's hesitation we did pictures of the house of some celebrated specialist for a magazine article they were intended do you wish us to do something similar not at the moment replied robert cairn smiling slightly i merely want the address of your client i don't know that i can give you that replied the girl doubtfully but he will be here about eleven o'clock for proofs if you wish to see him i wonder if i can confide in you said robert cairn looking the girl frankly in the eyes she seemed rather confused i hope there is nothing wrong she murmured you have nothing to fear he replied but unfortunately there is something wrong which however i cannot explain will you promise me not to tell your client i do not ask his name that i have been here or have been making any inquiries respecting him i think i can promise that she replied i am much indebted to you robert cairn hastily left the shop and began to look about him for a likely hiding place from whence unobserved he might watch the photographers an antique furniture dealer some little distance along the opposite side attracted his attention he glanced at his watch it was half past ten if upon the pretense of examining some of the stock he could linger in the furniture shop for half an hour he would be enabled to get upon the track of ferrara his mind made up he walked along and entered the shop for the next half an hour he passed from item to item of the collection displayed there surveying each in the leisurely manner of a connoisseur but always he kept a watch through the window upon the photographer's establishment beyond Promptly at eleven o'clock, a taxicab drew up at the door, and from it a slim man alighted. He wore, despite the heat of the morning, an overcoat of some woolly material, and in his gait, as he crossed the pavement to enter the shop, there was something revoltingly effeminate, a sort of cat-like grace which had been noticeable in a woman, but which in a man was unnatural, and for some obscure reason sinister. It was Antony Ferrara even at that distance and in that brief time robert cairn could see the ivory face the abnormal red lips and the long black eyes of this arch fiend this monster masquerading as a man he had much ado to restrain his rising passion but knowing that all depended upon his cool action he waited until ferrara had entered the photographers with a word of apology to the furniture dealer he passed quickly into baker street everything rested now upon his securing a cab before ferrara came out again ferrara's cabman evidently was waiting for him 
a taxi driver fortunately hailed cairn at the very moment that he gained the pavement and cairn concealing himself behind the vehicle gave the man rapid instructions you see that taxi outside the photographer's he said the man nodded wait until someone comes out of the shop and is driven off in it then follow do not lose sight of the cab for a moment when it draws up and wherever it draws up drive right past it don't attract attention by stopping you understand quite sir said the man smiling slightly and cairn entered the cab the cabman drew up at a point some little distance beyond from whence he could watch two minutes later ferrara came out and was driven off the pursuit commenced his cab ahead proceeded to westminster bridge across to the south side of the river and by way of that commercial thoroughfare at the back of st thomas hospital emerged at vauxhall thence the pursuit led to stockwell herne hill and yet onward towards dulwich it suddenly occurred to robert cairn that ferrara was making in the direction of mr saunderson's house at dulwich common the house in which myra had had her mysterious illness in which she had remained until it had become evident that her safety depended upon her never being left alone for one moment what can be his object muttered cairn he wondered if ferrara for some inscrutable reason was about to call upon mr saunderson but when the cab ahead having passed the park continued on past the lane in which the house was situated he began to search for some other solution to the problem of ferrara's destination suddenly he saw that the cab ahead had stopped the driver of his own cab without slackening speed pursued his way cairn crouched down upon the floor fearful of being observed no house was visible to right nor left merely open fields and he knew that it would be impossible for him to delay in such a spot without attracting attention ferrara's cab passed keep on till i tell you to stop cried cairn he dropped the speaking tube and turning looked out through the little window at the back ferrara had dismissed his cab he saw him entering a gate and crossing a field on the right of the road cairn turned again and took up the tube stop at the first house we come to he directed hurry presently a deserted-looking building was reached a large straggling house which obviously had no tenant here the man pulled up and cairn leaped out as he did so he heard ferrara's cab driving back by the way it had come here he said and gave the man half a sovereign wait for me he started back along the road at a run even had he suspected that he was followed ferrara could not have seen him but when cairn came up level with the gate through which ferrara had gone he slowed down and crept cautiously forward ferrara who by this time had reached the other side of the field was in the act of entering a barn-like building which evidently at some time had formed a portion of a farm as the distant figure opening one of the big doors disappeared within the place of which myra has been dreaming muttered cairn certainly viewed from that point it seemed to answer externally to the girl's description the roof was of moss-grown red tiles and cairn could imagine how the moonlight would readily find access through the chinks which beyond doubt existed in the weather-worn structure he had little doubt that this was the place dreamt of or seen clairvoyantly by myra that this was the place to which ferrara had retreated in order to conduct his nefarious operations it was eminently suited to the purpose being entirely surrounded by unoccupied land for what ostensible purpose ferrara has leased it he could not conjecture nor could he concern himself with the matter the purpose for which actually he had leased the place was sufficiently evident to the man who had suffered so much at the hands of this modern sorcerer to approach closer would have been indiscreet this he knew and he was sufficiently diplomatic to resist the temptation to obtain a nearer view of the place he knew that everything depended upon secrecy antony ferrara must not suspect that his black laboratory was known cairn decided to return to half moon street without delay fully satisfied with the result of his investigation he walked rapidly back to where the cab waited gave the man his father's address and in three quarters of an hour was back in half moon street dr cairn had not yet dismissed the last of his patients myra accompanied by miss saunderson was out shopping and robert found himself compelled to possess his soul in patience 
he paced restlessly up and down the library sometimes taking a book at random scanning its pages with unseeing eyes and replacing it without having formed the slightest impression of its contents he tried to smoke but his pipe was constantly going out and he had littered the hearth untidily with burnt matches when dr cairn suddenly opened the library door and entered well he said eagerly robert cairn leaped forward i have tracked him sir he cried my god while myra was at saunderson's she was almost next door to the beast his den is in a field no more than a thousand yards from the garden wall from saunderson's orchid houses he is daring muttered dr cairn but his selection of that site served two purposes the spot was suitable in many ways and we were least likely to look for him next door as it were it was a move characteristic of the accomplished criminal robert cairn nodded it is the place of which myra dreamt sir i have not the slightest doubt about that what we have to find out is what times of the day and night he goes there i doubt interrupted dr cairn if he often visits the place during the day but i have no doubt knowing his sybaritic habits that he has some other palatial place in town i have been making inquiries in several directions especially in certain directions he paused raising his eyebrows significantly additions to the zenena inquired robert dr cairn nodded his head grimly exactly he replied there is not a scrap of evidence upon which legally he could be convicted but since his return from egypt rob he has added other victims to the list the fiend cried the younger man the unnatural fiend unnatural is the word he is literally unnatural but many women find him irresistible he is typical of the unholy brood to which he belongs the evil beauty of the witch queen sent many a soul to perdition the evil beauty of her son has zealously carried on the work what must we do i doubt if we can do anything to-day obviously the early morning is the most suitable time to visit his den at dulwick common but the new photographs of the house there will be another attempt upon us to-night yes there will be another attempt upon us to-night said the doctor wearily this is the year nineteen fourteen yet here in half moon street when dusk falls we shall be submitted to an attack of a kind to which mankind probably has not been submitted for many ages we shall be called upon to dabble in the despised magical art we shall be called upon to place certain seals upon our doors and windows to protect ourselves against an enemy who like eros laughs at locks and bars is it possible for him to succeed quite possible rob in spite of all our precautions i feel in my very bones that to-night he will put forth a supreme effort a bell rang i think continued the doctor that this is myra she must get all the sleep she can during the afternoon for to-night i have determined that she and you and i must not think of sleep but must remain together here in the library we must not lose sight of one another you understand i am glad you have proposed it cried robert cairn eagerly i too feel that we have come to a critical moment in the contest to-night continued the doctor i shall be prepared to take certain steps my preparations will occupy me throughout the rest of to-day end of chapter twenty nine read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california Chapter Thirty of Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer, The Elemental. At dusk that evening, Doctor Cairn, his son, and Myra Duquesne met together in the library. The girl looked rather pale. An odor of incense pervaded the house, coming from the doctor's study, wherein he had locked himself early in the evening, issuing instructions that he was not to be disturbed the exact nature of the preparations which he had been making robert cairn was unable to conjecture and some instinct warned him that his father would not welcome any inquiry upon the matter he realized that dr cairn proposed to fight antony ferrara with his own weapons and now when something in the very air of the house seemed to warn them of a tremendous attack impending that the doctor much against his will was entering the arena in the character of a practical magician 
a character new to him and obviously abhorrent at half past ten the servants all retired in accordance with dr cairn's orders from where he stood by the tall mantelpiece robert cairn could catch myra duquesne a dainty picture in her simple evening gown where she sat reading in a distant corner her delicate beauty forming a strong contrast to the background of sombre volumes dr cairn sat by the big table smoking and apparently listening a strange device which he had adopted every evening for the past week he had adopted again to-night there were little white seals bearing a curious figure consisting in interlaced triangles upon the insides of every window in the house upon the doors and even upon the fire grates robert cairn at another time might have thought his father mad childish thus to play at wizardry but he had had experiences which had taught him to recognize that upon such seemingly trivial matters great issues might turn that in the strange land over the border there were stranger laws laws which he could but dimly understand there he acknowledged the superior wisdom of dr cairn and did not question it at eleven o'clock a comparative quiet had come upon half moon street the sound of the traffic had gradually subsided until it seemed to him that the house stood not in the busy west end of london but isolated apart from its neighbours it seemed to him an abode marked out and separated from the other abodes of man a house enveloped in an impalpable cloud a cloud of evil summoned up and directed by the wizard hand of antony ferrara son of the witch queen although myra pretended to read and dr cairn from his fixed expression might have been supposed to be preoccupied in point of fact they were all waiting with nerves at highest tension for the opening of the attack in what form it would come whether it would be vague moanings and tappings upon the windows such as they had already experienced whether it would be a phantasmal storm a clap of phenomenal thunder they could not conjecture if the enemy would attack suddenly or if his menace would grow threatening from afar off and then gradually penetrating into the heart of the garrison it came then suddenly and dramatically dropping her book myra uttered a piercing scream and with eyes glaring madly fell forward on the carpet unconscious robert cairn leapt to his feet with clenched fists his father stood up so rapidly as to overset his chair which fell crashingly upon the floor together they turned and looked in the direction in which the girl had been looking they fixed their eyes upon the drapery of the library window which was drawn together the whole window was luminous as though a bright light shone outside but luminous as though that light were the light of some unholy fire involuntarily they both stepped back and robert cairn clutched his father's arm convulsively the curtain seemed to be rendered transparent as if some powerful ray were directed upon them the window appeared through them as a rectangular blue patch only two lamps were burning in the library that in the corner by which myra had been reading and the green shaded lamp upon the table the best end of the room by the window then was in shadow against which this unnatural light shone brilliantly my god whispered robert cairn that's half moon street outside there can be no light he broke off for now he perceived the thing which had occasioned the girl's scream of horror in the middle of the rectangular patch of light a grey shape but partially opaque moved shifting luminous clouds about it it was taking form growing momentarily more substantial it had some remote semblance of a man but its unique characteristic was its awful greyness it had the greyness of a rain cloud yet rather that of a column of smoke and from the centre of the dimly defined head two eyes balls of living fire glared out into the room heat was beating into the library from the window physical heat as though a furnace door had been opened and the shape ever growing more palpable was moving forward towards them approaching the heat every instant growing greater it was impossible to look at those two eyes of fire it was almost impossible to move indeed robert cairn was transfixed in such horror as in all his dealings with the monstrous ferrara he had never known before but his father shaking off the dread which possessed him also leapt at one bound to the library table 
robert cairn vaguely perceived that a small group of objects looking like balls of wax lay there dr cairn had evidently been preparing them in the locked study now he took them all up in his left hand and confronted the thing which seemed to be growing into the room for it did not advance in the ordinary sense of the word one by one he threw the white pellets into that vapory grayness as they touched the curtain they hissed as if they had been thrown into a fire they melted and upon the transparency of the drapings as upon a sheet of gauze showed faint streaks where melting they trickled down the tapestry as he cast each pellet from his hand dr cairn took a step forward and cried out certain words in a loud voice words which robert cairn knew he had never heard uttered before words in a language which some instinct told him to be ancient egyptian their effect was to force that dreadful shape gradually to disperse as a cloud of smoke might disperse when the fire which occasions it is extinguished slowly seven pellets in all he threw towards the window and the seventh struck the curtains now once more visible in their proper form the fire elemental had been vanquished robert cairn clutched his hair in a sort of frenzy he glared at the draped window feeling that he was making a supreme effort to retain his sanity had it ever looked otherwise had the tapestry ever faded before him becoming visible in a great light which had shone through it from behind had the thing a thing unnameable indescribable stood there he read his answer upon the tapestry whitening streaks showed where the pellets melting had trickled down the curtain lift myra on the settee it was dr cairn speaking calmly but in a strained voice robert cairn as if emerging from a mist turned to the recumbent white form upon the carpet then with a great cry he leaped forward and raised myra's head myra he groaned myra speak to me control yourself boy rapped dr cairn sternly she cannot speak until you have revived her she has swooned nothing worse and we have conquered end of chapter thirty read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter thirty one of brood of the witch queen by sax romer the book of toth the mists of early morning still floated over the fields when these two set upon strange business walked through the damp grass to the door of the barn wherefrom radiated the deathly waves which on the previous night had reached them or almost reached them in the library at half moon street the big double doors were padlocked but for this they had come provided ten minutes work upon the padlock sufficed and dr cairn swung wide the doors a suffocating smell the smell of that incense with which they had too often come in contact was wafted out to them there was a dim light inside the place and without hesitation both entered a deal table and chair constituted the sole furniture of the interior a part of the floor was roughly boarded and a brief examination of the boarding sufficed to discover the hiding place in which antony ferrara kept the utensils of his awful art dr cairn lifted out two heavy boards and in a recess below lay a number of singular objects there were four antique lamps of most peculiar design there was a larger silver lamp which both of them had seen before in various apartments occupied by antony ferrara there were a number of other things which robert cairn could not have described had he been called upon to do so for the reason that he had seen nothing like them before and had no idea of their nature or purpose but conspicuous amongst this curious hoard was a square iron box of workmanship dissimilar from any workmanship known to robert cairn its lid was covered with a sort of scrollwork and he was about to reach down in order to lift it out when do not touch it cried the doctor for god's sake do not touch it robert cairn started back as though he had seen a snake turning to his father he saw that the latter was pulling on a pair of white gloves as he fixed his eyes upon these in astonishment he perceived that they were smeared all over with some white preparation stand aside boy said the doctor and for once his voice shook slightly do not look again until i call to you turn your head aside silent with amazement robert cairn obeyed he heard his father lift out the iron box 
he heard him open it for he had already perceived that it was not locked then quite distinctly he heard him close it again and replace it in the cache do not turn boy came a hoarse whisper he did not turn but waited his heart beating painfully for what should happen next stand aside from the door came the order and when i have gone out do not look after me i will call to you when it is finished he obeyed without demur his father passed him and he heard him walking through the damp grass outside the door of the barn there followed an intolerable interval from some place not very distant he could hear dr cairn moving hear the chink of glass upon glass as though he were pouring out something from a stoppered bottle then a faint acrid smell was wafted to his nostrils perceptible even above the heavy odour of the incense from the barn relock the door came the cry robert cairn reclosed the door snapped the padlock fast and began to fumble with the skeleton keys with which they had come provided he discovered that to reclose the padlock was quite as difficult as to open it his hands were trembling too he was all anxiety to see what had taken place behind him so that when at last a sharp click told of the task accomplished he turned in a flash and saw his father placing tufts of grass upon a charred patch from which a faint haze of smoke still arose he walked over and joined him what have you done sir i have robbed him of his armour replied the doctor grimly his face was very pale his eyes were very bright i have destroyed the book of toth then he will be unable he will still be able to summon his dreadful servant rob having summoned him once he can summon him again but well sir he cannot control him good god that night brought no repetition of the uncanny attack and in the grey half-light before the dawn dr cairn and his son themselves like two phantoms again crept across the field to the barn the padlock hung loose in the ring stay where you are rob cautioned the doctor he gently pushed the door open wider wider and looked in there was an overpowering odour of burning flesh he turned to robert and spoke in a steady voice the brood of the witch queen is extinct he said end of chapter thirty one end of brood of the witch queen by sax romer read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california